Hello! This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are.
Hello! This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are.
This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are.
This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are.
this autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Banking Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are.
This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. Hello everyone, I'm very glad to have all of you today and I'm very excited that we have this opportunity to stream this year's CE SME Banking Club Conference live. Welcome! Today we have more than 400 registered participants from more than 50 countries and 35 speakers will connect with us from 14 countries. And we are glad to have all of you today, no matter where you're geographically located and no matter how many of you are here with us, we can have all of you today in our conference space. And these are the opportunities that we believe will accelerate the development of the SME banking and cause faster digitalization of the financial services for SMEs. So let's get started. And before 
we go to our presentations and to our topics, I would like to pay your attention on our conference website and invite you to explore all the opportunity it gives. So right here, near the live stage, from on your right, you can see a chat where you, you are welcome to comment and uh, give your thoughts on the presentations that you are watching and also ask your questions to the speakers during the panel discussions. Also, I invite you to visit the expo area where you can see the virtual uh, exhibitors' stands and also talk to them via the live chat. So please do not hesitate to ask them any questions that you may have. And also, I invite you to visit and uh, network with your colleagues in the networking zone, uh, which is divided on the four main topics and uh, where you will have the opportunity to send uh, private individual messages to all the attendees, also uh, write in the, into the common chat and join the video conversations. The video conversation are uh, planned for the different time slots, so please uh, check the topics that you are most interested in uh, and uh, use this opportunity to network with your colleagues from the other banks and uh, other countries. So, Let's get started and let's go to our topics and presentations. And the first panel that I would like to announce and we decided to devote the very first discussion uh, today to the topic of the artificial intelligence in banking. So, uh, as we know that AI technologies are increasingly integral now in the world that we live in, and to stay relevant, banks need to deploy AI uh, at a scale uh, to provide new customer experience, to differentiate on the market, and provide new offers. And how they can do this? Let us uh, start this panel and let us discuss during this panel. We're going to have four presentations here and after that a discussion. So let me invite for the first presentation Eric Brieva, CEO at Strengths Spain. Hello, Eric, and welcome. Hello, good morning to everybody. Hello, yes, and you're welcome to start. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, let's do a very quick summary of uh, the benefits of artificial intelligence in banking and, um, and what are the ingredients, the main ingredients for uh, applying artificial intelligence in banking and, and some takeaways. Uh, so let's start by having a look at a summary of those benefits. So for everybody, it's not a secret that AI is a great uh, value for financial institutions. A summary of it, uh, it can be the, about the insights that it's able to generate and that this benefit bring benefit for both the banks and the people. It enables banks and businesses to anticipate customer needs and proactively suggest next best action. But for the people, they can receive back from the banks and financial institutions that feedback that in, it makes them improve their life to manage better their finances, so to live a better life by making smarter financial decisions in a more transparent and independent way. So what are the ingredients for AI? So data is the number one. It's like the, the gasoline of artificial intelligence. And um, the good news is that financial institutions have trillions of transactions happening every day, and those transactions have hidden patterns and relationships. So a lot of data is there in the financial institution to process and use. Second ingredients 
are the AI algorithm. Today, AI is so advanced that it's a complete taxonomy of hundreds and thousands of algorithms that we can use for different purposes. We can spend um, hours uh, analyzing it and understanding those algorithms and the different models that can be created, how to apply them to the different use cases. Precisely, the next ingredient are the use cases or business cases. I think all professionals in AI that apply, that are working for banks and financial institutions and the institutions itself has a reasonable understanding of the different use cases where AI can be applied. I have a presentation on how to match business cases with the algorithm and model and the other way around. What application from the algorithm model can be uh, used to uh, overcome the different business cases? And for a specific business case, what are the models that uh, can be used from AI to uh, solve them? You can pass to the next slide, I appreciate it. Sorry, we back too much. Okay. Banking platform. Sorry. Okay, yes. Sorry, I think there is a delay between the clicker and the presentation. Okay, so um, the fourth ingredient are scientists and engineers. So, Banks has already scientists and engineers among their team. The thing is, what are they doing? How much time are they employing to think on which algorithm uh, will apply? Which kind of models and fine-tuning those models uh, um, overcome a specific business case? That's a lot of work to do. That's a huge time employed by, by people, and uh, even when they have, uh, are able to integrate that with the existing core banking platform or digital banking platform or uh, the open banking initiative, how can those uh, AI models be plugging into the different banking applications. So that uh, requires no more, probably years of work on, uh, for to be. So, so the solution would be to use a predefined or existing banking platform.
continue anyway. Uh, the clicker is still not working. I don't know if the presentation is uh, is moving. Okay, so the, the, the banking platform, uh, my recommendation is, or my question to banks is, shall we build it without a clear roadmap, without knowing where are we going? Or shall we plug in from an existing banking platform, uh, AI banking platform? that can be just integrated right away with my existing uh, banking legacy or uh, new applications. So that's, that's the key. My proposal is plugin. There are already many very valuable AI platforms out there that you are able to plug in with your core banking, with your digital banking, with your open banking initiative, and feed it with data, feed existing data that you have in your existing uh, banking processes, but also you can even um, enhance or uh, augment take that data with uh, uh, your open banking initiative to uh, bring information from different third parties. And a banking platform can also be increased with the number of business rules or uh, artificial intelligence algorithm and a model that are, could be also created by third parties. You just need to plug and play within your existing AI banking platform. So you create new models to, to offer solution for the uh, different business applications that you may face now and in the future. So what can a bank do to start with this? So use a banking platform integrated with your existing applications and legacy and use it as an out of the box, box machine learning uh, application with pre-configure of dozens of algorithms, hundreds of business rules, actionable and extendable with the capability to plug in new algorithms and rules to discover new, new actionable insights. It is important that you have in mind not only to discover insights, but also to discover what are the best actions that you can do with those insights for both your internal banking analyst and staff, but also for the online proposition that you make to your customers. This is uh, like a roadmap uh, that you can take into account for uh, when implementing a, a, a banking platform. That is, uh, I'm not going to enter into details step by step to not employ too much time to this presentation that is coming to an end, but just this is a summary, so for you to know that after implementing hundreds of AI banking platforms for different financial institutions across the world, there can be a predefined roadmap of what a financial institution do step by step to have a successful AI implementation in their institution. I hope all of this has been a very uh, enlightening and good news that you can all have in mind in order to target your artificial intelligence initiative within your financial institution, particularly for uh, small and medium enterprise banking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric.
and uh, see you later during the discussion panel and also I invite all our attendees please prepare your questions to Eric and type them into the chat and now let me invite the next speaker Piotr Filipiak, business solution consultant at Comarch Poland. Piotr, you are welcome. Oh, thank you, Elena. Thank you, thank you, welcome. One second. Okay. Good morning, uh, my name is Piotr Filipiak. I'm a business solutions consultant at Comarch and I would like to speak a few minutes on the usage of artificial intelligence in cash flow forecasting. And the title of today's presentation is What does the history of transactions say about the future? So first of all, some numbers. McKinsey estimates that AI technologies in the banking industry could potentially deliver up to 1 trillion US dollars of additional value each year. And you must admit that this is quite a number. There are many potential use cases of AI in banks. First of all, fraud detection, so the security. AI algorithms track what is going on in the account and if there are any outliers, the system reacts immediately without any need to interaction of interaction from the bank's employee, for example. Then second, recommendations. Uh, I mean smart marketing. So nowadays, uh, we need to agree that mass marketing actions doesn't work anymore because an average client doesn't exist. So everyone deserves a dedicated offer because everyone has different needs. Then, sorry. then we have end-to-end -end process automation. And I mean automation of literally all processes in the bank, from the front office to the back office. We also have virtual assistants such as chatbots or voice assistants and scaling contact centers using these uh, chatbots and voice assistants has never been easier before. Moreover, uh, such tools like voice assistants can be used for can be used by disabled people or can be used in new technologies like car banking. And last but not least, we have a cash flow forecasting. So today I would like to speak on cash flow forecasting. Excuse me, but there are some issues with the clicker. Okay, now it's working. So, regarding the cash flow forecasting, I would risk that it is quite undervalued, but there are strong reasons of this situation. First of all, not many banks provide cash flow forecasting for the business clients. And those who do, they do it with unsatisfactory res results. Models are ineffective, data are wrong, and by that clients are misleaded. And in order to change this situation, change this picture, we can use AI, which can significantly improve estimations and by a result, user experience of the customer. So one of the problem is stationarity of time series. It may sound quite complicated, but in fact, it's very simple. Let's assume that this month we have a balance of 100 euro. And of course, on the customer account and our model tells us, predicts, that next month the balance will be 101 euro. What if next month there will be 99 euro instead of 101? We can tell that the model accuracy was 99%, so the error was 1%. But in fact, this is a huge mistake. So actually, our model was totally wrong. With financial data, we need to predict movements, direction of the movements, because the raw data consists of trends. And we need to look far behind this trend. So this is the same data, 
but instead of real values, we took into the consideration differences. And as you can see now, our mistake seems to be much more, um, much more serious. So our base forecast was an increase by one. And actually, the data have decreased by one. So our mistake was 100%. This is quite enough. Another thing is environment, external environment and circumstances. So circumstances are constantly changing. So we need to adapt and the model need to adapt. This is why with predictive model should be fitted with new data as frequently as possible. So it can evolve, it can adjust to the environment and become a better tool. Another important aspect is to perform a lot of cross-validation testing in order to check if the model is accurate or not. And if it's not accurate, we need to change the model or we need to change the parameters. So after this quick statistical introduction, we may think that modeling of time series is quite understandable, in fact. And indeed, it is it is not a big achievement to model a single time series, but in case of a bank, this is getting more serious. Instead of one customer, we deal with thousands of them. And we deal with thousands of customers at one time. And the data keep growing rapidly and constantly. Each of the customer needs different model, each of the customer has different data, and this model and this data are growing and changing. That's why we need a solution which is based on AI. So the solution is AI-powered automatic forecasting system. And tasks of this solution are to select the right model for the customer based on data, based on historic changes. After that, based on this data, estimate parameters. After estimation of parameters, the system need to calculate forecasts and what is the most important, it needs to be presented to the customer in the best possible way in order to increase customer satisfaction and in order to increase uh, the usability of the, of the model. But neural networks have their limitations too. They learn time series by heart and because of that, they are quite poor in terms of forecasting. So that's why we need to use a combination of statistical algorithms and neural networks. A similar approach is used by the Amazon, and you must admit that Amazon is quite successful on the market of AI. In fact, uh, Amazon is AI challenger. Neural, sorry, one second. Uh, we cannot forget about the financial data because uh, financial data are a subject of many influences such as inflation, global economy, gross domestic period, ethics rates that are constantly changing, loans, repayments, schedules, salaries, and so on. There are many, many factors. That, that's why we need to fill models with all the necessary information based on data uh, gathered from the client, gathered from external systems right? like ERP, gathered from external information services about the economy. We need to uh, put every, every, every information in this model just to, uh, just to, just to clarify it and to, and, to, uh, and to make the best possible uh, estimations. And uh, that's why we fill models with domain mo the, the domain knowledge data based on information to increase the accuracy of the model. And speaking of accuracy, we are quite satisfied of the results. While developing the forecast solutions, we have performed a lot of cross-validation testing. So we have checked the models on real historical data and we have obtained quite satisfactory results. On the graph on the right, you can see one of the estimations based, of course, on real data, and light colors presents our forecasts, while dark colors in the same time presents actual data. So 
From the graph, we can see that the model is effective in forecasting future and errors are not significant at all. So we are getting to the question, what does the history of transactions say about the future? First of all, our models, which are using AI, without any doubt, shows that the history of operations is not a random walk. And if it's not a random walk, it means that it includes patterns and it includes trends. And based on these patterns and trends, we can predict cash flow for the, for the customer. Apart from the cash flow for the customer, we can predict future events. And apart from the events and cash flows, we can predict future trends and future patterns. Of course, the black swan is always an issue, but we cannot predict it. Now let's move to what is most important from the business perspective. What we actually can achieve with AI supported forecasts. First of all, we give value to the customer who can effectively predict his financial situation and plan appropriate actions, such as uh, opening a saving account if, we, if he have a surplus of liquidity of taking a loan uh, at appropriate time. Second, upsell, but not a regular upsell, wise upsell, without irritating cold calls. Bank is able to make appropriate offer just in time based on the data provided by AI solution. Third, of course, safety. Availability to monitor the financial situation in terms of any outliers on the customer's account. And if there is any outlier which don't match the pattern, we can automatically block the, the account or block the card or any other payment instrument uh, without any need to, to react from, uh, from the bank, bank's staff. Then the last thing is the customer retention. AI can learn what is the very first symptom of customers leaving the bank. So we don't need to know that. AI will know instead of us. We just need to provide such customer with the retention offer in the right time before he completely leaves the bank. Thank you very much. This presentation was just a teaser of capabilities of cash flow forecasting system. And if you are interested in the topic, I encourage you very much to download the white paper entitled Smart Cash Flow Forecasting. You can find, find this white paper on our um, expo area uh, during the conference, or you can just type, it, type the title in Google and you will definitely find it. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope see you during the panel. Thank you, Piotr, and see you later during the discussion panel. And the next speaker I would like to invite here is Antti Milimaki, Head of Artificial Intelligence at Financial Group Finland. Antti, you are welcome. Thank you. Do you hear me loud and clear? Yes, perfectly. Great. So, good morning, everybody, and welcome to talk about implementing AI in banks. Yeah, in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to highlight OPE Financial Group AI transformation journey from the past three years. And uh, my name is Antti Mullimäki. And uh, most of my non Finnish speaking friends call me as Ant, you know, that small but strong animal. And uh, during the last 20 years, I've been mostly building and managing organizations focusing on big scale information management, advanced analytics, and for the last six years, machine learning. I've been working especially uh, with gaming companies, high tech manufacturing companies, oil and gas companies, as well as financial sector. Uh, I spent some 11 years at Deloitte, three years at Efficode, which is a big, big data and DevOps company. And um, I've been on board at OP for a bit over three years now. And um, I'm currently head of Artificial Intelligence Center of Excellence at OP Financial Group. And we exist for two reasons. First being 
we, we help our businesses and, and business tribes to identify use cases for AI. And the second thing is that we make them real. So uh, let's start with the throwback to 2016. Uh, most of you who, who were on board at that time, uh, back then very few companies outside gaming had first-hand experience about business value of AI. Uh, the key messages were very clear. You all remember that data scientists will be the next rock stars. Uh, big data and machine learning will disrupt all industries and especially financial industry. And three, uh, AI will steal most of white collar work from the developed countries. Uh, the expectations for financial sector were about new business opportunities and value streams, improvements to operational efficiency, and better R&D as well. Uh, now, we all know that most valuable companies for 2020 are data-oriented ones, and the financial industry is very heavy on data. However, currently on the most valuable company list, the highest rating bank is JP Morgan Chase on the 12th position. So some of you might wonder why banks are not dominating this most valuable company list. Well, to be honest, I think that financial industry, we have a history of having data, high data capital, but low data assets. And uh, by data capital, I mean the amount of data, quality of data, and business usability of the data. And we have a lot of that, no problem there. And uh, by data assets, I mean creating high-value data-intensive services and products that will make both customer and employee life a bit easier. And uh, I think that we are not alone. In fact, most of the other industries as well are struggling with the same thing and primarily using data and information to support human decision making. We all know Power BI, Cognos, Business Intelligence, QuickSight, etc., etc. And there is nothing wrong with reporting, but it's all aimed to support employee decision making. And that, it, that makes it not so relevant to our customers. So for me, the AI is about utilizing data capital to build new data assets. It's about making data intensive services happen and, and it's about improving our competitive position in the value chain. So for me, it's crucial that whatever you plan to do, don't do machine learning just to do machine learning. And uh, I think that if financial industry is successful on this AI journey, we cannot be any more criticized about being low on the data assets. And uh, maybe then banks will also hit top 10 on the most valuable company, company list as well. So, when starting the AI journey and getting things rolling, we had six key questions to consider. First one being approach. Should we start with the strategy or should we start with the use cases? And at OP, we chose use cases first as creating the strategy or vision without no first hand experience about AI. Wouldn't have made too much sense for us. Someone may think that you must have a clear goal when starting this kind of journey to know where you are aiming and, and where you want to go. But for OP, having the visibility from six to nine months ahead at the time, it was just enough. And we didn't want to spend three or four months and, and spend, you know, three or 400,000 euros working with consultants to create the, the AI strategy. And that proved us pretty, pretty good choice for us. The funding, second thing, how to balance between centralized 
funding and business funding. Now, the challenge here is that AI value logic is very clear. If you understand customers better, will you be able to sell them more? If you understand customers better, will you be able to develop better products and services? You say both. You say yes to both questions. Yes and yes. But how much more will you sell? How much better products you will develop? Hmm. Nobody knows. It's very hard to quantify. And that's why we chose the fund the first two years of the AI initiative from the project. So the business didn't have to take too much risk when, when investing and, and working with us to make these use cases happen. Well, obviously, the use cases, opportunities, how to kind of find the balance between quantity of the use cases, quality of the use cases, etc., etc. Should you go after six or 60? projects or, or uh, products in the first two years. So that is something to think about. And I will talk you through that in the next slide. Now about the data. In banks, there are typically hundreds of sources and data warehouses. So what is the role of the data scientist or data engineer? Should you teach your data scientist to grab the data? across the operative systems or are you planning to find data engineers to do that? Who will program uh, the APIs yeah, to the high volume use cases? So are you looking for kind of all around data scientists or just mathematically capable data scientists? This is really something that you have to think and you have to choose by yourself. Then the delivery capability. How to start when the, the AI journey if you have no data scientist? On the other hand, how, how to hire the data scientist if you have no interesting use cases for them to work with? And uh, in OP case, using consultants to complement our own capability for the, lab, for the first year, year and a half, turned out to be a very, very good choice. And uh, well, the last but not least, tools and technologies on a premise, uh, cloud, multi-cloud. When I started three years ago, we had a SAS and we still utilize SAS SAS uh, for, for customer insight. And uh, for the first year, we did the development both to Azure, both to AWS and also chatbots in the IBM Watson. But after a first year or so, we soon realized that we cannot uh, do the maintenance in three different or in fact four different environments. And as a result, we decided to go almost all AWS. And uh, obviously it was a bit painful because we had, a, we had to migrate the content and the use cases that we had done to, to Azure, to AWS. But after that, it has been a very good choice for us. And uh, well, so what, what's, uh, what did these decisions mean, mean in practice? Uh, we went pretty big, big scale and invested almost 10 million euros for the program, both in 2017 and 2018. And uh, late 2017, we had uh, some 30 use cases under our belt. And late 2018, uh, we had some 70 use cases done and live. And uh, during the journey, we grow our internal capability in terms of the data scientists from five to 30 data scientists. And uh, well, we started with Azure, AWS, Watson and SAS. Nowadays are almost all AWS. And we also had to develop our own data scientist workspace for the data scientist to work with. 
So that is something good to keep in mind. If you want to utilize something uh, ready on the market like Databricks, or if you have to go your own uh, route in the cloud. Well, uh, not going to go to the details uh, to the use cases quite yet, but we, we launched several first time in OPE use cases. Personal financial management at OP Mobilia and OP.fi, property value estimations both to our customers and employees, two chatbots, first digital assistance, etc. etc. We ended the project phase late 2018, and I think it was the last minute to do that because. Businesses started already at that point to wonder that, yeah, th those guys in AI, they are doing AI projects. And, and they already felt that there is a fine line or separation between their goals and AI goals. But as I said already, uh, AI is not about doing AI, just to do AI, but it's, it's instead of developing and supporting our business goals. And uh, from there, we have operated in a way that data scientists, they work nowadays in the tribe teams. And the work they are doing is priorities comes from the tribe, from the tribe product owner uh, or the business product owner. And uh, it can be that uh, data scientist is the only data scientist in that tribe, or it might be that we have a small team or two or three or five working with there. But anyway, we most of the data scientists are working in the tribes, and they have kind of dotted line through the chapter, through the data scientist chapter, to the kind of common artificial intelligence center of excellence. And that has proven us to be pretty good solution for us for the last two years, 2019 and 2020. Because nowadays, it has made this whole development much more real. The, the businesses see that, okay, so this is what the data scientists look like. Uh, this is how they work. This is the tools that they work with. Uh, and uh, and uh, they can prioritize and, and learn. It, had, it has kind of gotten the artificial intelligence from something that takes place somewhere far away from the business in the project or program. It has made them very real for them. So that is something that, that I encourage basically everybody considering this same thing. To do. Then about the use cases and their impact. Uh, now our hypothesis when starting the journey was that AI is mostly about cell site and R and D. Uh, and well, we have been really surprised about the impact on the operational efficiency. And uh, we have realized almost 23 million euros benefits on operational efficiency only. And I mean, chatbots alone have, have saved us over 2 million euros. And uh, this is pretty big difference from the expectation that we had. Because when we started, we thought that it's all about customer insight and selling more and developing better, better products and services. Well, it's also that, but it's also much more than just customer insight. And uh, well, on the individual use cases, if, if you start from the bottom right hand side, uh, the group, unfortunately, and pardon for Finnish only, but this describes uh, the customer insight profile for, for OPE financial group. And uh, we have basic customer lifetime value estimations, we have different propensities for NBOs, so next best offers, next, next best actions, things like that. We also estimate 
the, the income of the individuals now and five years from now. We estimate and understand their motives to purchase and buy different things. We also operate some five hospitals and uh, the, the biggest insurance company in Finland with 40% of market share. So there, within the limitations of the GDPR, we are combining uh, combining the data to estimate the propensities here. So uh, uh, roughly 50% of the campaigns, digital, physical, all channels uh, that opened us is based on the profile for, for customer design. I would like to see that being 100, but that is where we are right now. Now, um, on the top right-hand side, personal financial management. Uh, we launched that October 2019 to OpenMobile and Open.fi, and where there we do basic use cases for personal financial management. We categorize the income and, and outcome, so the spending habits. We, we give tips how to improve your financial situation. Not so much on the sales quite yet, but, but giving tips kind of peer groups. What people that look like you, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that behave like you, what kind of choices they have made to improve the financial situation. So it's not about bank telling you what to do. It's about you being part of certain segment and uh, learning from, from kind of colleagues or people that you don't know, learning what they have done. So some of us consider that as a good service. Well, uh, chatbots, uh, we have two chatbots responding 2020, roughly 1 million customer requests. And uh, on a good week, the automation level can be up to 80%. And cumulatively, they have saved us roughly 2 million euros and, and counting. And we also launched the first uh, financial advisor or financial assistant earlier this year. And I think personally that that will be a future for banking, digital customer service. The chatbots will stay there, but they don't develop too much. I think they are already pretty mature. Then on the left hand side bottom, the property values. This is right in the core of, of the banking. We have to understand what is the value of the properties that we have as a more uh, security as part of our mortgages. We report the value of those properties to European Central Bank four times a year, as, as most of you do as well. So that is on the core of our business. And uh, we provide that also to, to public. Anybody can go to open home pages and check out the property value estimation. And it is some roughly 60,000 euro uh, users per month. And for me, that tells that people are using this kind of services to dream about where to move and where they can go next. And uh, well, it's still on a pretty low scale compared to like personal financial management with over 700,000 unique users per month. But anyway, that, that is kind of example of the service that I didn't personally think that will be a, such a big hit in the end customers. And then, as said, we, we operate also life insurance, non-life insurance, and there obviously the, the goal has been to improve the operational efficiency on the claim handling process. And, and uh, all the partners uh, response time and uh, all customer requests and, and uh, customer service related to that. So there, uh, I'd say that in a nutshell, what we are trying to do there is to kind of categorize the claims to different categories and low risk uh, claims pay within minutes and high risk claims, you know, do 
investigation, but do it only for the ones that really are, are risky from our perspective. And uh, I think that uh, if you now, well, we have done some 150 plus use cases. And uh, if, if you take any thought leadership from McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group or Accenture, you will probably notice that, yeah, the chatbots are pretty big, big, big hit. Personal financial management is a big hit in the financial industry. Customer insight is there to stay, obviously. And maybe you can notice something about the property values and, and process aid automation as well. But uh, anyway, when you pick the most impactful ones, you will end up to the same, uh, same list of use cases as, as potentially many of the others are from the industry are saying. So basically, that's all I wanted to say at this point. And uh, let's take it from here in the panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Auntie. Yes, we will meet in the panel discussion in the next session. And now let me invite the next speaker here in the panel, Marta Mruschipiura, product manager at ASECO Poland. Marta, hello and welcome. We can't hear Marta, you right now. Please take your microphone. Hello. Yes, now yes. It's okay. Yes, now it's perfect. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Marta Mruschipiora, and I am product manager at ASECO, working in the business intelligence uh, division. Uh, today, I want to discuss about the artificial intelligence and real uh, implementation in uh, banking sector, uh, mainly uh, for the SME customers, because we know that artificial intelligence and machine learning functionality nowadays existing in the retail sector, because there, there are a lot of data and so on. But before uh, that, I will focus on the some data and um, uh, some areas when uh, artificial intelligence nowadays exists. Uh, first of all, um, as Piotr mentioned before um, in, the, the, in his presentation, it is the fraud detection, uh, compliance and risk area, uh, ethics market when the products are uh, supported by machine learning mechanism and the very big area of, of customer experience. Customer experience and customer engagement. This area is under our uh, investigation and our, uh, our um, implementation of machine learning solutions. And on this area, on customer uh, area, we will focus uh, today during this uh, presentation. Why? We are uh, almost pretty sure that um, whole functionalities uh, uh, enable onto the market with artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, supported by machine learning and um, supported in marketing automation are dedicated to different sectors. We focus on the financial sectors and uh, want to develop these um, functionalities. So, what is next? The history of the marketing automation, how it looks like. First of all, uh, marketing, uh, marketing technology started in uh, to, uh, in, 19, in 18s uh, regarding the. Um, uh, whole um, data, uh, SQL, uh, uh, as, uh, SQL uh, um, mechanism, and um, data connected with a different system. After that, we see the huge development of CRMs and uh, marketing automation started. Why? Because we uh, we are more technically the generations are uh, developed from the generation uh, Z to to alpha, beta, maybe beta, and so on. So the, the, the in the, in nineteen ninety, uh, we added some functionality uh, for. Um, 
another uh, another um, uh, data, data sorry. sorry and after that we are going moving forward and we see uh, the multi-channel solutions we added smartphones uh, to our uh, daily basis um, daily basis operations so the data uh, going through the smartphones operations are appear and now we have the um, customer data platforms and it happens nowadays banking uh, generates uh, putting to the customer data platform all uh, data connected with uh, the customer with different sources and what happens sometimes nothing because uh, there is the data from the call centers there is there is the data from um, uh, from uh, basis systems, there is the data from the chatbots and so on. But the data are unstructured, so uh, the, there is no really 360 degree of the customer and uh, the, uh, the information about the customer is insufficient. And the future? Future will be exactly in the artificial intelligence and putting the customer um, data platform with support, uh, with very strong support with uh, uh, AI. How it happens? It is um, show here. Wait a second. It should be works. Okay. Mm. Nowadays we see that the uh, marketers um, and act, uh, marketers using the AIB testing. So, as I mentioned before, uh, the AIB testing are most common uh, in the marketers operational. After that, we have the marketing automation that is uh, also common. But as you can see, artificial intelligence is only on uh, eight percent. Uh, this is the future, and uh, this is the. Uh, it needs a lot of people. It needs a lot of structured data. It it needs um, a very specified um, uh, science data science department to to implement uh, this uh, the solutions. Going forward. Uh, customer data platform should be uh, supported by the uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, why? We transfer a lot of data for different sources. First of all, for the core banking system. Secondly, for the call centers. Thirdly, for the information which we received from the customers. And the last thing, but not least, this is the uh, relationship managers, because everybody focus on the uh, retails nowadays and forget about the back office and forget about the relationship managers. Relationship managers um, has got a very um, big impact of the generate of data uh, when they have the relation uh, with their customers. Oft, often the data puts are in the CRM and they are uh, not analyzed to uh, generate the particular offer. So how it looks like on the um, spectrum uh, according to the, um, eco the business economics unit is the evolution of the smart banking will be mainly in the personalized offer, will be in the segmentation of the customer and will be in uh, the offer dedicated to uh, particular uh, groups. Okay, what's about relationship managers? As you can see here, the productivity on the right side, the productivity of the uh, poor relationship is almost four. So if the, the relationship all, only has got the relation with the SME client for the, okay, I must uh, call to the client because uh, I must do some renewal, the productiv productivity will be very poor. But if the relationships will be very strong, so the productivity will be very high, and of course, uh, the customer will uh, uh, will has has got a lot of um, products. What is more, the upsell and cross-sell of products will be on the high level. Sometimes it happens that the relationship managers don't believe the um, automatic uh, product 
generated product offer, and uh, he or she better knew about the customer. But sometimes it happens that uh, this functionality very helps to uh, cross on absolute these products. And the trend. Nowadays, we uh, see that new trend from uh, next best action to next products to buy and uh, connected the, uh, the, the data from, um, from the beginning, so from the core system, after that enrich this data from the another external data uh, from uh, different sources such as uh, about the companies, about the opinion on the SME company and so on. And of course, action on the reaction of the um, our products from the uh, SME customers. And enrich also the data, another data from the big data uh, sets. This is the future and nowadays it happens in the small uh, um, small uh, and medium enterprises, but as we know that SME are very, uh, it is not common and this is not uh, very uh, simple um, th than the retail customers. Okay, how we answer all this question and difficulties in meeting together with the financial institutions? Because we also focus not only on the banking sector, but also from the financial uh, factoring and uh, leasing uh, companies. We create um, the system, we create the functionalities which, uh, which indicates the clients from the beginning, from the lead, after that, we mark uh, and uh, prospects customer connected with the customer area. And after that, we create the uh, product and enable the marketing to do the, uh, the to do the proper campaign. Uh, campaign. Uh, why? Because we see that the customer journey uh, with the 360 uh, degree view of the customer is very important. Going forward. Uh, how it looks like in uh, our functionalities. We're profiling, analyzing, and offer offering. Okay, and we ask me, uh, where is the machine learning and AI exactly? So in the middle, because uh, we providing with from the, a lot of data, uh, we do uh, we catch a lot of sources of um, of information about the customer. After that, we put the machine learning algorithm working with the data science uh, people because this is not uh, connected only with the business people. This is very difficult to analyze, and it is really uh, it should be really uh, supported by uh, the data science um, specialist. And of course, we uh, put the particular offer. Going forward, what happens next? We use the machine learning engines. Of course, we don't forget the rules engines, flow engines, and um, AI solutions. And uh, how it looks the uh, process, real process in um, uh, from the leads, leads perspective. First of all, we catch the lead and customers searching for the website some, uh, something on um, uh, which, he, which he or she is interested. We catch it on the cookies. After that, we see the uh, customer activities of the website, and we want, yeah, and we also see what customer really want to buy. Um, we also put the machine learning algorithm and. Um, put information regarding the proper offer, offer this uh, to the customer uh, and the customer and the lead. Uh, will be divided into the uh, particular segment because we have the uh, warm, cold, and uh, prospects in our systems. And after that, the dedicated offer uh, is prepared. We have this implementation and uh, our uh, implemented in we implemented this solution in uh, with our customers. It really works. Nowadays, um, it's about uh, four or three, three or four percent uh, sales uh, up um, than uh, before the implementation. So it is, uh, uh, it is a real uh, sales uh, to the leads, um, to the SMEs leads. 
What about the customers? Uh, if we're talking about the customers, so we uh, at the beginning starting with analyzing the data, the data with the AI and the machine learning algorithm. We catch the data from the different sources. After that, we match it and do the segmentation and the profiling. After that, uh, we uh, do also the sales prediction and give information to the sales department regarding the cross-sell, upsell, and different products to the particular group of clients, particular cli even client. And after that, of course, there is the um, sales and offer with ML. How it looks like in our system? This is the, a lot of statistics and data, but the heart of the system is the offers. Because as you can see, uh, this is the screen from the leads perspective. Uh, we uh, can put the information, particular information about the particular offer to the particular group. But uh, in the, of course, I uh, receive many, many asking, okay, what is the difference uh, regarding the Google Analytics? we uh, give the, the offer to the person, to the particular lead. We don't focus on the groups because we believe that if you have the solution and if you analyze deeply the uh, activities of the client, you will catch it and you get this client on board. What is uh, from the perspective of the customers? As you can see here, um, it will be the customer journey. So we can present in a very quick way the information regarding the, um, sorry, regarding the customer journey. Sorry, once again, here it should be, uh, see uh, this uh, information. So from the leads perspective, prospects, customer, customer churn, because of course uh, in this area, the machine learning and artificial intelligence is very important and what happens with the customer loss. And quickly going forward to, uh, to the uh, turn and to the products also, as you can see, uh, this is the information also with a particular offer. So from the perspective of clients of the of the particular segment, not only in the segment, for example, retail, SME, and mid-corporate, but the segmentation do uh, mainly with the machine learning solutions, we also can prepare the offer. Okay, to sum up, marketing automation uh, really works. I am almost sure and pretty sure uh, that it uh, will be the future. And marketing automation with AI. Why? Because customer data platform and a uh, whole spectrum of this area isn't enough nowadays. A lot of data uh, are um, very useful and a lot of data are crucial. For example, open banking. Nowadays, nobody uses the open banking in the financial institution to enrich the data uh, to, uh, for 360 uh, degree of the customers, of course, using the uh, AI. And the last thing is implementation process, because I am on uh, before the time. Uh, so we recognize together with the clients, do the exploration, after that uh, MVP and the production. Very, in very quick way. First of all, we meet the, with the client and discuss with the pain points because uh, it, is use, it is not possible to implement a whole artificial intelligence and whole uh, machine learning mechanism in the whole area of the institutions. After that, we discuss with the client, choose the best um, model with our data science specialist. And after that, we implement this uh, model to a particular use case, as my colleagues mentioned before. Thank you so much uh, for, uh, sorry that I am uh, late, but thank you so much for my presentation. Thank you very much, Marta. Thank you. And now let, let me invite all our speakers for the discussion panel. And while everybody is joining, uh, let me invite you to ask your questions uh, in the chat uh, because now we will have uh, a discussion panel and we will be able to answer your questions so you're welcome 
Yes, we have everybody here uh, on the panel. So uh, I will start from my first question to all of you. So as we see and as we know that all the pros that uh, artificial intelligence is uh, giving and providing to the banks is that the boosting of the revenues due to the personalized offers to the customers, uh, also decreasing of the costs due to the high uh, automation, decreasing of the arrows, etc. So uh, why, but we still see uh, at least here in the in the in the region, that banks are still experimenting the usage of the AI around the few cases, and are not deploying the AI at a scale. So, what would you name as the main challengers uh, for the banks here, and how they can overcome? Eric, would you start? Oh yes, thank you. Uh, I see a couple of challenges in banks and financial institutions, one from a business perspective and the other from the technical perspective. From the business perspective, um, it is knowing what are the business pain or what are the business cases that needs to be applied at artificial intelligence or what it would be the desirable outcome before just targeting them with artificial intelligence. From the technical point of view, the main challenge I see is the dilemma between build it or use it. So hiring a lot of um, artificial intelligence experts and analysts and trying to build an AI platform for using within the bank or to partner with a, an artificial intelligence platform vendor for uh, using and plug it with the existing uh, banking legacy or application. Those are the main challenges I, I am seeing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Piotr, would you be the next here? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so for me, uh, I think that implementing AI services in the bank is quite a shock for the organization and in my opinion the main challenge is to change the strategy. And some banks of course are selecting one or two AI cases to develop, but others are completely reducing their, their strategy. So they are using AI from front office to back office and such such uh, behavior demands a change in strategy and this is the most painful element. And I think that to overcome this, this, this element, we need to start with a small AI piece of technology and prove to the rest of the organization, to the rest of the bank, that, that it is working, that it is performing quite well. And after that, it may be a case that, they will, that, that other stakeholders will appear within the organization, within the bank, and they will be more interested in improving uh, the fields. And there are, of course, some technical problems too. For example, legacy software, which uh, doesn't enable to build any AI services on it. And if such situation occurs, uh, then it is a problem. And banks, banks need to invest in technology heavily uh, to change the systems for open platforms which have AI capabilities. And the last thing, but I think that not least, is AI-friendly database. Because, in fact, this is a must. In case of AI algorithms, there are many, many thousands of requests to the database. So the database needs to be perfectly elastic, flexible, and ready to, to be able to, to serve thousands of queries at, at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Marta? What do you think on that? Uh, yes, uh, I think a uh, huge area is people. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays we are working uh, together uh, with a few um, financial institutions, uh, generally speaking, and we see that data science is crucial, data science uh, department or data science specialist. 
Uh, so without them, without the people, uh, artificial intelligence will be useful. Why? Uh, because the information uh, should be analyzed. It is not only connect another system in another area of the IT infrastructure. Uh, it should be uh, connected, as Eric mentioned, with the use cases. Um, this is con it is connected with the uh, particular objectives uh, of the financial institutions. For example, if we focus for the, I, I have the experience in the leads and customer uh, area. So if we focus on the leads, we don't. Uh, implement the same um, machine learning, learning algorithms uh, in customers because it is uh, not the same data and the data should be um, analyzed in the particular way, in the proper way uh, to give the uh, perfect information to, uh, to, the, uh, to the financial institutions. And another thing is the time. Uh, it is not uh, only with, uh, okay, we, we have the plugin and uh, we implement this uh, solution in our financial institutions and we will still waiting. No. We should analyze this data and, uh, that, and the time is not in the, for example, for the one month, but we can, obs we should observe the data, the uh, answers of this data and particular, for example, of mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, Auntie, and uh, which challenges did you have when implementing uh, the AI in financial group? Well, basically all the challenges that mm -hmm. colleagues already highlighted, but I would like to add one more, and that is the availability of data. Okay. Banks tend to have a lot of operative systems and data warehouses. I mean, OP, we have some 800 operative systems and 200 uh, data warehouses. And uh, I think that bank information management capabilities are primarily designed to meet the needs for big scale finance, risk management and regulative projects and needs. And they are not primarily uh, planned to support the data needs for, you know, five or 10 or 20 data scientists here and there. And uh, for me, scaling up the advanced analytics and AI value, it's not just about getting more and more data uh, scientists. It, it's much more about getting hundreds of data oriented people like data analysts and citizen data scientists. And I think that the response here is the data domains. And by data domain, I mean uh, providing a reliable data to work with. It can be, for example, account transactions, customership data, contract data, product data, or something like that. And the core idea is to provide documentation describing the availability of the data sources, data limits, data quality, etc., etc. And uh, the key is that this is the data that you as a data scientist or data analyst can use to support the business decision making and, uh, and uh, providing real-time customer services. Mm -hmm. And uh, it means that the data is very limited, likely at the start, but but making this happen is is a multi-year uh, multi journey anyway. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have actually here the question in the chat from Ketavan uh, about the volume of the data. So does the efficiency of AI forecasting depend on volume of data and how effective would it be for the segment specific forecasting of around uh, 10,000 customers. And if you would like to add something, you are welcome. And then I would like Piotr to, to also to, to answer. Uh, that is a great question. Uh, data scientists, when starting the project, they, they typically ask that, can we have you know 20,000 rows of, of sample data instead of having the whole history of you know 1 billion or 2 billion rows? I think that in many cases that we start with only a couple of tens of thousands of rows with the data. 
And uh, obviously, it, it changes a bit with the different business cases, but likely tens of thousands of rows instead of tens of millions of rows. It's something that I would start with. Mm -hmm. Piotr, would you comment? Yes, uh, I would like to add one thing that uh, the, the, the most crucial thing in this case is the quality of the database. Because from our experience, it is that banks keep data in different places and these data are not keeping keep kept in order. So that's why the quality of the database is crucial. But regarding this 10K, 10K of clients, I think that it's not a problem to, to calculate models because um, the solutions are not calculating these forecasting models in real time. It is sufficient to do it, uh, for example, once a day or once a week. And it's not a complete model rebuilding. It's like uh, adjusting the model. So, so 10K of clients uh, shouldn't be any problem to, to, to do it. But uh, like I said, the quality of database is crucial and accessibility of the database. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question that we have from our attendees uh, is uh, the following from Kamen. So that we saw uh, a lot of cases of AI um, uh, implementation and there is one missing on the credit risk scoring. So uh, what is your view on this area and can we expect that AI based scoring to become more common in the future for SME customers, of course? Who would like to pick up uh, this I, question? I, yes. I can start with that one. Okay. Well, uh, well, it, it's both ways. On the other hand, we must be pretty uh, explainable uh, to, to regulators that how we are cal calculating the credit risk. Uh, so there are some limitations there, at least in, in the northern countries, like in Finland. However, it doesn't prevent us to develop a challenger models to the existing models that are in the production and uh, kind of to train the data and train the models based, based on those. So it's not either of, it can be both. You must have something on production, maybe rule-based, something that you can easily talk and review with the regulators, but on the other hand, you shouldn't, uh, you should implement challenger models to, to support those and, and support the development on longer timeline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also uh, add uh, something uh, that, first of all, uh, regarding the previous uh, information from Piotr, some data uh, we can help uh, in the real time. For example, uh, going through the AI uh, solutions and uh, particular offer, we should calculate the, uh, in the real time the data to uh, give the customer uh, the particular offer. But uh, answer of this question regarding the credit scoring. Um, of course, we have the behind of mind, we have the compliance and legal department because it's, uh, of course, limited. We should uh, give the information how the uh, risk was calculated how the ritual on the uh, rules was uh, prepared, but also uh, AI and machine learning is an added value for the uh, credit scoring. Nowadays, we examine the market and examine the needs of the customers, and we have the, uh, some proposal to the uh, financial institutions how to do it. But, uh, of course, there is connected with uh, whole data, not only internal data about the customer, but also, for, uh, also from the external data. Uh, here in Poland, we have the uh, credit bureau, for example. Uh, I know in the Germany also has, uh, has got these institutions. So we put information from other external uh, data to the machine learning engines and see how it looks like. Mm -hmm. Is anybody willing to add here? Uh, okay, then I would like then to get back to the question of the AI strategy. And Antti, I would like to ask you uh, the thing that it is interesting that you 
mentioned that you started the AI implementations without having any strategies. And all yes. of you mentioned that uh, AI strategy are not having the view of where the AI uh, can be implemented in the bank is one of the main reasons why this is not implemented at the scale at the moment. So, Antje, I would like to ask you first and then all other um, panelists. So now, having uh, so many uh, implementations and, and the experience connected with that, do you have an AI strategy and uh, do you think this is crucial? And, uh, and if yes, how does it... How does how should this uh, look like? Yeah, this is tough not to crack. I mean, AI first means very different things to different bank stakeholders. For someone, it's about automating as much customer service as possible. For some, it's embedding intelligent component to, to as many services or products as possible. And for someone, it means reaching out to the stars and working with only, you know, moon type of moonshot type of projects. And uh, when when looking back the journey, it took us like three years uh, when when we felt that we were mature enough to to do a strategy and vision. We have been working that it's pretty much done. But we couldn't have done that three years ago without first-hand experience. So I still see our approach that let's start working with the use cases and making them happen and then adjust the views as we go. Mm -hmm. Some of you obviously might argue, but that has worked out pretty good for us. Uh, well, but I would like to important uh, highlight one thing because I think that the most important one is is making real-time use cases happen I mean financial services is still strong on on-premise databases and uh, you can still achieve some custom customer wow or supportive surprise with real-time use cases and uh, the, the key thing is that you shouldn't be working with reporting only. If you think that uh, let's just uh, support the decision-making capabilities with AI and forget the end customers, then it's too easy to kind of forget the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Peter, would you would you answer here? Yes, thank you. So, regarding the strategy for AI in banks, I think that there are three main pillars. First of all is the technology. Second is the competences, so human resources. And the third is the policy across organization. Because strategy, changing the strategy for AI first or AI is a paradigm shift in the bank. It's a massive organizational change. And it means that every process in the bank will be affected and every project in the bank will be affected. That's why we need to educate employees and we need to educate clients too. Uh, so banks which want to go AI first need to redesign the organizational structure to fit the new environment. And, and AI technologies will be present from the top to the bottom of the organization. So regarding the core technology, the crucial thing is the ability to scale AI features across the organization. So the ability to work on the existing technology, work on the existing software uh, and hardware in order to, to be able to, to deliver AI features. The second thing uh, can mention, which is competencies. So, unfortunately, uh, for now, AI isn't a very easy tool to work. And there are some new changes, there, there are some things ongoing. Uh, for example, Google is providing a new AI tool in cloud, which is based on deep learning, but it still requires good IT competencies and these competences are necessary to work with these tools. Uh, 
So that's why bank needs to engage AI vendors or build competencies in their teams. And the last thing is a policy across organizations. So uh, when we think a, about AI first strategy, we need to think about analyzing any project or any process through the lenses of AI. So even the smallest thing, even the smallest project needs to be analyzed, uh, taking in mind that, that uh, it will be AI affected. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Piotr. Marta and Erika, we ask you to comment, Marta. Okay, a few words. Uh, as colleague, colleagues mentioned, uh, of course, the people. As uh, I mentioned also before, uh, data science people which know um, uh, the artificial intelligence deeply. Uh, but uh, there are two ways of uh, this particular group of um, employees. Firstly, we can hire uh, internally as a bank. Or secondly, we can also outsource uh, this uh, group of people and manage as uh, consultants. Uh, this is, uh, but generally speaking, from the uh, strategy of the financial institutions, we should uh, thinking about and see together with the sales department, operational department, back office department, and uh, many, many areas in the financial institutions, and think about the uh, crucial things which, which we should uh, uh, implement, in which areas we should implement artificial intelligence. There is, uh, I am sure that there is uh, impossible to implement a whole mechanism regarding the machine learning solutions in whole area in one time. Uh, it is, uh, it requires time and uh, knowledge about the particular operational. For example, for the back of our office side, we uh, see on our uh, presentation together that we have the chatbots, the voice bots. Here also there is uh, artificial intelligence and, for example, analyze the sentiment of the client uh, of the customer. Uh, nowadays we don't focus on this, but this is the future. Nowadays we sit in, whole, uh, in the homes because we dealing via internet, we uh, deal with the bank via uh, digitally uh, because we, uh, we have the situation of uh, COVID. Uh, nowadays, we are supported by, by the uh, voice assistant. And, but voice assistant doesn't uh, show us if we are a view, uh, if, we are, if we are upset, if we are happy. And uh, doesn't, um, and here we haven't got information or, okay, I can buy, for example, new credit card with the uh, additional uh, functionalities, at, for example, concierge. Uh, because uh, we haven't got such data. And this area also is artificial intelligence. So, to the main point, uh, I think we should sit together uh, with the different departments and discuss the one to three main points to optimize uh, with artificial intelligence uh, implementation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marta. Eric, we would like to hear your answer as well. Yes, uh, obviously, um, at Strands, after having implemented um, AI-driven application for more than 700 banks and financial institutions, we do have a clear AI strategy to propose to financial institutions. Uh, we have a very clear and defined roadmap to uh, AI scaling AI across the, uh, the, the companies and uh, financial institutions. But uh, I do agree with all what has been said with, uh, uh, about the AI strategy by my colleagues here. Uh, just let me emphasize one point that we were discussing before, and it is regarding the um, availability of data. Part of the policies in that uh, AI strategy that a bank should implement includes the openness of data and information. I know it is a very sensitive area 
and there are existing regulations regarding, for example, data protection. But there are solutions out there, um, either uh, AI banking platform vendors already have it, or uh, different other uh, vendors providing services for data anonymization or data um, synthetic data generation uh, to produce a huge amount of data from uh, an existing uh, transactional sample. So this is uh, one of the key elements to take into account uh, when implementing uh, an AI strategy. Mm -hmm. Eric, and, and, and the next question I uh, want to also ask you, and then after this, Marta and Piotr, what actually which resources uh, needed from the banks if they are not building on their own their AI solutions, like the examples and use cases that you showed, but they are plugging in uh, with you? So which resources from the banks are needed, like time, team, do they... Sh banks have to have AI team, uh, data scientists, etc. Eric, would you, would you mm, okay. start? Oh, Marta, okay. Yes, yes, please. Sorry. Yes, Marta, please. Uh, from the uh, resources point of view, uh, the banks needed only the business people and IT people. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we have the experience working to the, together. Uh, we have the data science people, uh, big data science the department, and uh, banking, uh, banking or financial institutions needs only this group. Of course, uh, and the behind of uh, each products, uh, each project, there is a legal department, a back office department, and so on. But mainly business people and IT people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um... Uh, Piotr, what about what about you? If plugging in with you, mm -hmm. I would say that depends. It depends on the model of uh, working with bank. Sometimes bank wants to participate in the project and want to in, in, engage his own uh, experts, like data science experts or IT experts. Mm -hmm. But uh, like I said, uh, the necessary competences are just business and, and a little bit of IT to enable uh, access to databases and so on. But, uh, of course, some projects involves, may, may, may uh, require involvement of, of the data scientists from the bank, uh, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eric, and what about strengths? Yes, uh, definitely um, the bank needs to um, set up a team a multidisciplinary team from uh, the different areas and departments, from the business side, from the technology side, uh, to work with the um, AI vendor to follow up the, the roadmap and, and complete it to a successful project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Now I will uh, uh, read the questions from our attendees. So uh, the one is um, the following. So apart from the being a huge development, uh, what uh, is AI a real threat to the physical uh, workforce? So nowadays, due to the pandemic, uh, this has brought a lot of problems, uh, many job losses, and is AI a new threat to this issue? What would you? What do you think about this? Who would like to start? Uh, I, I can start. Uh, please, please start. During the pandemics, we experienced a very different type of volumes than on normal circumstances. Uh, I can take an example. Normally, it's, it's like 200, 300 customers a day who ask uh, to postpone their mortgage payments for three months or, or six months. And during the pandemic, that volume grew grow up to the, you know, 15,000 requests per day. And uh, obviously, we weren't able to cope with that volume with the existing tools and technologies. And uh, there we took approach that we, we combined the data scientist people with the business 
and the robotic process automation for people. And in four weeks, we created a solution that melted basically down the backlog of almost 100,000 requests in four days. And that is kind of the approach that we have to during the pandemics. Because many of the volumes that were the operating model and the process has been steadily steady for four years and years, even decades. The volume has tremendously shifted during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that was basically our, our take there. So you have to be very concrete and, and have all options and possibilities of robotic process automation and AI and advanced analytics on the table when you are trying to see, see fixing something that is seriously broken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Antti. Would anybody like to add Yes, I, uh, yes I think it is not uh, the threat of the people. I think it is the opportunity for these people. Why? Because uh, AI uh, only is a supplement and e implementation of the uh, particular um, functionalities which can be done by, uh, by AI, but uh, uh, not to uh, uh, in 100% uh, support uh, banking in day, op uh, day basis uh, operation. Nowadays, uh, as colleagues uh, mentioned, uh, there is a lot of data, but uh, of course there, uh, some data will be uh, done by uh, rules, some data will be done by an AI, and uh, we should add this functionality as an um, uh, added value that the bank should be grow up. That's all. So I don't think so that this is uh, the threat for these people. I am uh, pretty sure that this is the opportunity to do something new and uh, something which is a challenge uh, onto the market and will uh, boost the banks uh, at the top mm -hmm. of sales, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and uh, the last question, the last question, uh, which um, so uh, Elena, can I add one thing sure, about sure. this? About of course, this? of course, yeah. you're welcome. To add. So uh, I would like to add. Uh, I, I would like to add only one thing that repetitive work will disappear. So, so some maybe operations, some repetitive operations in banks will disappear. But there, like Marta, Marta mentioned there will be no opportunity, there will be new opportunities for banks, for people in banks, because the, the, the positions will change, the, the competence will, will change. Mm -hmm. So uh, there will be no job losses, like, 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 uh, like uh, someone has asked through the chat, but uh, there, the people will need to adopt to new uh, competences and to new positions uh, regarding in your mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Peter. And uh, the last question that I will combine here in, in one is that uh, how AI works for the low income and illiterate people who is not exposed in use of the internet and social networks? This we have a question from the Govinda from Nepal and also we have the same very similar question about Africa, about the implementation of AI in Africa. Would you comment, Antti, would I ask you, knowing that Finland is one of the, is the country with one of the biggest number of internet users, would you comment here shortly? Yeah, I mean, on the other hand, uh, the investments to start working with AI, it doesn't demand huge investments. All you need is, is some data and a model that you operate in AWS in EC2 instance or something like that, that you can pay, you know, 40 cents an hour. So a couple of euros per, per month. So the initial investment is not big, but obviously <clears throat> you have to have the people that that are using your solution through the mobile phone or through the internet. So yes, you ha must have the basic infrastructure there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much. Thank you all our panelists. The time for our panel is over. Thank you also all attendees for typing your questions uh, into the chat. And also I invite you now to join the digital banking networking zone and continue the conversation there. And uh, now let me announce the next session, the Fireside Chat. We are back in several seconds. Thank you very much. So uh, we are here and now we're going to have a fireside chat on the topic of understanding gap, learning to think like an SME bank. And I'm very glad to be joined here uh, in this conversation by John Mark Williams, CEO at the Institute of Leadership and Management. And uh, previously, John headed Agile Business Consortium. And before that, John was head of uh, breakthrough at Santander UK. Hello, John, and I'm very glad to have you today. John, we don't hear you. Can you check, please, your microphone? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, now we can hear you. Perfect. Yeah, and I can then repeat, I'm delighted to be here, really, and it's great to see you again. <laughs> uh, so, we decided to uh, discuss now the understanding gap between banks, policy makers, and between SMEs. And you uh, did the um, paper on the gap theory, where, where is the understanding gap is the basic. So this is actually the gap between customers' uh, expectations and bank perception. And of course, the smaller it is, the more SME customers are happy with uh, banking services. So which factors contribute to this understanding gap, John? Well, I think the, the, the two things which are really, really straightforward that cause the understanding gap between banks and, and SMEs are difference and distance. And what I mean by that is, um, the first of all, difference. If we think children, for example, are not merely, they're not just small versions of adults. They are different from adults. In exactly the same way, <clears throat> SMEs are not merely small versions of corporates. They are different in nature. And consequently, they need a different skill set and a different uh, understanding of how they work and what they do from engagement with corporates. And of course, banks are very used to dealing with corporates, not least because banks are corporates themselves. So in the same way as a bank would have a specific set of skills for retail bankers, business corporate bankers, for wealth managers, the bank also needs to have a specific set of skills for SME bankers. And that specific set of skills can only come from understanding what it is that SMEs need. So the other element of this, this the difference is distance. And the reason why distance is so important is that there is always a limitation on the data that a bank can collect about potential customers, indeed, even about its existing customers. And the, uh, if we add to that the size of a bank, the number of layers of management between a, a bank policymaker and an SME customer in the marketplace, there is a distance between those two, both in terms of um, physical distance, if you like, how many different layers an SME opinion needs to go through before it reaches a bank policymaker, and also a virtual distance between the bank's understanding through data and the SME's reality. And I think those two things, the difference in, uh, I'll call it mindset, between the bank and the SME, and the distance between the bank and the opportunity for it to understand the SME's reality, those two things cause the understanding gap. Mm -hmm. Yes, you mentioned so uh, the, the skills that SME bankers uh, have to have, and they surely should be different from the ones which are working for the corporate customers. So my, my question is how to um, to have how to uh, achieve this think like SME mindset and also in the bank and also do you think that just because this recent very big changes happening 
uh, connected with the with the pandemic, and I think that SMEs having new challenges this year are changing so fast, even compared to the last year's business situation. So, do you think that uh, connected with this situation, SME managers and uh, bankers uh, that are making product for this segment? Should they have another set of the skills, even compared to themselves a year ago? Right. Okay. Good questions. Good questions. Um, first of all, um, how to get the set of skills for SME bankers that they will need to deal effectively with SMEs. There is a, an old phrase that says, the things we need to learn before we can do them, we learn by doing them. In some ways, if a banker does not have SME experience, then that person will need to engage with SMEs and actually experience the reality of their life before that person can understand how the SME works and functions and what skills as a banker they will need to bring. And opportunities, for example, opportunities like um, having a secondment of SME bankers into an SME, uh, a, a SME bankers work shadowing SME owners or SME directors for a period of time just to get closer because it is not possible to learn the skills necessary to be an effective SME banker from a book. Mm -hmm. It's not possible to learn it from listening to me. It requires the um, it requires the SME bankers to experience the SME reality. That's a, a generic statement. If we think about the effect of the pandemic on the necessary skills for SME bankers, um, uh, I think it was Jeff Bezos that said, uh, in a market, focus always on the things that do not change. Uh, for Amazon, for example, it would be customers will always want um, lower prices and faster deliveries. So Amazon focuses on those two things in particular. SME bankers need to discover and understand what it is that doesn't change in the life of the SME. And things like the fact that they live much closer to break even than a bank lives. And that affects the way that an SME makes decisions. They think about cost, not value, for example. Um, they think about time, uh, because time is, is a an investment for an SME far more than a large corporate. A large corporate can run for two or three years, maybe five years, at a loss and still exist. An SME cannot do this. So as far as um, getting SME skills or SME banking skills is concerned, SME bankers need to experience the SME reality as much as, as they can, as closely as possible. And as far as the pandemic is concerned, all it has done is uh, exaggerate or accentuate the impact on SMEs that was there already from doing business in a real market. So for SME bankers, the pandemic simply requires them to focus on those things that do not change for the SME. Mm -hmm. Maybe this will be, you know, useful for the SME bankers to have a kind of practice, you know, at SME's business at place to really understand how SMEs are working and, and, and living these days. By the way, did you have kind of such practices at Santander UK back then? Uh, y yes, we, we had, a, um, we had a, a, a system where we would uh, engage the SME bankers with a client and get them to get really close to that client, to spend a lot of time with, first of all, with the, with the board, if it was a, a, a customer turning over 10 or 15 or, or, or 20 million to sit with the members of the board, with the directors, to sit in on, on board meetings, to start to feel a bit more of the, of the company. If it's a smaller business, it's actually a lot more difficult because it takes time to understand how a business works. You know, it, it takes time to understand how a bank works. It takes just as long to understand how, much, how an SME works. So we did have some... Um, deliberate engagement between SMEs and the bankers in Santander, um, with some success, I must admit. Also, it's worth remembering that um, some bankers either are running a business also themselves, because lots of people are running small businesses online, or they actually, some of them, have come from an SME background 
or have family members or close friends who run SMEs, those will have more access to the requisite skills than people who have no SME experience. And we, we found some examples of that within Santander as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, great. And uh, uh, my uh, last question to you will be the following. So you mentioned that SMEs are very often operating on the age of the break-even. So they are uh, more agile by nature. Uh, compared to the banks and to the all other uh, corporations. So, and they demand very fast decisions. For example, uh, like during this crisis times to, to cover their financial gaps. And banks or other financial companies, they are very often not able to deliver it so fast as the SMEs require. And then when they deliver, the, the SMEs can be, you know, have debt already. So how actually to cover this gap. So I know that, you know, we did with you all this Agile uh, Mondays series, and I really invite all our attendees to watch all the series, all the episodes on our YouTube channel. But can you summarize here uh, in, uh, in this answer, how to cover this, this gap? How to make banks become more agile here and be closer to SMEs in this way? Yeah, uh, well, I can give a very simple answer, or at least I can give a straightforward answer. It's definitely not easy to do. It mm -hmm. involves two things. The first is to devolve decisions around SME products and services as close to the SME as possible. So that means actually not just regional directors, but to those SME bankers who are dealing with the companies themselves. The challenge of that for the bank, of course, is managing the risk, because the further from um, the, the core control of the bank, a decision is made, the greater the risk the bank perceives. However, banks are in the business of risk, so there is no reason why they shouldn't be able to manage that. So devolving decisions is the first thing. The second thing is thinking about flexibility in products and services, because uh, in, in a way, one of the reasons why SMEs need rapid responses from banks is that the planning that SMEs go through is not always as forward thinking as it might be in a large corporate. Because they need to respond very quickly, they are uh, successful partly because they can respond very quickly. SMEs tend to get into the habit of being reactive and responsive very quickly. Uh, and many don't have an awful lot of time to plan ahead. So planning with the SME, flexibility in products and services, can sometimes remove the need to have to react really rapidly because the, the, uh, the resilience of the SME will be improved by that flexibility and the opportunity. Th there are so a couple of things here which are very important. If we are expecting SME bankers to have decisions devolved to them, then we need to think about three things. How we measure their success, how we train those SME bankers, and who we actually recruit to be SME bankers, particularly with this understanding gap in mind. And then on the flexibility side, we need to think about co-creating products and services for SMEs with SMEs themselves. And those things like workshadowing or seconding or spending time uh, can actually help with that. Uh, because I think, in the end, one of the things that I think the bank policy makers often don't recognize, and I'm sure many of the SME bankers in your audience will recognize this, SME banking, effective SME banking, is a competitive advantage and all of the things that we are talking about, all of the things that your audience are hearing today, the reason why the SME Banking Club exists is because there's an opportunity there for competitive advantage. And one of the things that I would like to see is much more emphasis at the policy level within banks to recognize the competitive advantage that SME Banking can bring. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for this chat. Uh, it was really great to have you today. And we are back in a minute for the next panel. Thank you. Stay with us. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Hello. 
This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. Welcome back, and let me announce the next panel during which we will discuss the Beyond Banking services for the SME customers and creative of effective ecosystems. So as we discussed during the first panel, that having the customer uh, experience that will differentiate banks uh, on the market and the offer that SMEs will really um, uh, appreciate and choose the banks uh, on the market, uh, is really becoming critical now due to the increased uh, digitalization engagement. So, uh, in implementing the uh, Beyond Banking Solution is the one uh, of the um, services that banks that will differentiate banks on the market. So, due to our this year's online and mobile banking study, we see that here in the Central Eastern Europe region around 30% of the banks uh, implemented such kind of services for SMEs. So now let's discuss in this panel and let me invite uh, here the speakers to share their experiences on such implementations and let us discuss the opportunities. So the first speaker I am to invite now is Sibit Strack, CEO at Contist, which is an online bank for the freelancers in Germany. Sibyl, hello and welcome. Good morning from sunny Berlin. Hello. Great. So uh, obviously you want me to start right now, so let me let me jump in. And uh, well, uh, we at Contest are looking at a very special segment of SMEs. We are looking at uh, the um, freelancers who tend to be um, knowledge workers. So in Germany, we are having four million freelancers. It's the fastest growing segment uh, in the in the working environment, and uh, 2.3 million of them do not have any employees. And um, so uh, we at Contest are focusing on those ones, so freelancers with no employees, and we tend to think that we have found very special solution for them to solve their like biggest pain point. And I'm happy to to jump in on that one because it's very new. We launched our service during Corona, so we have used Corona to come up with, you know, basically the future of the banking for the self-employed. So let me jump right in. So what in Germany are the biggest pain points of a freelancer? In Germany, uh, you're having the situation that basically uh, the freelancer works one month in a year for, well, basically struggling with his financial administration. What do we mean by this? It's all about getting invoices um, and the uh, financial admin rate, and, and that involves banking, accounting, i.e. bookkeeping, and of course the taxes. So in Germany, freelancers need to file their taxes, and usually they're struggling with it. If they do not want to struggle with it so much, they employ a tax advisor, and the tax advisory services on average are costing 2,500 euros a year. So if you compare that to the 300 euros uh, that the freelancer spends on banking, this is a much higher amount. So at Contis, we started in 2017 basically with a bank account. Uh, and then in 2018, addressed some of the issues uh, that uh, are related to accounting. And uh, we integrated with three of the biggest accounting service companies and software providers in Germany. But now we are basically going, you know, into it full. And so at Contis, we're aiming at basically merging and combining the banking, accounting and tax stuff for the freelancers. 
And um, so, as I said, we started with a bank account. And right from the beginning, we had a very uh, special focus on already uh, addressing the taxes. So the customer, the freelancer gets from us a German bank account. We are not doing it by ourselves, but we're partnering with Solaris Bank. And uh, he's getting a virtual and if he wants a physical uh, debit card, it's a visa debit. And we are going for real time banking, as so many of you will do. But what have we done? And this is something that we did from the beginning. We basically um, are allowing the customer to uh, reserve some money uh, on virtual buckets for the income tax, which is definitely the largest chore. Uh, uh, that a freelancer has and also we are uh, reserving money for his VAT because that needs to be paid to the t German tax authorities on a monthly or quarterly basis and we have found out through well some studies and of course also surveys within our customer group that um, not getting the taxes right and not being able to pay the taxes are basically the biggest pain point that a German freelancer has. So he gets this beautiful account from us. It's uh, German and English. It's uh, native Android and and uh, and iOS. We also have a web app, and uh, he sees what's his to spend and what needs to be reserved uh, so that he or she is able to fulfill the tax duties. So this is where we always, you know, wanted to land with our account offering, if you will. And um, already this one is, you know, really successful so i'm uh, just showing you some uh, list um, we were awarded by handelsblatt which is one of germany's uh, biggest business uh, newspapers basically the award for the best business bank account in october 2020 and that is with regard to our uh, highest priced uh, account if you uh, account if you will it's the bank account in combination with an accounting software and so we won all over the others and are pretty proud of this. However, as I said, we have used Corona times to basically do the third uh, move that we had always been uh, planning. And we basically pushed it forward because during Corona, we were finding that our customers really are having problems with their finances because there's so many things to look for when uh, Corona hit that uh, we really received all these questions around what do we need to do? Uh, we need to have you know, a proper tax advisor because some of the state aid could only be addressed by a tax advisor. And we started to help not only uh, through hotlines and, and the like and webinars and stuff like this, but we also uh, altered our product and we enhanced our product big way. And uh, this is basically what we did. So uh, we are launching or we were launching our tax service. We launched it in July 2020. So we've been working uh, on that one during the four months of Corona quite heavily. We employed people. We founded uh, two new companies because, I mean, Germany uh, is uh, not only with regard to banking, but also with regard to tax a high, uh, highly um, regulated environment. So we did all this to do something very simple. Our customer only needs to use his banking app. And that is, you know, the familiar banking app of Contis that he has been using, well, the whole, uh, for the whole time of the last three years. And we will do everything for him with regard to taxes in the back office, if you will. And for that, we, as I said, employing, uh, you know, service people, but also we have been building the whole backbone of the service. So, uh, of course, we need to categorize, and this is by largely now by auto categorization uh, already, uh, all the transactions that the customer has on his account. And also we have to then file the taxes for him on a monthly, quarterly, and when it uh, regards the income tax uh, on a yearly basis. And this is basically what we have been building and are still you know, continuously building. Um, but the most important thing is this is 
nothing that the customer sees. The customer continues to use his app. He just files his receipts. You know, he just scans it and, and uploads it, and we do the rest for the customer. So when it comes to the building blocks of our new service, we are basically having uh, five of them. As I said before, we need the real-time financial data from the bank accounts. This is, you know, the most important thing because in order to do a monthly declaration uh, for the VAT, you need to know uh, all the transactions in real time. Then, as I said, we have been building our uh, proprietary tax calculation engine. So unlike in the banking area where we are partnering with, for example, Solaris for the bank accounts, or uh, other providers for the, for the automatic account switching. We are doing this with our own IP, and uh, this is, I think, what, what makes us you know, pretty unique. Also, we are uh, ramping up the automation, and of course, we're using um, AI and machine learning algorithms to train the system to become better over the months. And uh, I think we've, we've made you know, some quantum leaps forward since we started. Uh, the whole system or to build the system in April. Um, but last but not least, or well, almost last but not least, this is very important. You know, as taxes are so much of a pain point in Germany, we do not do only the chatbot stuff, but also we are employing real people who are answering real questions of our customers. Because as I said, this is a big pain point and people are really nervous about getting their taxes right. So we're doing a proper onboarding with our customers. And uh, of course, for the ongoing service, the customer can always reach someone uh, in, in our customer service. Depending on his questions, uh, it goes up to a proper tax advisor. We are uh, currently employing two proper tax advisors already and many more in the services team. Um, and this we do in order to, uh, well, basically fulfill all the needs that uh, you have to uh, fulfill also with regard to the regulatory uh, requirements that you need to fulfill when you are offering tax services. So these five building blocks, uh, we basically ramped up uh, during uh, Corona times. Uh, so far, our problem, if you will, and it's a luxury problem, is to get in the right customers. So we do have a pipeline of several thousand customers who want to onboard to our service. However, we have decided to really focus within, uh, well, the applicants, if you will. Um, so we take on those ones that we can like make really happy with our services. So we are excluding at the moment a couple of our customers or of applicants. Um, and that is the applicants who are having too much of a cash business, because obviously, um, in order to file your taxes properly, every expense needs to be tracked on your account. We are also excluding people with uh, employees. As I said, we're focusing on the freelancers without employees. And uh, we are focusing on the personal uh, companies, uh, on the personal uh, freelancers and not on companies. So we're not taking on the limited companies because from a, um, a balancing or a balance and, and P&L requirements, this is much more complicated than what we need to do for the freelancers. So I think um, this is at the moment, you know, really a luxury problem because uh, we have so many more applicants that we can take. And uh, just to let you know, um, we also are having quite a price tag on that one. So as I showed you in the beginning, the typical tax accountant takes two and a half thousand euros from a freelancer. And of course, with us, the services are being not only much easier for the customer because he only needs to use his uh, his bank account uh, via the app or the web app but it's also cheaper so this is basically what we're having as a price model basically um so uh on the left hand side you're seeing our banking plans and the one that won the price is the dual plan for 12 euros a month and for the tax plans obviously that is much more cumbersome and much more work and, and IP is involved. So the prices are obviously much higher. This is also related to the German 
regulatory uh, requirements with regard to uh, how the tax advisory services are having to be paid. Uh, so at the moment, this year, we are offering the services to whoever wants to join for 99 euros a month. And from next year on, we will do the divide between uh, the customers who are making more than 50,000 euros a year in revenue and the ones that are below uh, this threshold. And as I said, uh, well, if you compare this to the two and a half thousand, it's much cheaper, but also it's much uh, easier for the customer because he doesn't have to waste any time. He only needs to, you know, track his expenses and upload the receipts. And that's about it. And uh, this is being done in real time. So uh, to conclude, I think it's basically, if you want to, if, if you want, it's basically three pieces that make up uh, our contest competitive a competitive advantage um, and that's first of all as i said the dedicated focus on freelancers we're excluding freelancers who do not fulfill uh, the thing we are currently focusing um, so that'll be pretty scalable they're using the familiar front end from banking so nothing that is usually uh, attached with taxes the cumbersome and complicated stuff is involved here in our new services and we're investing highly in automation in order also to run up that one and to scale and we're getting better uh, over the months. And we're really happy that our customers seem to be enjoying our service. We are receiving very, very, very good feedback at the moment and are super happy to have uh, launched this. So this is uh, from my side. So, you know, banking uh, is to our opinion, not the big problem in Germany, you're getting a bank account. The real pain point, uh, our little SMEs, i.e. the freelancers are having, is with regard to taxes. And this is what we're solving fully for them. Mm -hmm. Right. So that that's from my side. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Sibyl. Thank you, Sibyl. And uh, see you later in the discussion panel. And see you later. See you later. And now let me invite the next speaker, uh, Eddie Angel, CBDO at Visita. Eddie, hello and welcome. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, it's really good to, to be here. And uh, Sybil, thank you for that fantastic presentation. Uh, I am if I may introduce myself, I'm Chief Business Development Officer at Visita. Uh, I am unfortunately not a banker and possibly the least person in the panel. Uh, but what we do do at Visita is we uh, have been working for quite a while on uh, helping small businesses, micro businesses, digitalize their business operations. And we're partnering with uh, financial services as well as um, telcos, marketing services uh, to help deliver that digitalization for small businesses together with them. Um, so just a little bit about uh, Visita and who you are to uh, create some credibility. Uh, we are 10 years old this year. Uh, I know this slide says we're 130 people, but by now we're 130. And what we do for a living is help small businesses of many professions and many verticals figure out how to manage their basically the holy trinity of money, time, and clients. And of course, these are the fundamentals of every business. If you don't have um, clients that pay you, uh, then you're effectively not a business. And of course, the biggest challenge um, that we see for from our perspective is how do you prioritize uh, working in the business as opposed to working on the business. So we're in touch with those customers. We're working with them uh, over you know, Facebook groups, um, onboarding calls, support conversations. And our aim when we're working together with them is first of all to simplify business operations, then automate whatever we can 
And nowadays we understand more and more that we need to also take a significant part in the way that they learn how to digitalize business operation, how to optimize their businesses, how to make them more uh, transparent, more efficient. And eventually the objective would be to allow them to focus on what's most important. And of course, in any economy, competitive economy, the client experience is the most important part. And if they are to create those great customer experiences with a little time and the you know great stress that they would have, especially in the last uh, few months, then we need to be there to support them. Now, as we were working out, you know, our learning business, uh, you know, learn, learning how to become a better business activity, we tried to look at digital inclusion as a learning process. And I think specifically, you know, we did say, I don't know if you caught it on the first slide, but we have uh, 1.4, 1.5 million registered users. We have to appreciate the fact that the majority of those customers would be early adopters. Uh, that is people who were able to come to us and you know, figure out what is missing in their business, what is their pain point, search for a solution, find a landing page, uh, click on try now and get started on a digital journey. And if we're looking at the percentage of people who do that, the percentage of people who are early adopters in almost any economy, we're looking at 5%, 10% of businesses. So our aim together with our partners is how do we reach what's called the early majority? That would be um, 35, 40% of the uh, population that are not necessarily afraid of technology. They're looking to um, you know, advance their businesses. They're looking to do a better job, but they might not have the, the language to articulate their need. They might not have good ideas on how to get there. So we look at this as a learning process. And I wanted to bring in the definition of what learning is. And learning, and by the way, this is the behavioral definition. There are other definitions as well, but this works for me which is a relatively permanent change in behavior that occurs as a result of experience. And I'd like to specifically focus on the aspect of change. If we're going to ask people to digitalize their business, we're asking them to move away from something that they've done before and into potentially the unknown. So, we needed to take a look at how we asked them to change, what we asked them to change. And if anything, what we found is that we needed to look into ourselves and how we communicate with them. So we're product people. As I said, uh, I'm not a bank, I'm absolutely a nerdy product person. We're a product company. The majority of our employees are developers and, and product managers. And we have a lot of feature set. And we, use, we, we do ask our clients what feature set are you looking for. They would tell us we have upwards of 200 different uh, features built into the product. And therefore, you know, we used to look at things from a very uh, practical perspective. And, you know, individually, we would say, you talk to our clients and they would tell us, I need to do this, I need to do that, which was perhaps uh, the mistake. Because eventually, if you are a micro business, business and you manage that business on a day-to-day -day level, you are not, you know, walking away from it at the end of the day. You, it, when it's, I don't know, five o'clock, six o'clock, the end of your working day, you're not walking away from it like a, an accountant might. And therefore, we needed to stop look at entrepreneurship as a set of tasks to fulfill. And we needed to start look at them as a state of being, which is, I am probably an entrepreneur 
24 7 i'm thinking about it i'm living it i have a normal connection to what i'm doing i'm not just leaving my computer at five and walking away from it and in order to do that we needed to we needed to converse with the team i'm sorry elena i think you needed to mute yes um, so yes, yes. we we assembled a team of small businesses and we asked those small businesses to uh help us figure out what we need to do this is the original team the people here that you see on the screen the original team that helped us with that we did have a lot more participants in this project since, but just wanted to highlight the fact that our educational platform was built um, not just for SMEs, but by SMEs, which we are very, very proud of. And as we were talking to them about what are their needs and what are they looking for? And through those conversations, we were looking at a much, much wider range of uh, discussion points. So it wasn't just about how do I make sure, um, you know, all of my appointments are uh, have automated reminders or how do I chase my clients for outstanding balance? It was also about how do I create um, team alignment. It was also about how do I maintain my own mot motivation and, and more so and more than any other segment, which is why micro businesses are so exciting to, to work with. People talk about their dreams. People talk about how do they realize themselves as, you know, as individuals. And, and that was really an amazing experience again for us we might be a small business uh, having 140 employees, but we're definitely not in the front line in the same way that they are. And then the second part was now that we have all of this learning, how do we build this into an experience? So what exactly is an experience on a digital platform, assuming that we're not out there to train them face to face? And we realized eventually that, you know, we have thankfully social media and so much content out there that tells us what people respond to emotionally. And we know that people respond well to, to videos of, of genuine people sharing their actual experiences. We know people respond to, uh, you know, inspiring stories, but we also know that people respond to stories about um, you know, failures that you learn from. So we made sure not to include just, you know, amazing stories about how digitalization worked well, but also what they learned from the parts that didn't work well or the parts that, you know, weren't just weren't for them. You know, so we've compiled all of that into a project. And we went live together also during Corona time. So in April, we launched... Uh, businessunusual.io that is our learning hub that we launched together with MasterCard and we try to to make sure that first of all of course all SMEs uh, will have access to free content and something that they can do um, to to start figuring out how to address their uh, you know their opening open issues and questions marks which is specifically around uh, through the pandemic and what we of course also needed to take into account that if we're working together with a brand like mastercard we're going to be talking to a lot of different people in a lot of different stages in their lives in their business lives so we might be talking to people who get it instantly and they'll be like okay i get it i'll just go activate the tool and i'll be ready to go and we've seen quite a lot of these. We do see people tell us, I'm quite anxious about technology. I don't even know to say why. I, and we know people are anxious about change in general. So we have to take care of their process as well. We have people say, I would love to do this, but I don't know where to start. I don't know how to get to that point. So we have to kind of create 
baby steps or micro goals for them. Where do I start when I have a mountain of work to digitalize? Where, you know, what, what could I possibly do as my first step? And we have to cater for these people as well. And finally, we have to take into account that on some tools, in some situations, people will tell you, you know what, this is simply not for me. I'm not looking to automate my class uh, subscriptions because that is it. Uh, I like that personal uh, attention. I like the personal content and wanted to do that. And we have to respect that as well and possibly offer them other beneficial tools that they can use uh, instead of the ones that they do not wish to use. And then finally, of course, we have to take all of these people into account and is understand that this is the beginning of their journey into digitalization. So we have to um, kind of combine all of that into a single experience, which is what we're doing, for example, and again, we have many examples, many different custom ways of building this together with each of our partners. So we have all kinds of um, examples that I would love to talk more about them uh, during the panel. But for right now, actually this week, we're running uh, together with MasterCard a workshop um, in Europe that will, starts with a 40 minute webinar. But of course, we don't want them to just do a 40 minute webinar. We would want to take them down the funnel. So over that call, we asked them to do a self-assessment of their business needs and understand, you know, what could help them uh, where they are right now in their digitalization journey. We then offer them a set of tools and lessons to take this to the next level, which they can then complete in their own free time. And eventually we make sure that these, all of the people that participated are connected to each other in a business community. Because if there's one thing that we learned is that peer learning and, you know, peer, uh, you know, lessons taken together are the most important ones to change um, and influence the behavior of our customers and of course influence for the better. And finally, just an, uh, an, an option to mention our team's motto, which is we rise by lifting others. I truly believe that every person that joined us today could um, understand their responsibilities right now through COVID and understand you know, what, what does it mean for us to be supporting this amazing uh, segment of the economy. So we're very thankful and very fortunate to be, to be working with them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eddie. Thank you for your presentation. And let me invite the next three speakers, which will be presenting together. Uh, and after this presentation, we will have a panel discussion. So I invite also you to type your questions into the chat right now so that I could ask our speakers in the next session. So now let me invite here to this live stage three speakers from Hungary. Katalin Kauzli, Business Development Director at Partner Hub and Charlie India. Norbert, Norbert Santamasi, Head of Product Development and Cash Management, Budapest Bank. And Gergewe uh, Tukodi, Managing Director at OTP EBS. Hello and welcome. Hello, Katalin, we cannot hear you. Can you turn off your microphone, please? Uh, yes. I yeah. Yes. So now it's better it's now. Of okay. Course. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Katalin Kausli, and uh, I'm a co-founder of Charlie India. At uh, Charlie India, we uh, build bespoke invoice management solutions for uh, for bank. Uh, sorry, I just lost the connection for the internet clicker. Yes. So with Charlie India, we build bespoke invoice management solutions for banks to help their SME customers manage their financial administration much more effectively. Therefore, we integrate digital invoice management into the online bank. But to manage all your invoices digitally, you need a seamless data exchange. Therefore, we started uh, building an e-invoicing ecosystem next to the payment ecosystem, which is also interoperable. 
and this will help SME, this will help SMEs and enterprises to pay and finance their invoices digitally and also manage their financial administration fully digitally. We built uh, such solutions for two banks, two OTP banks, OTP EB solution and Budapest Bank's uh, Budapest Financial Assistance solution. The most important features are uh, uh, for these solutions is that you can issue invoices, you can receive, uh, process, and pay your invoices with just a couple Hello. of clicks. You can Hello. access to uh, the transaction Hello. history of the bank, and therefore you can do an invoice data and transaction matching uh, within the solution. We also enable accounting integration with a very easy integration layer, uh, and uh, you can use this, these solutions as a digital archive. Um, both banks, uh, both banks are using our technology, but they are not integrated in any way. Um, there is an, still there is an invoice data exchange between the two banks in terms of invoice data. Um, and the payment data uh, exchange happens through the bank's payment system. I will show you how this uh, works uh, in practice in a short uh, demo video. I am uh, issuing an uh, invoice from the Budapest Bank system. Uh, sorry, can you start the video, please, because it's not working. So yes, I am issuing the invoice from Budapest Bank System. This is a fully uh, tax compliant uh, digital invoice uh, according to Hungarian legislation, but we can uh, prepare any kind of uh, invoice for any kind of legislation. So I am issuing the invoice. And when I'm is uh, I issue the invoice, the tax, uh, tax uh, authority also gets the invoice data because it's in compulsory in Hungary. Now I am, uh, I prepared the invoice and I am sending it to the other system, OTP bank system via secure email. Now I am going to the recipient system and uh, check the invoice. If I bought this service, I can view the invoice and just um, approve and process with a couple of clicks. I am approved the, approving the invoice and categorizing it. And now I am going to uh, invoices, and then and then I am uh, adding it to the transfer package and just uh, paying with a couple of clicks and finalizing a transfer and uh, authorizing the payment transaction as I sign it. So. I am now handing the word over to my uh, banking partners, OTP EBS and Budapest Financial Assistant to uh, introduce their solutions and uh, their vision about the ecosystem. again uh, if i remember my colleagues were here presented here a couple of years ago at that time it's what tamash who i followed as the managing director okay the otp ebs is a subsidiary of otp bank and this is how my Kathleen showed uh, the i tried to go on with the slides so my Kathleen showed us uh, so we together uh, we started to think about how to offer new types of services to SMEs. And we started to develop the concept a couple of five years ago, roughly, uh, when OTP Bank started a digital transformation program. And, and in that, we realized that the SME segment was the less represented uh, in among the digital projects. And we thought that if we have less solutions for them, and they are the, how we call it, uh, the less presented and then less focused segment in the banking uh, digitalization because you know retail has higher margins and incorporates a couple of big deals can can take over the uh, or can um, uh, take, take over the the position of what we need to what what we would like to spend on on sme uh, development 
So we started to think about it, what we can do with SMEs, and then we had the concept that we wanted to build a cloud-based platform, and this is why you can see in the middle uh, OTP EBS, that basically connects invoicing, banking, and accounting information on one single platform. So in, initially that was the, the concept, but then we realized that due to regulations and the uh, positive environment in the invoicing, we, we had to in, incorporate an invoicing platform. So basically uh, we just uh, have an invoicing, a kind of banking transaction monitoring uh, solution and the financial dashboard that, that we can uh, give to our clients and all the other functions are uh, connected to, through APIs. So on the left side, you can see that we have internet bank connections. Uh, for, for, with OTP Bank as a subsidiary, we have a special agreement and uh, actually we are one of the internet banks of OTP Bank. And with the other banking partners, we could use the PSD2 APIs that they have. So with that, with that solution, we are able to monitor the actually the transaction history. Uh, we can give the clients the uh, account statement and also initiate money transfers, uh, so actual payments uh, through the, from the platform. And uh, later, we can offer other banking products. Uh, with, the, with the invoicing partners, uh, there you can see on the bottom, we are partnering, we try to partnering the online invoicing platforms right now what we can able is to register and handle all the invoices that they are issuing so the clients can register the data very easily to the platform and uh, we can share the banking and the invoicing data to the accountants through api so this is the this is the vision what we wanted to build so uh, be in the center of invoicing and banking data and share it with clients and of course uh, we, we can integrate it with ERP systems in order to uh, support them in their development. And a special Hungarian regulation is that, that uh, the Hungarian tax authority needs to be, uh, the invoicing data can, needs to be uh, sent to them. And a couple of things about the numbers. After three years, we have 25,000 users uh, or 30,000 users, almost 24,000 SMEs. Uh, roughly 30 percent, so one third of them is really active. As you can see, we have more than 1,000 accountants who already signed in, and they can share and they can have access to all the data that they have. And monthly, we issue 34,000 invoices. We our clients are receiving and registering 14,000, and the payment initiation is roughly 12 million euro, which is was last month. So actually we are pretty good in growing and we would like to use the network for growing. If the partners grow, then we can grow and we can offer better services to our clients. So let's see what uh, Budapest Bank and uh, Norbert can tell us after, after I, I introduce the solution, what we developed. Thank you. Thank you, Jörgeli. Do we have Norbert? Yes, it's me. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfectly. Okay, thank you, Anna. Uh, let me greet everyone. I'm Norbert Santamashi on behalf of Budapest Eskos Financiers Ltd. It's Budapest Bank uh, uh, subsidiary. I'm responsible for Bupa product development. Bupa is an abbreviation. I'm sorry, Norbert, just one question. Can you turn on your camera, please? Because we cannot see you. Can you do this? Excuse me, because it, it's switched on. It, it, it's turned on. Okay, so let's 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 continue with the presentation. Okay. Okay, I'm responsible for Bupa product development. Bupa is an abbreviation, and uh, it means Budapest Financial Assistant in English. What's Bupa and why? I briefly summarize. In 2017, Budapest Bank decided uh, to extend the product and the service portfolio with non-core solution in order to uh, enhance its uh, competitiveness and uh, to provide wider range of services for its more than 60,000 micro and small businesses. This is the beyond banking uh, uh, strategy. And the first step was to identify uh, a new uh, service. 
According to purchase to uh, pay concept, we help our customers basically in payment and their cash management besides lending and financing activity. If we gradually move towards uh, beyond banking service, the next activity is invoicing, which is working hand in hand with uh, payments, it's through getting the payment process and this common point in every business. So, uh, payment and cash management uh, then was mostly uh, online, provided by banks. However, invoicing was mostly offline, uh, provided by uh, third parties. In order to bring them on to be uh, fulfilled. First, invoices had to be digitalized. Since July of 2020, online data service uh, to Hungarian tax authority but every domestic B2B invoice is mandatory and it resulted the online invoicing platform market has started to increase and the invoicing caught up with uh, cash management in terms of digitalization. Second, PSD2 established the opportunity to join third party services to banking system. Uh, Bupa applied and got the very first full PSD2 certificate uh, with banking background in Hungarian market, both ESP and PSP as uh, well. So as it turned out, Bupa is a cross-service platform, including invoice and payment. And I can describe it, five, uh, it uh, with five features. The clients can receive and store their incoming invoices, can initiate its payment based on PSP service, of course, can issue new invoices as well, and uh, tracking its payment automatically, because Bupa notifies the customers if the invoice paid out uh, based on ASP. And finally, assistance service, uh, including a dashboard and smart to-do list, give a financial overview uh, to the client based on invoicing and the payment data. And uh, Bupa notifies the client if there is anything to do, if there are uh, unpaid bills or unpaid invoices or invoice uh, to be issued, etc. That's why we call as a financial assistant, and this is our MVP uh, uh, product. According to our strategy, we would like to develop it uh, further to make it available on every devices, mobile and uh, uh, tablet. Uh, that's what we call multi-platform features. Uh, we would like to query from te uh, tax authorities uh, online system every invoice data of the customers and uh, to display in Bupa and uh, not only which are stored and issued in uh, uh, Bupa. This is multi-invoice features. We would like to uh, connect Bupa to other banks, not only to Budapest uh, bank system uh, in the future. This is the multi-bank uh, features. And uh, we would like to uh, uh, connect Bupa to other beyond banking platform as well, web shops uh, and the accounting system mainly. And later uh, to Budapest Bank uh, online uh, core products. For example, online current accounting, uh, account opening. This is multi-product features, and uh, we would like to open it uh, to other segments as well, mass, con mass consumers, uh, large enterprises, and that's why it will be a multi-segment uh, platform. Uh, so in our strategy, this is the way uh, to ecosystem, and uh, uh, we would like to transform this solution into one-stop shop and uh, marketplace. Uh, Bupa is free of charge uh, for Budapest Bank customers, uh, Bupa is available for non-Budapest bank customers as well. Uh, they can use only the invoicing services. So Bupa is quasi bank independent. Bupa generally contributes to Budapest bank customer acquisition, customer retention, and the transactional uh, revenue in line with Beyond Banking strategy. But uh, Bupa can be considered as a standalone uh, revenue stream platform. Bupa in numbers. Bupa has been launched in publicly in September 2020, so we are talking about brand new solution, but numbers are promising and in line with our best case scenario. At this moment, we have uh, more than 3,000 customers. Uh, there are more than 10,000 issued invoice in total amount of 10 million euro, and there are more than 1,000 accepted uh, invoices. More than uh, 700 customers connected Bupa the Budapest Bank system, and uh, they are using uh, ASP services as well. And the next uh, features which will be uh, uh, coming, uh, PSP payment initiation service is coming soon uh, in December, at this moment in pilot phase. 
Thank you for your attention, and I pass the word to Kata. Yes, do we have Katalin now for the for the end of the presentation? And thank you, Norbert, for your part. Yes, actually, I think Katalin wanted to end the presentation. Katalin, you're welcome. Yes, um, I just uh, can't see the slides, but uh, if it's coming, I am starting. Just to summarize up, uh, yeah. Yeah, if you could just uh, go to the next slide. And the next. Okay. So just briefly to summarize what we are building is that you could see that the banks are forming the backbone of this ecosystem, but also large enterprises can join the ecosystem because they can send and receive invoices from SME customers. And we expect that accounting service, uh, uh, accounting software providers and e-commerce service providers will also join the ecosystem to enjoy the benefits. With our technology, it is very easy to connect into the ecosystem. This is an open ecosystem, enabling um, interoperable and seamless data exchange. And what we learned uh, in these three years since we started working together with our banking partners it's that um, ecosystem building takes time, but um, the change is speeding up, especially it is driven by the change in tax regulations, and uh, banks will be very attractive integration points in our point of view because of their large customer base. With open banking and instant payment, uh, the banks will be able to provide value-added services for the large enterprises, so they will also uh, want to join the ecosystem. Request to pay is such a value-added service where invoice data and payment data can be connected and the uh, huge efficiency increases uh, can be reached by uh, using uh, such services as, as request to pay. So this is clearly a win-win-win situation to be part uh, of such an open ecosystem uh, that comprises banks, SMEs, large corporates and service providers. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, we are waiting thank you, for Katalin. your questions. Yes, we have questions. Thank you, Katalin. So let's start our uh, discussion panel. Yes, we have all our speakers here. Yes, we have all our speakers here, so let's let's start. We have uh, some questions in our chat, and also I've, I have some for you as well. So my first question will be to OTP, Budapest Bank, and Contest. So what was your primary strategy when you were launching this uh, beyond banking services for the SME customers? So was it the customer attraction acquisition, or this was uh, rather to uh, for the um, loyalty and retention of the existing customers? I remember that Budapest Bank mentioned that this uh, portal is available, Bupa portal is available for both either prospects and existing customers. So please, I would like each of you comment on this. And for the existing customers, which part, which percentage of your customers are using the platform at the moment, on your services? Yes, uh, Norbert, would you start, start here? Yes, Norbert, uh, okay. please. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, thank you. Bupa's customer's portfolio is at building up phase at this uh, moment. Um, our activity definition uh, is reflecting uh, to five main features um, what I uh, talked about, except mm -hmm. uh, assistance service. If all of them uh, are actively uh, used, it means it's, uh, uh, we have uh, four stars uh, customers. If the customers are uh, using only uh, three features, it means it, they are three stars uh, customers, etc. Uh, Bupa has its own CRM uh, strategy, uh, which is focusing to upgrade the uh, customers. And at this moment, activity rate is, uh, activity rate is around uh, 33%, uh, but we accept uh, a higher rate around 50-60% uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, four-stars uh, uh, customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Gergely, what about OTB, OTB Bank? Um, our, our strategy was initially to offer new services for the clients. I mean, uh, this is really invoicing services. So right now we have two types of customers. One of them who are OTP banks customers and they connect OTP EBIS account to their OTP internet bank account, then of course they are the more valuable for us because they do also banking, not just invoicing on the system. So for them, we have a special pricing. Uh, we ask some like three euro per month for, for this uh, service. And for the other clients, other type of clients, we only offering invoicing solution. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the background, we have a kind of strategy that we would like to reach other type of other clients to choose OTP bank because they have more uh, features that they can use if they switch to OTP bank account. But actually this is a kind of not that very successful strategy so far, so to be honest. Uh, so right now, uh, basically 30%, uh, so what I said, one third or 30% of the clients are using actively. And those actually, even, even for the clients who are registered for invoicing and registering invoicing, and also one third of the clients who are using also the banking uh, features of the platform. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Gergely, and so I have, it's really mm -hmm, I have here a question from our attendees in the chat. So when when the OTP EBs will be available in the networking banks in other countries? So where OTP bank is present? <laughs> uh, it's a good question. It's in the strategy. It's, it's not going to happen in, in a couple of days. As Katalin showed, that room wasn't built in a day. Right now, we are focusing on 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 for, on having some more clients in Hungary, being a little bit more successful. But at the same time, we are investigating. And what I can tell is there are a couple of countries where OTP Bank is located, where there is a negotiations has already been started to to introduce this solution. Mm -hmm. But actually, as Katali mentioned, since the background and the backend system is Charlie India, which is easy to uh, develop and, hand, and, and handle and connect to banks, because we have already a good prototype, how we can, I mean, if we can call our solution or the Pesh Bank solution that, so any kind of banks can easily be really connected and then the services, even from our side or from Budapest Bank, I guess it would be very easy to uh, compared to other big projects, of course, mm -hmm. I mean, very easy. It's not mm -hmm. not like one or two days, but in a couple of months or half year or a year it can be done. I mean, it's not like if you want to develop a similar solution, it for us it took until it's it's very very clear. It's for working uh, efficiently, and all the services that are there. It took like two three years. So that's the like half one year versus two three years. It makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Gergely. And I will come back to Katalin uh, in, a, in a while, but now I would like uh, uh, to ask uh, Sibyl, uh, what, is, what about Contist? And actually, is your tax uh, service solution is connected somehow with e invoicing application? Right. So at first, um, yeah, thanks for your question. So uh, when it comes to the question uh, you raised earlier, we opened up our existing customers in, in a sort of a beta phase. And uh, after the processes around the taxes were stable, we opened up also to new customers. So basically, uh, with the service, we are open um, to both uh, existing and new customers. Um, when it comes to the invoicing function, so basically we will, in our uh, solution, also build an invoicing function because this is basically the last building block that will allow our customers to go away from their, you know, own software and accounting software, mm -hmm. right? So we will get uh, an invoicing software also into our services. And uh, yeah, this is this is the plan, and we will uh, deliver on that one by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Okay. Thank you, Sibyl. And uh, Katarin, I would like to ask you here: How do you see how you can deploy such a payment and invoicing ecosystem in other countries here in the CE region? And what I also would like here to add that 
that uh, that this um, feature that you have uh, just uh, just will focus my attention of our attendees. That uh, what I like about your solution very much is that having this opportunity that you not only can issue as an SME customer an invoice in the system in the application, but also to receive uh, invoices from your counterparties and pay it by one or two clicks uh, in the on the platform and also uh, the request to pay solution which you are planning to implement this is also a very i think a very crucial thing for the smes in the context of you know faster payments instant payments and covering financial gaps uh, especially now so katalin how do you see this can be implemented in other countries as well um now it's getting easier and easier working together with the two banks we have also collected a lot of uh, experience and developed our platform so we have almost a kind of a box product which can be deployed and used as a prototype and then each bank in any country can uh, launch its solution within a couple of months i would say what uh, Gergely said, like two, three to six months, depending on how the bank proceeds, it's really, I think, um, a feasible implementation timeline. So, yeah, we also, so we have the backend, uh, like, fully customizable, and we have also now a customizable frontend, which makes the uh, customization and, uh, and tailoring it to the bank's needs much more easy now than like two years ago or three years ago. So I would say, yeah, a couple of months is a feasible implementation time. And for the technological integration, we are also working um, on the developments, how to connect to developers, accounting software. So basically the infrastructure, the APIs is uh, ready and we are working continuously on that but we are happy to serve anyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Katalin. We have one more question in the chat connected with the e-invoicing. And uh, from Svetlana Zikic, uh, do you have an idea of connecting and offering option of factoring services for e-invoicing? Actually, we have some uh, examples here in the sea region of uh, uh, implementation uh, of the of connection factoring and invoicing uh, with invoicing applications. So this is possible. So maybe Katalin uh, and uh, uh, Norbert and Gergely, if you uh, would like to answer here, do you have some plans in the nearest future? <coughs> um, if I can start. Um, yes, I can say yes. Um, according to our uh, strategy, um, we are planning uh, multi-product features uh, to show our customers uh, in the future and it's, uh, it, I think it will be happening uh, not in a short term uh, but in a mid-term uh, uh, future um, and uh, we are planning a similar um, sol solution for our uh, uh, customers because uh, this uh, opportunity uh, which is based on invoicing and payment uh, can um, establish uh, uh, the opportunity to bring uh, other new services as well. I think uh, it will be uh, happening gradually, but uh, according to our uh, future plan, it will be happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so let's... Do we yeah, have any additional... Uh, if Yes, Katarina. Yeah, sorry, Elena, if I can add. So we also started uh, discussing with some factoring companies who see value in, uh, in having access to invoice data. So I think this will happen in the next one to two years uh, with multiple solutions on the market because it makes sense. And uh, invoicing interoperability is uh, coming into practice in Europe, in the whole world. So it's going to happen, I think, in the next couple of years, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, and my next uh, question I would address, I would like to address first to Adi and then also to other, our panelists. So, um, Adi, my question to you is, could you also give some examples how you can you cooperate with the banks? And also please comment, because you have your own SME customers uh, on the platforms. How, so what is, what is their percentage of the active users there and how you actually motivate them if you do something here, if, how you motivate them to use your solutions more, more actively? Okay. Uh, so our product is a subscription-based uh, product. It's a SaaS product. So by definition, uh, the majority of our customers will be users. Otherwise, uh, they would cancel their subscription. So they do come into this um, you know, specific set of features set with a intention in mind, let's call it that way. But normally they would have just one out of a whole bunch of different feature set that we could offer them. So if they came in specifically for um, enabling uh, their business logic, so uh, payment packages, end, end of month balance, automatic billing, all of that part of our product. So they were thinking about payments. They might come into the system and through the internal um, discoverability that the business that our system has, they would find they can also use it to retain their customers, that they can also remind them um, let's say if they're a yoga studio or that they haven't been in for a while and send them a coupon or congratulate them for their birthdays. So it's a gradual process of um, using more and more features out of the entire uh, feature set that we have. Um, what we are doing uh, specifically to encourage that, first of all, everything is really well, well built into uh, you know, the feature set is well built into the uh, ecosystem. So, for example, if I am, again, a yoga studio and I'm offering yoga classes, and I can introduce an option to prepay the class by a package of 10 classes for the price of nine, then I may, might have come in with the scheduling class management uh, booking in mind, but I will immediately start using payments and providing that business for them. And um, completely uh, random, if I may say. Now, we're also through our webinars, and this is your question about um, partnerships. So we can use our product to uh, upsell and you know cross sale services from the bank. So, for example, we are working with some banks who would want to use as an initial uh, kind of entry point. They want to use our uh, quote to invoice to online payment capability, uh, and then. On top of that, we would then use, help their clients upgrade to other, the rest of the uh, capabilities. And what that means for the bank is that over time, they get greater, first of all, a good beyond banking customer experience for their clients, which is kind of the obvious reason why people are coming into this. But also, they will be getting a good uh, transparency, good visibility into data. Because if we are able to share with them anything that that business does, that we know how many customers they have, we know how often they come in, we know how they pay them. If they pay them cash, we would know that because they're tracking it into the system. So we have this ability to give them uh, data to then upsell, cross-sell their own services and also have a risk uh, management aspect to it. Uh, because obviously, if banks are offering funding to a business, then they're literally invested in their success. So, you know, 
for all many so many reasons it would make sense for them to also invest in getting them to use the, the digitalization tools mm -hmm. thank you thank you adi if i may ask yeah. uh, here also norbert and gergely comment here do you have some motivation schemes or are somehow SME relationship managers or maybe some digital teams uh, in the head offices are responsible? Do they have some KPIs for motivating and engaging uh, customers use your platforms, your solutions more? Gergely, would, would, would you starts? start? Yes, Gergely, please start. You can start. <laughs> okay, then. Um, yes, we, we try to uh, we try to offer the, the, our solution together with OPP Bank products. So, so actually, we try to incorporate and then work on with the the team of OTP Bank's uh, SME managers, if we can call them. Uh, so 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 we, we we talk with them and then we try to Im include and build into their KPIs like. Right now, according to regulations, we cannot they cannot sell the product. They can just uh, offer to the clients, uh, and this is what we work on. How what are the reasons how they can uh, convince and motivate the clients that this overall solution is much better for them to use than and, and to integrate their own platforms and own own uh, softwares to this platform than using separate platforms for the separate solutions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you norbert as monk um Uh, Bupa is built in uh, in safety system of uh, of small business advisor, and more than fifty percent of the new customers are coming from um, Budapest Bank uh, branch network, uh, and uh, it's a very important uh, channel uh, for us. It's offline channel, but this is the best place. Uh, 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 to, to talking about and to introduce a new solution for our customers uh, beside uh, uh, online uh, uh, channels. Small business advisors get uh, every information uh, which is um, important about uh, Bupa. Bupa, they know, uh, they were uh, educated and uh, Bupa is sold uh, in a Bupa Pan Budapest Bank uh, branch network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Norbert. And the last question, which I will read now from the chat, so I would ask you to please comment shortly each of you, all the all the panelists from uh, Charles Gamba. So banks are usually very risk sensitive to invest in startups. How do you support with your tools starting business? Can it help small businesses to get better financing? financing options. So, uh, Sibyl, uh, let us start from you and then Adi and, and then uh, uh, Katalin and Norbert and Gergele. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Um, first of all, ourselves, we are sort of a banking services provider. So we are ourselves uh, providing not loans to the customers, but an overdraft. And this is because, I mean, we know the customer, so together with our partner Solaris, we are offering an overdraft to our customers. So basically, the cust our customers don't need to look outside for, you know, financing options. And also for freelancers, the loans are not so attractive as the overdraft or small business lending or small business leasing stuff. Other than that, with our new tax service, of course, we are getting the uh, finances of our freelancers in order. And uh, of course, uh, we are offering also some facilities and some features uh, with which the customer can then and uh, ask for a loan because his finances are sorted out. Uh, he has a P&L uh, and current P&L at every time. So I do expect uh, our services uh, to be uh, an enabler and uh, the service to make it easier for our customers to go out and make an impression to outside parties that their finances are fine. 
Mm -hmm. so, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sibyl. Adi, would you would you answer here? Yeah, I, I think uh, it ties together with the win-win situation of digitalization, because if that business is fully adopting a digital platform, then they are able to share that information with the financing partner, as well as, you know, stay connected with that, that partner through APIs to help them maintain that trust and that knowledge of what's going on in the business. And I do think, again, given the fact that there is such a strong incentive for the banks to actually digitalize small business for that exact purpose, um, banks should reward businesses who have taken on technology. So if I had to choose from a risk management perspective between a business that did not um, adopt technology and a business that did, then it would make sense that I would reward them with better rates, um, easier, less bureaucratic way of applying for, for financing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we do have, there are quite a lot of um, companies in this sphere either connecting directly to the bank through a set of APIs like we have, or partners that enable that, like our friends at Upswat, that are basically allowing the small business to connect any small business app that they have to the bank's um, dashboards to see what's going on with them. And again, it's just something that I think the bank should, banks should prioritize when it comes to how they communicate with their small business mm -hmm. clients. Thank you. Thank you, Adi. Katalin. Yes, I think uh, banks can build uh, better risk models using invoice data. So if you have like customer and supplier invoice data, or if you have access to this data, then there will be a better risk model for you. So it will be easier to finance companies with a short credit history. So I think that that is one part of the one part of the application of invoice data. On the other hand, what could be a great product is dynamic discounting, which could be applied by large companies provided by banks or financial service providers, so that small companies as suppliers would be paid um, paid earlier. I think that's the other part uh, of the of the solution because if you are a small company then you need liquidity if you generate some kind of revenue you want to get that revenue on your bank account and not wait like 30 or 60 days to to get paid so i think uh, invoice data and access to invoice data would contribute significantly to to provide better financial services for SME companies, especially the startups. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Katalin. Norbert and Gergely, would you comment shortly, please? Yes, Norbert, would, okay. you, would you start? Okay, I Newly founded companies like startups are served by uh, Budapest banks as well with lending and non-lending products. And uh, in the future, Bupa can help this process to uh, uh, shorten with helps of digitalization, like invoice factoring, what we talked about uh, uh, previously. And I'm sharing uh, uh, Kata's uh, opinion. Invoicing uh, will be the key uh, uh, for uh, financing uh, smaller companies in the future, and the digitalization will be a key factor as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Norbert. Gergely? Then just, just two sentences from me. We definitely can. I mean, this, this was the idea why we tried to or, or develop this solution, because we very much believe that if we have invoice data, then we know basically everything about the finances and about the business activity of companies, even if they are startups or big companies. So, but, but so, so we try to uh, analyze data, and of course, we will need to connect it with other banking services like online onboarding of the clients, as you mentioned earlier, factoring and online uh, loan application. Uh, the point is that 
I mean, right now, and as a subsidy of OTP Bank, we, we prefer to offer OTP Bank's banking pr products to the clients. But together with all the services, what we have, we very much believe that that as a, for the clients, it's very much uh, returning the investment, and then and it's an overall better service than than having the, the same solution or different solutions from different service providers. Mm -hmm. So definitely, there is a there is a place for that, and and uh, startups can 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 be better off for with this digitalization of the, of this segment of this. Banking segment. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Girgel, and thank you very much to all uh, our panelists uh, and speakers now. Thank you for your contribution. And I invite all of you to continue the conversation on the ecosystem and beyond banking in the ecosystem networking zone. And uh, now we are, we'll be back in a minute for the next presentation. Thank you and stay with us. Welcome back, and let me invite the next speakers here to our live stage. Uh, Agnieszka Pirog and Bartłomiej Szymanski from Ayeleron, Poland, will introduce the commercial boost sales platform. So you are welcome. Hello, and please, please turn on your microphone. We cannot hear you. No, we cannot hear you. While we are uh, reconnect, yes, yes, now perfectly. And Agnieszka is, is still mute. Yes, so I will just uh, mention while we are connecting with uh, Agnieszka at the very moment. So um, please. Okay, uh, I'm in, so maybe Olena, right now you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you and just want Ooh. to finish here. Yeah, so please. Uh, for our attendees, the message is you are welcome to type your questions into the chat to the speakers right now. So, Agnieszka and Bartolome, you are welcome. Okay. But I cannot see my presentation. Okay, we warmly welcome all of you on our presentation. As Elena said, the presentation is driven by Agnieszka Piruk. And Bartłomiej Szymański. Okay, we will try to find the answer how banks can uh, be more um, friendly for SME clients and uh, build uh, bigger revenue streams on that type of clients. But before we will start, let's focus on the answer of uh, finding the answer. Uh, are SMEs really getting what they want? SMEs differ one another. Among them, we have such companies like hairdressers, small shops, IT vendors like our company, and many others. Over 99% of companies in Europe are SMEs. That is a huge amount of clients, and it can be uh, attracting by banks with new product and services. Following by Accenture, I can tell you that banks in UK can earn on SMEs in 2020 over 8 billion of pounds. That is huge. How to find that amount of earnings? Unfortunately, 30% of SMEs turn to their banks to, for, for services, helping them turn their businesses better. Over 70% of them are looking elsewhere. Why? SMEs are disappointed, really. They really don't understand why B2B relations in banks are far behind B2C relations in regards to level of innovation. So what do they SMEs clients really want? The first point is personalization. They need omnichannel, multi-product, personal platform. 
that will allow them manage their transactions smoothly with exactly needed scope of features starting from digital onboarding with EKYC procedure on board through managing the whole banking products during the client lifecycle. The second one is personal advisor being always at hand. How to achieve that? The personal advisor can be accessible through such type of tools like video or text chat, like our live bank produced by Ilo. The second point is better and faster distribution of credits. The SME clients would like to have the access to their current information about the credit exposure, but they would also have the possibility to apply for new credit whenever they want and which channel they want. The last but not least are, of course, real-time payments. SMS clients would like to have fast payment execution and track all of their transactions end-to-end, -end, starting from the payment issuance to the end when the, pay, when the payment is arriving to, the, to their clients. How they achieve that? Thanks to a direct integration with Swift GPI, allowing to know the payment status at the very end. What can be the answer for that crucial point of uh, uh, SMS requirements? The approach can be hybrid, uh, hybrid approach of corporate and business banking platform together with video branch platform. Both cooperate together to better serve the SMS clients. Corporate and business banking platform Corporate and business banking platform was created bearing in mind automation of business processes and building one seamless workplace. No matter how, how many backend systems are on the bank side, we integrate all of them together, giving SME access, a client access to all banking products in all channels. The bank clients can start transaction for instance, on mobile banking, and continue it on a desktop. Such approach uh, allows to decrease operational costs and reduce human errors because the bank employees don't, don't need to retype the transaction on the backend bank systems. Banks can choose the scope of implementation, what they want. At the beginning, we are offering them implementation of cash management because the payments are the crucial part of banking business in the area of corporate banking. However, sometimes it's not enough to have the great digital platform on board. Clients can need, in some situation, personal assistance of the relationship manager. And how to achieve that? That's simple. He or she, it means a SME client, can, talk, talk, can contact with a relationship manager through live bank. The next 10 years will be very challenging in terms of digital transformation. So we think that um, there is a need to focus on empowering relationship managers with right tools and platforms to easily communicate with the customers. LiveBank is a video branch platform which enables to communicate with the bank through chat, audio, and video channels, and also supports it with collaborative tools. In order to enrich better customer experience, we focus on three main pillars. The first pillar is omnichannel aggregation. It means that the client can easily resolve inquiries and issues across various channels. As you can see, you can approach the bank through digital platform, mobile banking, corporate website, some traditional channels like email, but also new social media channels like Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp. Moreover, the client can move between those channels without interruption of conversation. For example, if you start from WhatsApp banking and you would like to speak about more sensitive information, we can easily authenticate you and take you to secure channels like mobile banking 
and internet banking. LiveBank is a communication bus. It means that relationship manager uh, is able to handle multiple channels in single user interface. And also there is a full history and context of interaction so that you can handle those queries very efficiently. Relationship, can, relationship, uh, relationship managers can do inbound calls and interactions, but also for commercial growth, you can easily approach your customers with outbound interaction by doing text chats. And you can send, for example, push notification or WhatsApp banking with some commercial offers, follow-ups, etc. The third, uh, the second pillar is integration. So LifeBank integrates with modern technology and tools, which makes relationship manager experience more seamless and efficient. And the third pillar of our um, strategy is that we focus on process optimization and automation. For example, we enable to open an account fully digitally with EQIC. Secondly, we can integrate with chatbot solution so that relationship managers then can focus on much more complex issues. And you can, you can optimize your cost thanks to uh, chatbot solution. LifeBank is deployed in uh, a global scale um, and we work for such brands like Citi, Standard Chatted, Santander and MBank. We predict that this year we will handle more than 3 million of interactions. Um, and I think that now we can move to uh, showing you how the customer journey is looking like and the, how the customer can start interaction with the bank from digital platform. Thanks, Bartek. Of course, SME, SMEs are using digital platform to manage their transactions and contact to the bank, specifically in these times. Thanks to combination of all banking products that are available through our business banking platform, and thanks to integration with backend banking systems, SME clients uh, have really cool and sufficient environment to manage their transactions on a daily basis. The SME's daily tasks are really simple. Starting from cash flow, they, they can see how much money they have, how much, uh, how is the level of their liabilities, of their assets. Uh, thanks to smart payments uh, and uh, easy import uh, procedure, they can uh, execute payments uh, really, really fast. And of course, they can manage many other transactions like trade finance product. They can apply for new letter of credit. They can review how perform cash pooling uh, procedure, uh, structures. They can review their credit cards, deposits, apply for deposits. They see full spectrum of banking products. They can also review the credit situation with information what is the available amount of uh, the credit limit. If there is not enough and with, when it comes to take a credit, uh, sometimes they need an assistance of relationship manager. And within our platform, the relationship manager is at hand. Now we would like to present you a customer journey uh, in order to visualize how the customer can use uh, digital platforms, but also when there is a possibility and the need to contact with relationship manager, you have a swift access. So we will present you a short movie and then you will see how this interaction is handled. You, can, you will see um, agent application, which is um, one user interface to handle all the channels. Um, then uh, you can see how we are using these collaborative tools in order to speak about more complex products, give product features. This will much more enhance your communication these days and you will um, learn how to increase your sales. 
Uh, also, we will present you integration with DocuSign platform because if there is a possibility uh, and regulations allow us to use a digital signature, we can rather redirect the customer to DocuSign platform and then sign this document fully digitally. And the last but not least, we will present you how we can approach these customers, these clients through outbound chat. So you can use them, mobile banking or WhatsApp. So let's start. It's a credit, it's a digital platform. So he or she can approach a relationship manager. It might be dedicated to a relationship manager. You can see one single user interface to handle all channels. Relationship managers have predefined answers to speed up the conversation. We can start from chat, however, we can upgrade to video call to enhance the communication. In order to speak about more complex products, we can use screen sharing and present, visualize all these product features to our clients. If we agree on the details of this transaction or this product, we can leverage on integration with DocuSign platform. Now you can see that the advisor relationship manager is sending a link with a document which will redirect the client to DocuSign platform. There is agreement ready to sign. So the customer puts digital signature here and can send back this document to the bank. After the conversation is finished, there is a customer survey. It's very important because you can measure your customer satisfaction or your net promoter score. And all those questions you can define in Live Bank Administration tool. And eventually, if you would like to do a follow up, you can boost your sales as based on customer shows and reach out to your client with practice commercial outlet. Now you can see that relationship manager can pick up the customer and use mobile banking or WhatsApp banking in order to send proactive message. I have a photo for you or to do a follow-up. Then the customer can easily pop in and start a conversation with relationship managers. And later on, they can agree on some schedule or some details how we can finalize this transaction. Also, we can upgrade this communication to audio or video for the convenience of the client. And if the conversation is finished, the client can also fill in customer service. Okay. For summarizing, you can see LiveBank platform supports digital customers, supports all those channels, and uh, create environment for commercial growth. I think we can move uh, for summarizing our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have time for the questions now. Do we have Agnieszka also here? Yes, I am here. Yes, yes, perfectly. My, my first question here is, is a life bank platform, is it a separate application or this is embedded, for example, to the online banking or some other banking solutions for the customer so that the customer can have one login? Or how does it look like from, from the customer's point of view? Is it a separate application or not? It's, they are it's separate, separate applications. However, okay, go ahead, Dominic. 
<laughs> okay, it's a separate application, but in terms of uh, um, digital platform of uh, integration with single sign-on and authentication services. So whenever you would like to speak with the branch advisor, you will always use the same credentials. Uh, for example, if you are logged into your digital platform, if you start conversation, you are already logged in, and I know as a relationship and manager everything about it. So mm -hmm. it's seamless. Okay. Agnieszka, would you, would you add a comment here? Yes, of course, if you are choosing the uh, products uh, from the um, Aileron, uh, let's say, card of uh, dishes, <laughs> you have uh, them all uh, integrated and uh, giving one seamless uh, platform gathering together of features. Mm -hmm. You mentioned at the beginning of your presentation about actually the first need of the SME. So what SMEs want is the personalization. And actually, yes, so uh, me as an SME customer here in Poland, so yes, I can confirm that the personalization is really a, a crucial thing. And I would really like to receive a very personalized offers, you know, for the, from the banks or other, or fintechs as well. Uh, for, for, you know, and not to receive some offers connected with uh, leasing or some other product that I don't need, for example, in my business. So my question is, so we all know and we all see that these are the benefits that bank have uh, and can have having such a solutions as, as you presented right now. But still, there, there are very few examples here in the C market of, of having such personalized offers for the SME customers. What is your prediction? So how this can really happen to, so that the banks here in the region would be able to implement uh, it at a scale, let's say, and, and what is actually needed from the bank side to, to implement, for example, your solution? Mm, I think that uh, banks should definitely go forward with uh, that uh, with that process, with the personalization of their offer to the, uh, to the clients. As you said, uh, um, banks are managing huge amount of money, uh, um, not only money, but also data. And they don't use the data to be helpful for their clients if they will use that data and build one uh, comprehensive solutions, uh, embed, embedding features exactly need uh, by SMEs clients, so for instance, you, as you said, your company doesn't need uh, leasing. What for the banks are offering uh, for you? I don't understand as well. But uh, I assume that in the next uh, one, um, maybe two years, that we, we can observe a huge uh, fa uh, fast uh, change, uh, changes within the banking environment because the COVID pandemic uh, speed up that process. We predict that uh, such situation as we have today will uh, occur maybe in five years. Mm -hmm. Okay. It is now, we can observe it. Mm -hmm. yeah. but... So in, term, yeah, in terms of personalization, I think we can leverage, for example, on onboarding processes um, and based on our retail uh, experiences, I think that there is a need to enhance this process and to collect more information about the customer. So not only you can open an account, but open an account which fits the best to the client. So serve the right package. Mm -hmm. Secondly, in terms of uh, many clients, I think uh, for relationship managers, it's possible to define this direct connection. So every company has a dedicated advisor. And from our side, it's possible, thanks to routing strategy that can define um, dedicated advisors to those companies and be much more personal, I like personal advisor. And lastly, I think, um, thanks to this, that we can incorporate the list of um, relationship manager portfolio in Live Bank, you can, for example, pick up of those customers and send some commercial campaigns or offers, much more personalized, based, based on your information. 
means zero. As, but personalization is all about data. And what we present here with Agnieszka is the possibility to, uh, to aggregate all those data in digital platform and also in digital assisted channels so that you can, I think, boost this experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agnieszka and Bartolomei. Thank you for your presentations and for your answers. I also invite our attendees to attend uh, Illeron's exhibition stand in our expo area to continue and the conversation also ask maybe some additional questions uh, to our speakers about their product. And uh, now we will be back in a minute for, a, for the next session. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Welcome back. And now we are having a FISA chat on the topic of digitalization of customer interaction. And I'm glad to be joined here by Alexander Putato, Executive Director at System Technologies, a company that is based in Minsk, Belarus. Alexander, hello. Hello, audience. Hello, Alona. Hello, hello. Nice Ladies to meet gentlemen, Thank you for introduction. Thank you, and nice Do to you have you well? today. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. So, Good. so. My question to you, and actually we are discussing here the first part of the day of our conference day, the um, digitalization of the customer, uh, customer's interaction and customer's engagement in digital channels, which has really accelerated from the start of the pandemic and which is increasing. So and now this is really all, all about becoming a customer's digital routine, daily digital routine for the banks. So how from your experience uh, from, uh, and from the projects that you implement, implemented with the banks, how banks can do this uh, and getting customers engaged more and more uh, in their interactions and, and, and uh, services? Okay, thank you for your question. And uh, I would like to start uh, with some words about uh, my company and uh, why I'm here, why we're talking about these topics and so on. So, uh, basically, uh, system technologies uh, are on the map with uh, banking services uh, for more than 22 years. And uh, this uh, gives us opportunity to speak about all this stuff, uh, having a huge experience and uh, uh, experts in our team who is uh, looking through this age and we see how it uh, work around, how it's development and so on. So, uh, due to this, we uh, absolutely see that uh, digitalization of uh, customer interaction, it uh, goes in uh, high speed. And uh, last uh, year, uh, it shows that it's explosive growth. Yes, that's absolutely true. Uh, due, to, uh, due to all these uh, uh, conditions that we all together uh, went to, so uh, uh, this kind of uh, experience, it shows us that uh, uh, the future not not tomorrow, it's today and even yesterday. And uh, those banks who uh, was uh, prepared for the situation and who sought for uh, for that, and uh, they they became a bit more, um, uh, how to say, a bit more uh, effective in these times and. Uh, they found out new uh, new regions, new markets, new customers, and uh, they could provide new services. So uh, one more thing that I would like to uh, show you at uh, this moment is uh, uh, how do we see uh, services and digital activities uh, that uh, are provided uh, for customers, uh, that customers ask, that they have demand of this, and what, uh, what does it mean? Uh, basically, we research a lot, and uh, we see that uh, payments uh, are on the main, uh, on the top of the, of the list of uh, activities and services by the customers. Second uh, line is uh, basically lending, and uh, all, all the other stuff is uh, 
also very important things, and uh, we have to um, provide ability to grow them up. And uh, for Marx, it's also uh, new missions, new ideas, how to uh, involve customers into their into their market, into their uh, even into their portfolio. Let's say. And uh, the next thing that I'd like to uh, uh, to show you and to discuss is the question about uh, how do we see sorry some uh, this slide how do we see uh, the must have uh, what do we see? Uh, what, what do banks need to have uh, right now to provide a proper service to to grow up and not to be uh, on the trail? So uh, basically, it's uh, everybody says it's, uh, it's all about the customer. It's all about uh, focusing on their services, and their needs, and uh, we need to explore what's uh, what customers wants to see, wants to have, and and so on. Uh, the next step is uh, absolutely convenient. It should be absolutely convenient and digital. So uh, basically, today uh, uh, we have uh, no ability to move as much as uh, previous periods, and uh, this gives us opportunity to provide more digital services and uh, in digital banking system it should be. Uh, uh, all, all that I speak about right now is uh, based on now our principles, and we created a new banking platform. And uh, so this platform absolutely suits all this stuff, and it's absolutely uh, convenient for those these days. And uh, another thing is uh, how uh, in which way could we uh, develop the bank's uh, ideas, the bank's uh, business uh, using these services, digital services. Uh, for for its uh, needs, we see that uh, uh, the bank could, uh, grew up with uh, niche ideas, with uh, some new customers that uh, uh, recently not have such uh, services, uh, like students, like newcomers, or small businesses, and so on. So uh, basically, all this stuff could be provided by bank. And uh, another thing is. Uh, uh, Retaining users in one system, so uh, it could uh, be uh, expanding of uh, uh, products and uh, something else uh, for those users who uh, are already uh, in your in your portfolio, but uh, you'd like to uh, give them some more opportunities, some more interests, some more some more uh, services. Um, okay, then I, I think we can move on with the next question. It's mm -hmm. uh, uh, Basically, I'd like to uh, see this uh, not a, like a presentation, uh, but, and we try to start with, with this format. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, well, my next uh, question to you will be, so uh, as we uh, discussed and now you showed uh, in, the, in this short presentation, so yes, the personalization is crucial. And what I also we discussed even uh, uh, with the previous speakers and my question to you is, what is your predictions when the banks here in the region would be able to offer personalized services to their business customers at a scale. So as we all uh, know, so these are really a lot of benefits for the banks to have it. And there are technologies, uh, solutions on the market. So how fast banks can really implement this and how, what is your predictions? How really uh, business customers will explore and enjoy it from the banks? Yeah, 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 Jans. thank you for this question. Absolutely uh, see this point. And uh, 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 to my mind, uh, as, we, as we see the situation, uh, I mentioned that uh, those banks who was ready for this situation, more or less, they have some advantages in this moment. But uh, nevertheless, the rest of banks uh, who was a little bit uh, as I said, in traditional way, worked in traditional way, we have to hurry up in this moment. But, uh, my, my prediction is uh, in this uh, less than half a year, it must be dramatically changed all the services because uh, we see that um, uh, clients that uh, get more convenient service and more digital service, they, they 
to uh, new banks, to neo banks, to those banks provide this uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely, as I say, uh, the way to uh, basically to onboard to get a lo the loan or use uh, uh, payment instruments. So uh, it should be changed in very, very, very near future. And, uh, the question, uh, one more question that I would like to discuss, um, that's about uh, how we work and how we see our help to banks. Uh, our company basically starts uh, any of our project with consulting and uh, using the experience of our colleagues or experts, uh, we uh, see all those bottlenecks, all those uh, niches where one could uh, grow up, where one could uh, get more uh, effect or ideas from the market. So, uh, and uh, as, uh, as I discussed before, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, pay attention for this slide as we see that um, the most interesting thing is uh, the lighters that bank provide for it. And uh, there's a question about how bank sees this delighter and uh, does bank have uh, such uh, experience or expertise how to provide the delighter to, to customer. And uh, in this case, uh, basically our solutions and our experience could be helping one for, uh, for bank taking the decision in some cases and uh, uh, absolutely agree that uh, as fast as uh, you take a decision, you will be uh, on the market and you will be uh, successful in the market. Mm -hmm. We have here uh, a comment in the chat uh, mm -hmm. from Enrique that new banks are willing to take more risks related to the adaptation of the new technology. Uh, the new technologies, while the incumbent banks uh, are not. So, do you think this is one of the challenges why uh, banks are not uh, implementing so fast, for so fast new technologies? And what other challenges do you see here also for the banks? I agree absolutely. I agree absolutely with Enrique. Enrique, thank you for your questions. Uh, my opinion is absolutely. Uh, Align with this uh, bank. Uh, traditional banks. It's a problem for traditional banks to uh, to go with the new ideas, with new solutions, uh, uh, due to having a huge risk. Uh, and um, to be honest, we work with some companies that are uh, not really banks, but they will uh, want to, to to be a bank, and they have uh, more advantages because you know they um, don't have. Uh, such restricted rules, uh, such uh, compliant, and uh, they have more possibilities to be adopted with their uh, with the market, with the client's uh, demand, and uh, it gives them uh, a certain advantage. And uh, that's why it's uh, kind of difficult for traditional banks, for big banks, uh, to provide such uh, uh, adoptive service for more. For a customer, and uh, this is the idea. It's a business question, also. and uh, this, this question is uh, for create. Let's say it could be creating a new structure within the bank, or it could be a partnership with a fintech company, something else. Uh, or uh, as well as uh, we see that in the market, uh, there are a lot of changes inside of uh, rules for uh, banking services. Uh, some of companies became banks, some of uh, uh, banks, uh, they create new structures with a uh, uh, limited uh, uh, limitations and uh, they have an ability to uh, to reach uh, other customers and so on. So, yes, I agree, it's, uh, it's true, we have a, a huge risk to uh, start with these new technologies, but uh, align of the risk, we have a huge possibilities and uh, uh, to achieve a new, uh, new business and new customers. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And if we um, talk about partnerships, which is actually the way that banks uh, can market some solutions faster than built on their own, so how fast 
banks can uh, deliver the solutions for the SME or business customers uh, on the market from your experience and from the project that you have done? Yeah, absolutely a correct question. Uh, and uh, this question is uh, connected to um, the main idea we have such uh, terminology as uh, time to market, yes, and it's very, uh, very important uh, in this time. So uh, how fast it's, uh, it depends, absolutely depends on the number of uh, parameters and questions to be solved. Uh, from our experience, it's uh, not only technologies, even uh, technologies is the fastest thing that could be implemented uh, to, uh, to a bank a solution, to any solution. Uh, due to our we have uh, uh, we, we had uh, some projects, uh, let's say, with, uh, start, with startups, some kind of fintech startups, and these startups we started in three months, six months, it was the fastest way. Uh, but here we uh, didn't face with a huge number of, uh, let's say, documental work. Uh, paperwork. So, the uh, question was about only starting of, uh, uh, of the pro, and uh, we had the whole license of abilities to start it. And technically, technically, it was done in three months. It was really very fast. Uh, another thing that uh, I can uh, share with you with our experience uh, I have an experience of starting a new one. Uh, here, uh, as well, uh, technological stuff was uh, the simplest thing that uh, we implemented, and uh, uh, even even uh, even have uh, say one year of uh, development and integrations, and there were a lot of uh, external parties how to create a new one. Uh, it was easy, uh, really, uh, started from scratch, and uh, uh, this question is. Not, not so easy, but, uh, but very challenging. Uh, but uh, to be honest, another side of uh, mental and licenses and uh, attitudes to other parties, how to start with it, it was a more complex thing. So um, it depends. For coming back to a question, we have experience starting from three months and uh, <laughs> to be honest, never finished. So uh, the more problem is taking decision and stop thinking, and uh, uh, we need to try on the market. This is the main idea that we try to uh, discuss with our customers, uh, not to work, uh, go around with this one question. Somebody needs to uh, get responsibility for the decision and won't miss it. On this way, uh, you will achieve uh, your. Uh, you will you will face with issues. But uh, you will be in the market, and uh, it's a question of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what are what are the resources are needed from the bank side uh, in the case of, of uh, cooperation with you? Because this is always always a question of the resources, because uh, somehow they can be allocated to some other task. What we for example, have seen here uh, uh, last year uh, with the regulations connected with the PSD2, for example, uh, here in Europe, that a lot of bank uh, resources were allocated to the compliance uh, project, like not connected uh, for that period of time with the business itself, with the core business, but the resources were allocated. So, and, and new implementations are always at, at risk and at question if there are no available resources in the bank. So what are resources needed in your case from the bank side? Mm, okay, about resources, I see this question. But, you know, uh, absolutely depends on the uh, aim that we are looking for. Uh, basically, uh, Resources, it's uh, people, money, and time. Yes. That's, that's, that's it. But uh, how much do we need? It's, it depends on the on the question. What do we uh, what would we like to achieve in which period? And uh, uh, are we compete with somebody uh, or something like a new challenge? This is a question. And it's only uh, regarding to these answers, we, uh, we can uh, say it is resources. Mm -hmm. So, um, to my mind, it's uh, basically people because all the other stuff 
uh, could be achieved. If you have a proper people, if you have a partnership, uh, it will help, help you to be on the market in time, it will help you to uh, spend not so much money for this uh, project and uh, it will keep your result uh, as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have uh, one minute uh, for the end. Would you like to say uh, a closure, some closing uh, um, remarks from your side to our attendees? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we discussed a lot about this and uh, some closing words. Uh, they are um, thank you for, for your attention, thank you for your time. Uh, I, I'm sure it's wasting time uh, using these uh, discussions and uh, or getting some experience from the market, from other sides, from other partners. It's very important for us and uh, very important for any of uh, participants and audience. Uh, so uh, basically, one more, uh, once more, I'd like to mention uh, system technologies. Our company is uh, already on this market and have a long period of our expertise, and uh, we're ready to share with you. And, uh, basically, not only solutions, uh, with consulting, with experience, with uh, uh, nowadays ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. And uh, we are, we'll be back in a minute for a next session. Thank you very much. Thank you. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are.
Welcome back. And let me announce now the next panel, uh, which will be devoted to the SME finance topic. And let me invite the moderator of the panel, Michal Pavlik, CEO at Polish FinTech, Factoring FinTech, SMEL, and also head of technology team at Polish Factors Association. Michal, hello and welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, hello. everybody. It's really nice to see you online. Unfortunately, online, as uh, all, of of, all of us like now to be with people on a meetings as previously as last year, but it's more difficult nowadays. But let's start our online panel and let's welcome uh, first, first presenter of and first our guest, uh, Daniel Huschar who will present uh, his uh, uh, presentation for the first 15 minutes. Uh, Daniel represents the company EFCOM. Daniel, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michal. And uh, um, thank you, Elena, for, for having me. It's an, it's an honor. And um, yeah, very much looking forward to this panel. Uh, I will just, uh, let's say, uh, set the mood uh, for this panel and and uh, touch upon some topics um, that are close to my heart in, in these times. And uh, let me just preface this um, that uh, I think uh, we heard a lot of predictions even be before COVID, um, which turned out to be wrong. And, and, and uh, I mean, concrete predictions, how the situation will develop is are very hard, uh, are incredibly hard. Uh, what we can do, however, is look at certain trends uh, in digitization, general trends that have been there before um, and uh, how the landscape developed. And uh, by this, we can think of scenarios. And, and I think we will have a fascinating panel uh, also about that, uh, where we have, we, um, we have also very good questions to talk about, to talk about risk, for example. And uh, we can, what we can do, what we are able to do is to extrapolate uh, from, from these trends and from these scenarios and, um, well, and still prepare and still be prepared for, for um, a lot of these scenarios unfolding. But um, to do that, uh, what I feel is that we need to go to um, the the let's say the the essential implications of this crisis and um let me ah and it works perfect uh and this is well while this is of course very tongue-in-cheek you know the what is what is the driver of this transformation the ceo the cto or COVID 19 that was a meme posted on 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 twitter uh some some months ago there's a lot of truth uh to this to this tweet uh, i i think and uh, because uh, what it means besides the 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 humor in it is is that this is a force change uh, we did not decide to do this not no one wanted to do all of this but it's kind of a forced uh, and and fast track digitization that that some were prepared better to, to perform than others. Um, but we, I think we all adapted. I mean, look at, look at how this conference is, is organized, for example, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing that, that we can do that. And some of these digital roads, they, they have been there already. And some of these technologies have been there already. There were, they just weren't used as much because they, they didn't have to, we had other channels and now we are forced to communicate and to sell to our clients uh, through the digital road, uh, so, so, so to speak. Um, and if we look, you know, these are the technologies that I also like to, to talk about, like uh, blockchain. And, and I will talk briefly about artificial intelligence and, and these kind of things. Um, uh, just a just a second, um, briefly about AI. Um, but uh, I I just hope you can see the the slide with the cloud now because uh, with the with the word cloud now. But because I, I don't see it. Um, so 
this is uh, um, the, the caveat that I want to, to bring up with, with all these uh, technologies like complex and intellectual, intellectually challenging um, technologies is that, of course, they are full of promise, but some of them are not fully fleshed out. Uh, and some of them are not that useful in a crisis like this, exciting and full of promise, because um, we are basically, we are back to basics. We had to figure out how to, you know, how to work within a home office environment, for example. We had to figure out, um, you know, sometimes I had problems with my bandwidth. Uh, I just moved. Uh, so so uh, it's, it's a horrible, you know, I, I can't think about blockchain. I need fast, fast internet. Yeah, and um, to to basically um, to to drive this point home, some of this really feels like this. You know, mid '90s, we're in a desktop environment. We are exploring the internet, or early, or let let it be early 2000s. You know, beeping modem sounds and and, and stuff like this. But uh, the the thing that we want is is to be ready for a mobile in, environment. We want to be, uh, you know, uh, these are the roads that are being paved now, and we are lucky that we have them. Imagine that this crisis came to be much, much earlier, like like in the mid '90s, and and without um, um, this strong internet connectivity, that we 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 really couldn't do much. There wouldn't be uh, digital roads, and um, this environment has. Um, very strong implications because it means that we have over 3.5 billion mobile devices in the world of 2020 it's which is which is in, insanely high and not because a smaller screen is now always the better solution you know some things are much better left specialized soft softwares like our very own uh, um, specialized factoring software is in, in, in a lot of cases, better suited for a desktop environment. But this is the environment that we are facing, uh, that we have a mobile internet, a very small screen, that we have a very impatient uh, new customers, the millennials and, 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 and Generation Z after them. And so we need to be pre prepared for that. And, um, and it is, yeah, and now it is the only way to, to kind of uh, uh, communicate during to, with our customers during lockdown. And what I will do, I will establish two main points, uh, main paths and a mindset um, to kind of, let's say, attack all the different scenarios and how they will play out uh, and, and no matter what the next big thing in technology will be. Uh, what we kind of need to be prepare for and what probably every technology technolo technology strategy ha will have to be measured against and uh, what i would urge us all to do is to have a certain level of pragmatism um with with that and um not look at I mean, innovation is still important. I, I will not, you know, you know and, and, and it excites me still very, very much, all these, the, 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 uh, the future technologies. But uh, we need to look at what we have right now and the challenges that we ha have right now and, and kind of improve um, from there. Um, we, we have to deal with a huge paradox that we, we, we kind of want um these big platforms and um to interact with our customers more and more and onboard more customers and scale our business but um we we have this challenge that that um people want a great experience and now we don't have these analog experiences anymore or or maybe even you know much less in the future when, when the lockdowns are lifted but it needs to be an individual experience. So we kind of have this, uh, you know, like um, almost like talking to a human. And um, that's a big, it's a big challenge. And we want to onboard all these clients who want an individual experience and we don't want to expose ourselves to much bigger risk while, while doing this. And this is the, so pragmatic, so we need a pragmatic mindset in my opinion to do this. And uh, and two other measures. Um, 
this is I stole this from from Steve Jobs. But basically, this is what his one of his big mantras was that that he said, you know, I don't care what technology you use, you need to work backwards from the user experience and, and look at the environment that we are in a mobile environment and basically make the best customer journey that that you possibly that you possibly can and and what you heard in in, in the in the in the last years over and over that that uh, mobile first we need to develop for mobile first but what does it mean it means hire the best design team that you can that's what it means because uh, from a big screen in a desktop environment we go to a much smaller screen on a tablet and to an even smaller screen on a phone and that's what the clients expect these are the roads that are paved 3.5 billion devices uh, on, on the planet and um, compared I mean look how horrible Windows looked back then right when we look at it now it's it's just it's, it's just horrible Windows 95 or something like that which was revolutionary at that time right um, because now one millimeter of a button uh, to, to change the direction uh, can make all the difference of a user just closing your app or and never use it again or, or if he has to wait one second to long. Um, so this would be my first advice, really. Mobile first, hire the best designers that you can. And, and that's what we did. We, we did a major overhaul uh, with, with our platform from summer till now. I think it looked good before. Now it's it's really good. I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy with it. Um, it will be absolutely necessary for, for this environment to, to, to for this digital channel. Um, and the other main point I want to make is the flexibility. Um, because the thing is, we don't know which scenarios will unfold. Uh, um, we can make, like I, like I said, we can make some educated guesses and some assumptions. And um, your platform, and, and especially the, the back end, where you set all the rules, for example, for, for we have a factory platform. And, and if you want to implement a new product with certain fees or interest rates and, and these kind of things and, and certain automation connected to that so you don't have to do anything manu everything manually, um, you need to be able to define that uh, without a lot of development or you're not flexible enough. If you need to go to uh, your software company and, 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 and wait a couple of weeks, a couple of months for every change, that's not going to cut it. So, so if you're thinking about new IT systems, go through maximum flexibility there uh, just to be able to change uh, things on a whim if necessary. And um, one thing is, well, uh, one challenge that I, that I, this is my, my closing argument, um, um, one of the main challenges that I that I uh, lined out is, is that we need to be able to handle many clients and uh, give them a great user experience. And, and so we need to be able to cluster them in our solution. So we need to, some of them, they can be more automated. Maybe they don't pose as much of a risk, uh, for, for example. So we don't have to look at everything manually. Some of them, we, we might define a workflow that's a little bit more manual than for example, if they are a new client, um, and another and another important point is to handle to be able to handle all that volume and that individualization is, for example, that you outsource work to your client uh, in a way. That means if we do an OCR readout, optical character recognition of an invoice that is uploaded on a factoring platform, let them, for example, uh, get the readout and let them correct it if there is a certain basis that it's that it's wrong or um, let let an ai pattern recognition software in the back end look at the invoice and see if it's a it's a fr possibly fraudulent invoice look at the patterns of behavior uh, of, of your client and and if you have some doubts uh, you can you can upload a, a request um, that 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 you need further documentation of the invoice to make it harder to to defraud you to be able to to through technology and through automation to concentrate on the most uh, uh, 
let's say, risky and life-saving tasks uh, that you that you have in any given time. And I want to close with a quote of Charles Darwin, which is probably, if, if, if it's one thing that you take with this, uh, think about flexibility, that it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the most, one most responsive to change. And, and I think this is especially true in these times. Um, thank you. Daniel, and uh, let me um, invite the next speakers here at this stage. Uh, Jamie Burink, uh, Head of Business Lending at Topicus, and uh, Carlo van der Weck, Credion. Hello and welcome to the stage. Hello there. Please turn on your microphones, we cannot hear you. We still cannot hear you. Hello? Can you yes. hear me? Yes, now, yes. Jamie? We cannot hear Jamie. So while we are waiting for Jamie to to connect with us, so let me also invite you to ask the questions to our speakers, because after the four presentations we will have a discussion panel. So please type your questions into the chat. Uh, so do we have Jamie already with us? Okay, so waiting for the for the speakers to connect, and also let me uh, remind you that does we it have. Work? Yes, yes, Jamie, it does. Can you guys hear me? Great, great. Great. Okay, so welcome on the stage. Yeah, thank you very much, Elena, for the for the patience. Um, yeah, can we uh, provide the pr uh, presentation? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, um, platform banking meets open banking. I think that until now, these are subjects that still a lot about talking and less about doing. And what Carlo and I would like to do today is take you away in our motives to create a true digital lending platform, <clears throat> sorry, and uh, a working uh, network of independent debt advisors. Uh, aiming to support businesses uh, in growing. Sorry. In addition, we will show you how we've helped banks to join the pace of the modern fintech times. But let us introduce ourselves first. I am Jamie, and I'm heading the department at Topicus that builds a digital ecosystem for the business lending market. At Topicus, it is our mission to create tech, uh, that, that connects people, platforms, and data to make education, healthcare, social services, and finance more relevant every day. I think uh, always, or uh, almost uh, 21 uh, years ago, and Credion is in the Netherlands. Um, um, uh, we have authority in the field of corporate finance to SME companies. Uh, we insist uh, assisting clients during financing period. And uh, we have uh, probably be one biggest goal, and that is that the SME company is well funded and that the funders and banks are well informed during all the financing periods. So that's what we do. We have 52 branches in the Netherlands, more than 120 advisors. We uh, advise uh, on yearly basis 1.5 billion euros. Okay, Jamie. Thank you, Carlo. Then back to our story, starting somewhere around the credit crisis. And I think a lot has happened since then. 
For example, to avoid getting into such a crisis situation again, banks had to be much more careful with lending money. Regulators started with strict enforcement by starting banks to ask for evidence to, to ensure that banks are really doing so. Through more strict capital requirements, there was pressure on the margin, and it's, well, I think slowly diluting the advantage of scale, especially for the major banks. Yeah, and through, uh, uh, through more uh, strict acceptance policies, we um, uh, discovered that a lot of our advisors uh, yeah, didn't do uh, well business with uh, normal and, and traditional banks in the Netherlands. And they have to reject a lot of uh, our uh, requests. So um, uh, that was very um, um, uh, bad for our clients. And it was also a situation that we thought there is um, a gap in the market. And it created a, a new room um, uh, for new entrants. So that was the start about 10 years ago for uh, an, a new situation in the lending market in the Netherlands for alternative non-banking and non-balance sheet lenders. What did we see? Um, uh, the new entrants are considered being banking challengers. So um, uh, we saw uh, new models, uh, new serving concepts and um, um, since they were not bothered with all legacy, we've enabled them to go fully digital. So we saw new entrants of uh, new parties with full uh, uh, digital um, uh, lending platforms, uh, highly technology driven with focus on excellent customer experience. So it was very new in the Netherlands and um, it was also very small. But um, uh, we started as an uh, SME uh, advisory organization to use uh, these platforms. Now, in addition to uh, shaping the propositions um, uh, around guarding lines of regulatory, regulatory bodies, the alternative finance are able to go much faster with, um, with less um, uh, supervisory pressure. So the central bank in the Netherlands has no um, uh, direct contact with the alternative lenders. So they have much more freedom and no legacy uh, to enter into the market. And um, uh, yeah, uh, through those um, uh, uh, new entrants, customer experiences are set to a very new level in the Netherlands. Present buyers in that they accept a buy for a loan with very little hassle. Experience excellent services and near real-time decision making. So it's only um, uh, uh, the benefit of much faster um, uh, and, and um, uh, much more uh, able and accessibility for um, SMEs in uh, Netherlands to get funded. Thank you, Carlo. Yeah. So all of this made us realizing that we were facing two major challenges. And first of it, um, the need for platform banking. As meanwhile, in a story that, that Carlo uh, explained about, uh, the supply side of lending has exploded. I think the number of lenders has increased more than tenfold. Please go ahead, Carlo. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, what we uh, see in the Netherlands, uh, what I told you, um, uh, we advise uh, for 1.5 billion on yearly basis. And what we see nowadays is um, uh, that there are uh, more than 100 alternative uh, lenders in factoring and lease possibilities in crowdfunding, etc. And, and they started with one or two percent of these market um, uh, in our ways. And nowadays we uh, do more than 25 percent with alternative lenders. So the big banks are um, um, uh, losing the market. Um, they are also um, uh, want to lose that market because for them um, uh, it's not profitable in, in this way to do uh, business anymore for small tickets. Um, so we see um, uh, the last five to eight years, um, um, uh, the alternative market uh, raises 25% and more in um, uh, SME uh, financing in the Netherlands. But then we have a new problem. There are, uh, what I told you, more than 100 parties in the Netherlands. So for the, um, uh, the SME entrepreneur, it's very hard to find the right mix of funding options 
the right mix of possibilities and um, uh, he has a lack of knowledge um, uh, so he needs help and he needs help from an advisor but he also needs help from tech and um, that's one of the biggest goals we uh, talked with our suppliers um, uh, topicus about how can we connect all the different new lenders together with the knowledge of our advisor and bring it to the local entrepreneurs the sme clients in the netherlands <clears throat> Uh, so what I told you, even for our advisors who are specialized in um, SME funding, um, uh, it's it's uh, uh, yeah it's a hassle to know all the different parties, all the different um, uh, possibilities, and how uh, you can mix the best uh, funding solutions for every client. So that um, uh, was the problem we uh, discussed with Tobacus and uh, looked uh, the last year, a uh, few years, how we can solve this. And Jamie will tell you more about that. Yeah, yeah. To uh, to cope with the challenges that that Carla just indicated, we uh, have created Finu Advice. Finu Advice is operated by independent debt advisors like co-workers from Carlo in the Cadion family, and they can use Finu Advice, uh, our cloud platform, subscription based. Finu Advice includes the policies of lenders and. That means that both the debt advisor as well as the banker won't spend time on deals with a little chance on success. Uh, Finu Advice is currently live in the Netherlands with more than 20 lenders offering one or many products each. And after its soft launch in 2019, we have brokered more than 100 million euros in 2020 year to date. So as um, I already explained, Finu Advice matches lenders with companies uh, searching for a loan via debt advisors and it integrates with lending systems that bank use for example for loan origination yeah there's the next slide the second challenge that we identified was that banks uh, and where i'm referring to uh, especially especially traditional banks of course needed and yet still need to change drastically to survive the fintech battle that's uh, at least my opinion and to deal with pressure on yields and increasing regulatory obligations they need to um, first shorten time to yes secondly create more streamlined origination processes uh, define a clean structured lending product portfolio and after having this done, they can go digital because I think that's one of the uh, well main goals that that uh, especially traditional banks need to uh, need to achieve. In addition, I think initially initially there was not much fear for the banking challengers, which Carla also explained about. There was laughing about their deal flow, and they had the image to work with, as we always call it, tape and glue technology built by a nephew in the attic room. But I think by now, we all know better. Uh, alternative becomes less alternative. It is no longer a second best option, but has become a mainstream option because uh, I think of the convenience that uh, alternative uh, uh, lenders have built into their services. So this means that the market has emerged where traditional banks started to miss opportunities really. And we believe that they must go open banking to stay connected with this new digital reality. With Finu Lending, our cloud lending platform, we have enabled our banking clients to enter this journey. Finu Lending. Finu Lending has a strong focus on open banking by means of APIs. It supports both uh, highly automated decisioning, but it allows for expert opinions of, as well. We have a strong track record in creating a healthy and competitive operational position. Our clients get good customer reviews. Uh, even for rejected clients, they get a net promoter score of seven. And I think that's driven by quick feedback and a structured explanation about the rejection. Um, with the proper mindset, courage and guts, we are able to shorten the time to yes and time to yes, time to cash, I'm sorry, to somewhere around 70 up to 90%. And lastly, using the open APIs, 
Finlanding integrates with, uh, for example, Finland with Vice, but also other third-party platforms or digital channels. Well, let's have a look how all this works in a demo that we have recorded. We are excited to share here that earlier this week, our partner, the Volksbank, has gone live with their offering in Findu Advice. The Volksbank, our, our partner, also uses Findu Lending for their lending operation. So what we are going to show you is an end-to-end -end credit request for their business credit product. And that should go start right now. In the next couple of minutes, I will show you how easy I can apply for a loan at one or multiple lenders with Findu Advice. As a debt advisor, I can select a client for which a file has been created by my firm or department. On my dashboard, I see what I've last worked on for this client, some additional information and what actions I can do. I start with a credit request. Here we see the marketplace platform where various lenders offer their credit products. It is much like Uber, but then for business loans. For each product, the number of steps and required document I need to upload are indicated. During the request, Findu Advice continuously checks which products my client is eligible for based on the lender's acceptance criteria. I continue with an SNS business loan and enter some basic information about my request. Yeah. Data of my client is pre-filled. Enter my contact details so that lenders can contact me in case of any questions. Next one is the legal structure to make sure that the lender knows whom he's going to do business with. I'm also able to define the relations between the entities for both legal entities and private individuals. One of the private individuals can be designated as the signatory. If only one private individual has been defined in the legal structure, it'll be automatically selected. I now have to provide some additional details about the loan, such as a start date and optionally a substantiation about the purpose. Lenders usually want me to get qualitative information about companies as part of their acceptance policies or risk model drivers. Most lenders ask for financial statements of the last two years, and these will be sent along with my request. I'm almost done. I only have to upload the documents required for this product. Finally, I can check whether I'm complete and optionally add some additional explanation. On final check of the product, yes, this should do the job. I can also download the credit request to share with my client. By the way, this report sends along my credit request to the lender as well. For the lender, it is important that I'm really acting as the intermediary of my client, so I submit that I am, and I have permission to share his data and documents. Done. As a banker, I can easily overview the lending processes I can work on, indicating the status they are currently in. Let's open a request that's just been submitted by the debt advisor. On the landing page, the legal structure and credit rates are shown exactly as how the debt advisor has entered it into Findu Advice. This is because we have embraced open banking. Through the smart APIs of the cloud Findu lending platform, I'm able to get credit applications from all kinds of different channels like Findu Advice. I can switch between legal entities of private individuals, while on the right hand, more detailed information about these entities is shown. Also, I see the contact details of the debt advisor, which is convenient in case I have any questions. I quickly review the product that's been selected in Findu Advice. I don't even need to structure it, since this work all has been done by the debt advisor. Luckily, they use a platform that knows all about our policies and offerings, so I don't have to spend time on applications that would end up being rejected somewhere down the line. Findu Lending indicates that I have to check completeness of this request. Frankly, completeness is already ensured by our APIs, so what I'll be doing is just checking the documents themselves. I quickly review the financial statements. 
can do lending is even able to get structured data out of unstructured financial statements using OCR technology. The financial statements that the Debt Advisor has sent along his credit request have been created with Findu Advice, one clear fact sheet with all the relevant information. I see that this potential client has an excellent debt service coverage ratio. That seems promising. I'll approve this document. Of course, Findu Lending keeps track of all specific approvals and by whom these are given. I'll bring this request to the next step by initiating a state transition. Check correctness. The status history keeps track of the progress and whether a state transition has been initiated manually or by the system based on business rules. Now a credit letter is generated, completely automatic. But what happens in the background? Several checks at the credit bureau have been done, for example, registered credit and fraud using Findus Counterparty Audit API. Also, the financial statements that have been sent by the debt advisor are imported, enriched and automatically analyzed. Since a private individual is included, Findu Lending calculates the private income. All seems fine, let's continue to credit rating. The information received from the debt advisor is enriched by Findu Lending. A rating has been calculated by the system and we can see the risk drivers as well. Now we quickly review the acceptance rules that Findu Lending has executed, also automatically. This request has been approved. It is green. By checking the Show Acceptance Rules, I get an overview of all the rules that are part of our acceptance policies, like on financials, rating, credit bureau, age and private income. This saves me a lot of time and having the outcome stored in a structured way means that we can substantiate why we have approved or rejected the loan to our clients and regulators. I'm all good, ready to review the loan offer that has been generated in the background. The offer has been prepared for me in the documents section. After one last check, I initiate the state transition to present my offer to my almost client. He will get an email announcing that this offer is ready and can be signed digitally within our online portal. Yeah, so that's uh, basically what we would like to show you today. And if you would be interested about how this could work for you, we would be happy to discuss our insights and recommendations for you. And uh, as for me, thank you very much. As we are a little bit over the time, I'd like to just shortly introduce the next presentation, which will be held by Betul Kurtulus. Betul, welcome you on stage. Hi. I hope you can see me. Okay, so yes. I can. Okay, you can see me, you can hear me. Okay. Well, thank you for for inviting me. It was also always very really interesting to listen all these digital solutions uh, from from the colleague in the in the market, Daniel. It's always listen uh, the interesting to listen the ideas, the digital evaluation of the uh, of our trade finance market. Uh, my name is Betül Kurtuluş. I am the regional director of FCI responsible for Central Eastern Europe, South Eastern Europe and the Middle East. Today I will speak about how factoring is important to SMEs to access to finance. Um, let me, okay. Sorry, it is okay. It works. Uh, many of you already know about FCI. I know that, but I want to give a uh, um, short overview about FCI and our membership briefly. Here you see the distribution of our uh, membership. We have almost 400 members in 92 countries. The, the blue dots.
So you see here and the full members, which means they are actively trading in MCI. Uh, representing here, you can see the 60% uh, of the membership. Uh, this uh, data shows the global factoring volume uh, for the last 20 years uh, and the compound annual growth rate. Uh, the global factoring volume reaches 2.9 billion euro for the last year and the compound growth rate has been 9% uh, for the last 20 years. Uh, you will see here the statistics for the uh, Central Eastern Europe here it is and the South Eastern Europe and the Middle East. Uh, Central Eastern Europe and the South Eastern Europe uh, region together almost cover 30% of the FCI membership. Uh, CE itself is the most successful region in the world in terms of the growth rate. Poland and Russia in this region are two biggest markets. Poland differentiates positively with the annual growth rate and the total transaction volume. It's very weak and successful market. Uh, there are also very successful countries in CE. Maybe you can see here that the growth rate is for the last five years and for last year is, is minus. It is because of the effect of the Turkey, because Turkey is a, is a very big, far big market for the, for the other regions. Uh, the factoring says sector has been shrinking for uh, the last three consecutive years, so it affects the whole to to total region's uh, growth rate, unfortunately. And this slide is the Euro statistics. Since uh, 11 years of growth, uh, we see in the in the Euro region until the COVID-19 uh, effects. Uh, I hope this, these slides are visible vi visible for you because even I cannot see. Um, so the EU statistics shows that 11 years growth until the pandemic, the European market represents two-thirds of the world factoring market and it is almost 11.3% <clears throat> of the uh, EU GDP. Uh, you see here on the left-hand side uh, the factoring growth comparison with the GDP growth. Here is the GDP growth rate. It is almost in between uh, 1 to 2 percent. Uh, but here is the factoring growth. It is uh, for the last seven years, it is over 8 percent. Here it is. Uh, so it is very, very uh, satisfactory growth rate. Uh, phenomenon increase in the biggest markets. So you see here the biggest markets, Germany, France, Italy, very developed markets and very uh, the increase in these developed markets is also very, very good. And here is, you see the effects of the uh, pandemic, but it is, of course, it is very obvious that there is a decrease on, on the total turnovers. Here you see the, some statistics of the, of the turnover for the, uh, for the first half, but it is the second and almost the third half is almost, almost the same, uh, increasingly decrease uh, the growth rate. Here is the, the result from FCI at the factoring, minus 25%. This is from uh, EU, it is 6%. It is, this is for asset base lensing, 25%, and the SWIFT, 15%. So I'm coming to the, to the who is using factoring. Uh, here you see uh, of course, all segments of clients, they're using factoring, but when you look at the number of the clients, the highest number here, uh, you see a big difference in the number of clients, uh, they are the SMEs. Uh, uh, comparing with the other segments, there's a huge difference in the SME market that they are using uh, factoring. So this is the very interesting slide. It is the um, uh, uh, data for uh, from <clears throat> EU. 75% uh, uh, is coming from the small size markets and uh, 14 from the mid size, so almost 90% you see here market represents on SMEs. This is this is almost the whole market. And uh, you see on the right hand side that um, uh, the uh, weighted average cost of risk of factoring, it is 0.09 percent, and the same ratio for the banking is 0.55 uh, percent. So 
nearly, when you are comparing with the banking in the, in the SME segment, nearly five times risky than factoring. So coming into the SMEs, the backbone of the world economies, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises play, it's, it's obvious that plays a crucial role in, in the economic development. They account for 90% uh, of the business, more than 50% of employment, and up to 40% contribution to GDP in the emerging economies. Moreover, a healthy SME sector is important to increase the resilience of the economy to shocks like the economic shock, like the pandemic. Uh, but uh, the SMEs have different types of financial problems to deal with, difficult to access the bank credits, uh, higher interest rate with short term maturity, insuff insufficient access to capital market instruments uh, or no, no access to capital market instruments. Uh, insufficient equi equity capital, lack of professional financial management, competition from larger companies. So there are lots of difficulties in, in SME's life uh, on a day-to-day. -day. Uh, so the uh, uh, financial situation of SME, uh, when we look at the SMEs, uh, they are reported that they, they losing, they're losing liquidity and they are li losing their uh, uh, cash flow during the pandemic. Of course, the uh, support measures has been taken by uh, all the governments uh, during the pandemic, almost all the governments uh, that um, uh, like postponement of the uh, tax payments, guarantees for loans. Uh, these, these measures are actually measures taken to postpone the problem uh, rather than the solder problem, uh, and it will soon lead the uh, solvency problem. So many of the SMEs. So it is not the the, the, the SMEs problems are not uh, being solved with many of the governments already postponed. So which means that the uh, so some of the support measures taken by the especially for the eurozone uh, maybe. Uh, uh, easy for SMEs to reach the, and uh, solve their problems, but technically for, they are not enough to solve their uh, other problems, the day-to-day -day problems, to, which is uh, uh, reaching the uh, uh, cash flow and day-to-day -day finance. So uh, factoring can be a, one of the best solutions for, for SMEs to reach the uh, finance because it, is, it provides uh, very fast solutions, as we hear uh, from the from the digital uh, software solutions on the day-to-day -day life of the uh, um, SMEs, they are reaching and solving the problems. Uh, for me, the um, the most important benefit of factoring the funding uh, depends on the receivable itself. So the level of funding is directly related with the uh, level of sales when the uh, when the uh, SMEs are increasing their uh, receivables the funding also in the uh, same level increase so it is they do not need any other collateral uh, or they do not need their they have a strong balance sheet to reach the finance and credit evaluation uh, over only receivables enables much faster financing than, the, than other loan types, especially for the uh, uh, for the development of the digitalization, we see that kind of solutions in the market, especially in for the SMEs. This transaction can be financed within a few hours uh, with the digital solutions. Uh, we see very different solutions in different uh, digital solutions in different markets. The scorecards uh, created according to the market needs uh, we see the machine learning or artificial intelligence solutions improving to solve the needs of the SMEs in, in factoring industry. Um, uh, especially factoring companies, they only, some of the factoring companies, they are only uh, mm, financing the SMEs and MSMEs. They are offering a very, very fast solutions in the market 
uh, in many markets. Uh, we can see that kind of solutions in different parts of the uh, world. Uh, of course, there are some other benefits of the factoring, like uh, outsourcing the uh, sales activity, uh, uh, accounting activities, and uh, differentiating the sales and the collection efforts. Uh, and then the SMEs can concentrate on their own works. Uh, but these are, of course, not the today's uh, difficulties of the SMEs that we can see that the, uh, the banks are much more reluctant to give the SMEs because of their uh, vulnerability against these uh, COVID-19 effects. Uh, so we are not much concentrated on the funding side and the uh, continuity of this funding. So it's as the factoring depending only on the receivables, uh, it is very sustainable uh, funding uh, and it is very continuous funding uh, as, uh, as far as the receivables uh, increase, they can create a receivable. And also security for against the bad debt, this is also the guarantee service is also very important for factoring, especially for the SMEs doing international business. Uh, factoring perception uh, uh, for in the market, this is also very important. So it is of, uh, for sure that there are there are some areas needs to be uh, improved in the factoring per perception. In some markets, uh, still there is a misunderstanding of factoring uh, mm -hmm. in the pricing side of the factoring. Uh, it should be explained to the uh, SMEs very briefly. Uh, and also uh, from the regulatory side, there is, there is also some misunderstanding. So it is the perception is also we need to work on uh, on the first perception of the factoring. Uh, so innovation and digitalization, as I mentioned, I uh, I am responsible in FCI. I am responsible more than 30 countries uh, in different countries in different regions. I am seeing a very uh, uh, different digital solutions uh, for the paperless environment, for creating a scorecard for the uh, SMEs, uh, for the artificial intelligence solutions. These are very, very important solutions that helps the needs of the SMEs to reaching the finance. Uh, but there is one uh, missing point on all of these solutions. This is the role of the uh, policy and regulations. Uh, this is also very crucial because as far as we are we are digitalized by ORSA, by the companies, the digital solutions from the IT and software companies, uh, uh, the uh, regulations and the uh, policy recommendations is also, also very important uh, to be updated uh, for these digital solutions. But as we can see that this is no longer an achievement. Uh, in, it's, it's, it's a requirement for, for both SMEs and for all the, both the corporates. It is not a question of whether policymakers will be able to adapt itself, but it is a question of how soon they will adapt to changing the dynamics like the paperless environment, uh, digital uh, type of uh, shipping documentation, bill of lading kind of documentation, it is also uh, very important. Uh, so um, what does the international factoring bring to SMEs? Of course, in international factoring, uh, the most important uh, benefit to SMEs is to uh, credit insurance that we are securing the receivables uh, in between the members and uh, collection efforts it is also very difficult in the in the pandemic day to reach the clients and collect and communicate uh, for the uh, uncollected debts to solving the problems in between the seller and the uh, buyer and also the funding uh, so it is of course very beneficial uh, what it's uh, provide to the smes uh, they are reducing the risk in the uh, foreign markets, uh, so it provides liquidity and cash flow, risk management, and uh, better competitive advantages for uh, for all uh, the SMEs. So here is the um, comparison to other forms of trade fund. And I just want to mention here uh, that the the markets is. Uh, the trade finance market goes more and more on an open account solutions. Here, maybe you cannot see, but I can uh, explain uh, here the LC. It is the uh, 
uh, increase uh, the turnover uh, that turnover increase uh, for the last uh, 11 years so the, we see that on the LC side uh, the, the turnover is decreasing in the last uh, two years uh, there is a, a minus increase uh, in the LC so the markets are going more and more open account and on the open account solution factoring is a solution for SMEs with no alternative Uh, this is end of my presentation. Uh, if you have any question, just you can write from the chat area or maybe from the boots boat. Uh, I will be happy to answer. Thank you, Betul. And do we have Michal? Do we have Michal here in the panel? Okay, so let me invite the, and announce the next uh, actually video that we will have because our next speaker, Dipesh Patel, uh, Partnership and Marketing Director at Trend Finance Global, unfortunately will not be able to connect with us uh, right now, but he recorded a video for us. So please, Dipesh Patel, happy to have you at least on the video today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to the attendees of the 2020 SME Banking Club CEE Conference. My name is Dipesh Patel, editor at Trade Finance Global and host of the podcast Trade Finance Talks. We're really proud partners of the SME Banking Club and are delighted to be media partners of the CEE SME Banking Club Conference 2020. I'd personally really like to thank Alina and her colleagues for their hard work and immense support in making this excellent and very important conference happen. As my fantastic colleagues Daniel, Jamie and Betel have alluded to in today's presentations during this SME finance panel, I'm hoping in this short presentation to bring together some of the opportunities we have as an industry that is bringing together technologists and technology with the finance community in an unforeseen, unprecedented pandemic to bring a world of good to SME access to finance who have probably been one of the largest losers out of the pandemic. It's an overused statistic, but not without reason. The Asian Development Bank, ADB, and ICC puts the trade finance gap alone of upwards of 1.5 trillion, and early indication and forecasts see this as rising to over 2.5 trillion by the end of next year. And beyond merely trade finance, the IFC estimates that the entire MSME finance gap lies closer to 5 trillion US dollars. But this gap isn't due to the lack of funds. It's not a, it's not a liquidity problem. We've got ample liquidity in the market. MSMEs, particularly those in developing nations, struggle to obtain financing. And it's largely due to their greater risk profile, increased complexities for international investing, and a lack of information transparency and the fact that MSMEs often lack the formal documentation required for financing. Today, I'm talking about the current trade finance landscape when it comes to digital distributed ledger technologies and blockchain. I'll be covering the current playing field, and, and that includes 44 initiatives in trade, supply chain finance, credit insurance, receivables, all attempting to digitalize various elements of trade and SME access to finance, as well as some of the 19 standardization projects allowing for interoperability, which is something that's been discussed throughout the course of today's conference. We'll then take a bit of a stock check, looking at where the industry is in terms of maturity and also the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic when it comes to acceleration of digitalization in trade. And finally, we'll be looking at what next. It's crazy to think that just 10 years ago, 
DLT was little more than just an idea. And I think over the past five or so years, it's really revealed its hand, demonstrating the potential power it brings to very fragmented, antiquated industries such as trade finance. And I'm delighted to present to you our new publication, which we just launched at the start of this month, which I co-authored with Emmanuel Gann at the World Trade Organization, updating a 12-month-long study which we launched last year in Geneva with the ICC, TFG and the WTO. And no doubt the world looks quite a lot different today than it did at the end of 2019 when we first published our periodic table of DLT and trade. Now, COVID-19 has really shaken the world, threatening the lives and livelihoods of millions of people in developed and developing economies, particularly having a devastating impact on, on small businesses. But it's also accelerated digitalization efforts in all sectors, including international trade, which, as we know, remains plagued by labor and paper intensive processes that are, of course, a source of many frictions and, and inefficiencies. So where do we currently stand when it comes to DLT projects in, in trade? And, and this is what we're really looking at in, in this publication. Now, a year is an eternity in the world of technological development. Uh, and we felt it was important to see how the landscape has evolved since we published our periodic table a year ago. So I'm just going to flick on to the first slide, which is the, the 2019 periodic table. And, and from the outset, it was never designed to be static. Um, um, it, was, it was very much uh, supposed to simultaneously represent projects with striking similarities and also distinct dis distinct differences and if you look at the original periodic table hydrogen may be similar to helium in terms of mass but the two remain radically different when it comes to reactivity per the original periodic table and in our period table we, we we try to draw similar comparisons and contradictions between a lot of the projects and just because two projects might be positioned closely to one another it doesn't necessarily mean that these projects can be considered similar across every single dimension and another reason for selecting this design is to is 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 pre presupposed intention to grow uh, and morph over time and the first periodic table of elements developed in in the 1860s was purposely made with with blank spaces intended one day to fill with elements that were predicted to exist but not yet known at that point in time and this design in 2019 as as you can see on the graph represents you know the, the the understanding back then um but also trying to uh, allow for a, an existing and changing landscape that will emerge over time um so this is the 2019 product table but i'm actually going to going to discuss the structure when we refer to our 2020 version of this so this is our 2020 periodic table of of projects in within trade and and we've categorized our periodic table in seven broad categories so supply chain finance trade finance insurance know your customer shipping and logistics supply chain digitalization of trade documents and trade processes as well as other projects such as marketplaces now supply chain finance in the original version we had various supply chain finance projects which are lever leveraging dlt the revised periodic table just includes an scf category but doesn't list specific projects and that's because there are thousands the increasing number of dlt scf initiatives makes it very difficult for us to provide a comprehensive and up-to-date picture particularly when you look at what's going on in in asia and the pace of change and um, you know we, we there was a time when we were saying one or two projects cropping up every single week it doesn't mean that the solutions within the supply chain finance space are unimportant quite the opposite and DLT is very interesting within the SCF space because 
it addresses the myriad of challenges faced, not the least of which is greater transparency of suppliers' operations. Um, many SCF projects also go beyond merely supply chain finance to address other issues. So, for example, Halo Trade, which many of you may have heard of, has adopted a bit of a multifaceted approach, tackling not just supply chain finance, but also issues in relation to sustainability and covenants. Link Logis is another supply chain finance initiative, which branches beyond the first tier of suppliers that supply chain finance actually looks at um, um, and goes into deep tier supply chain financing. Now, if you just look at look at the graph, so on, on the bottom axis, you've got you know the core function, those those core categories for for the various projects. And then you've got, you know, from bottom to top, uh, what, what we would rank as the stage of maturity, which I'll talk about later with the most mature projects that we believe at the top. And for those projects which have more than one function or what we called a, a secondary function, we've outlined that by the secondary uh, color per the per the key legend in, in the top right hand side. We've also indicated the underlying technology which we go into explain that kind of underpins the, the project, the consortia, the platform um, um, to try and kind of categorize what the minutiae and, and details are for those to kind of understand and, and have a bit of a like for like comparison for, for the various projects. Now, we also had a section for KYC or Know Your Customer projects, which we included in the periodic table. And I think when it comes to SME, SME finance, the number of projects is actually considerably greater than this. This is just for, for trade. Um, also, it's important to note that many initiatives that were categorized as the trade finance DLT initiatives, so to the left of, the, the, of, of that category in the periodic table, they also comprise a KYC element in their service suites. So, so we've only categorized projects here that have explicitly said that you know, this is just for KYC powered by, by blockchain. Um, um, and I guess it was to try and simplify the already complex visualization of, of the ecosystem. There are also a number of really interesting national KYC initiatives which haven't been included in the periodic table. And, and I, I can allude to initiatives such as NABU, Bahrain's blockchain national EKYC platform, which is the first national scale EKYC initiative in the EMEA region. So let's talk about maturity and the and, and the stage of uh, and, and the stage of of that and also some of the key differences between uh the projects we've we've actually increased the number of projects on this product table from 29 excluding supply chain finance to 44 um, um and some of the projects profiled in the original version have fallen aside whilst others that the, the net the, the the net result is is many others have have emerged and a few like contour which was previously known as voltron have progressed from being a consortium to becoming an incorporated legal entity enabling them to provide the full commercial services that they were previously unable to provide and i guess similar to the previous edition each project uh, is presented with its underlying technology as well as an evaluation of its current stage of maturity. So the, the, the headline conclusion is most projects within this space have progressed since November 2019. We found the industry overall has made steady progress towards trade digitization with the average project moving from a, a maturity stage of 2.3 out of 5 from last year to 3.3 out of 5, where 1 represents you know, very early stage proof of concept and 5 represents live and running or well established. Um, and the maturity indicator has been represented by those little circles you can see uh, in the top right hand side of, of each element in, in the periodic table. Um, Obviously, this is just a representation of the industry as, as we know it today, and you know it's all it's all subject to change. And also, there are a number of projects we're not aware of or don't have enough information to to include on here. And and you know, please please send any interesting projects my way, uh, and we can definitely look to including that in in, in next year's version. Um, um, it's also important to note that, like the previous version, um, um, we've 
primarily focused on the digitalization side of DLT in trade, examining how it can be used in pursuit of the digitalization of trade documentation, trade processes and the exchange of trade data. So we haven't covered, for example, track and trace projects of which there are thousands, i.e. You know, tracking and tracing the movement of PPE uh, cross border, which is a very important and very topical uh, project that's going on. And there are thousands like that, but we've had to kind of restrict it to the specific trade, trade finance sector. Uh, an important observation that we also made is that customs development is is trailing and and trade digitalization really relies on the development of some of these end to end solutions and and any digital process will only be as strong as its least digitized link and for international trade. This means integrating customs, which is no easy task. And several governments are testing or considering using DLT for their customs operations and single windows. Most projects obviously remain in a bit of a conceptual or piloting phase. There are some projects, uh, there's Kadena in Latin America, which we know of. It serves the very specific purpose of mutual recognition of authorized economic operators. We also flag in the publication a handful of proof of concept and pilot projects involving customs such as the NAFTA CAFTA proof of concept run by US Customs and Border Protection Office, the EU DG Taxid ATA proof of concept which was conducted with the International Chamber of Commerce, there's the Korean Export uh, Clearance Project and also Shanghai's Single Window Project. Um, but many of these projects have only made very limited progress and, and we haven't really been able to you know, quantitatively evaluate those due to a bit of a, a bit of a lack of data, which is why we haven't um, featured them in the revised product table. But customs are, are incredibly important and, and these development projects are, are, are I important. Uh, trade lens is another uh, project which is integrating a lot of integrating with a lot of customs authorities um, and there are several other DLT digitization of trade uh, document projects that are looking at integrating with with customs such as Avanza innovations which have been integrated into Dubai customs um, um, but it's not enough more needs to be done uh, we need to start seeing more movement along along this front. And as noted, a digitalized trade process is only as strong as its least digitalized link. And that's why we thought it was very important to flag up, um, flag, flag this up. A new section on standardization initiatives was also added in this year's publication. And I think it's very important to understand there are different types of standardization and there are lots of different projects which aim towards creating digital standards, which are very relevant for trade to drive digital interoperability. For example, you know, how does R3 Corda interoperate with Hyperledger Fabric as, as, as an example. And these initiatives play a really crucial role in shaping the future of trade digitalization. And it can only really happen in an ecosystem that allows for those seamless exchanges of data between existing platforms. Um, and this requires developing and implementing globally accepted digital standards for trade. I guess in the broader trade area, there are several initiatives all working towards creating this set of standards. Some of these are focused on particular sectors or geographies, others are perhaps a bit more general, and some are spearheaded by large international organizations like UN CIFACT, others by private companies. And the graph you see on the screen provides a bit of a, a glance look at some of the key initiatives in the space and i guess last but not least the study also showcases the results of the supplementary survey that we conducted analyzing the impact of the covid19 pandemic on the projects featured and how digitalization projects within within msme access to finance and trade finance have been impacted by the pandemic and to gain this understanding you know we conducted 
this survey and we featured it in the publication and we asked respondents how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted their DLT plans and activities and in accordance with other studies, in particular the ICC Global Survey on Trade Finance, we find that the vast majority of firms have actually experienced a positive benefit to their DLT plans and activities as a result of the pandemic. And I think that's been a, a theme throughout today's conference. Without the physical presence of staff and you know, forcing people to work from home in many regions around the world, banks and corporates have really been forced to produce rapid digital solutions in order to remain operational um both by temporary and also fairly permanent solutions and in many instances this was actually just done by scaling up existing digital solutions or enrolling projects to other other economies that perhaps the larger banks operate in and whilst many dlt solutions may not have been directly implemented as a result of covid19 you know we, we can't we can't not talk about the progress made in the implementations of all of the supporting technologies and that halo effect, which has clearly had very positive implications. But actually, I think the challenges are probably one of the most important parts and, and the takeaway here, because it's important to understand why, why are we not fully digital yet within the industry? And we try to seek the various challenges faced by DLT firms. And it's interesting to note from this graph that legal challenges were rated as posing a more pressing challenge rather than, you know, as opposed to any of the other challenges. And it really does suggest that the largest current challenge facing the deployment of DLT solutions across the entire industry relates to that lack of legal clarity and enabling the regulatory framework that firms face. I think if the industry is to transition successfully into a fully digitalized world powered in part by DLT, but also in, in, in part by other lots of other technologies, this regulatory development needs to keep pace with technological advancement and governmental authorities and, and, and regulators need to keep pace with the technological advancement uh, uh, and, and actually address the historic and often wildly outdated laws that are burdening those that you know, seeking to, to guide and bring the industry into the future. So look, thank you very much for having me at the CE SME Banking Finance Conference 2020. I invite you to send through any messages or, or send across an email with any questions. Be delighted to have this further. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Deepesh. And our panel is ready and our panelists are ready. Michal, please start the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Olena, and thank you for this last presentation, which was a video presentation. But as we are everybody online, so the video presentations are also welcome. So now I'd like to uh, welcome in our panel our guests. So Daniel, Jane, and Carlo, which you already met during the presentations. But I also welcome Giorgio Cookies. So the extra guests on our panel welcome you here on our Thank online you. stage. So as we have a hi, little George. Bit... <laughs> hi, hi Betul. <laughs> hi Daniel. So hi. I see I see that our uh, panelists know each other even being from such a different country. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I hope that you know live, not only from some online conference. No, no, it's a small world. It's it's a small small world. world. Okay, when we talk about the world, let's start our discussion. Of course, I'd like to uh, ask the first question to uh, to Georgios. You, as you haven't been on our presentation, uh, I'm really impressed about the the uh, IT solutions which your company delivered. And the first question is, of course, now during the pandemic, when everything changed, everything is online, the companies, the factoring companies and SMEs are looking for the new solutions. Uh, how is this development now looks like? How, what, what are the what are the results of the development in 2020 and what are the goals for 2021? Yes, 
Uh, actually, the factoring companies and uh, bank institutions that provide factoring and supply chain finance, after, uh, I would say, the first shock of the pandemic, uh, they try to focus on uh, some more digitalized solution in order to uh, reshape uh, the model of, uh, of their work. Uh, there was a big challenge for this organization to change, let's say, the mindset and to succeed uh, in uh, a kind of innovation and uh, technology. Uh, because technology is there, it was there for the last uh, many years, but uh, people were a little bit reluctant to use it. Uh, I think digital transformation now is a must for a factoring institution and banking institution that provide such kind of solution to the SMEs and large corporates uh, because it is uh, the only way now with a new um, situation uh, to improve efficiency, generate more revenue and uh, deliver value to their customers. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, the same uh, topic as uh, Daniel is with us and you also deliver, your company also delivers some great uh, uh, factoring. The question is how you change your product during this 2020 and what will be in 2021? Daniel, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we okay. hear you very well. Okay, super. Um, yeah, and uh, thank you, Michal. Um, we, what, we, what we did um, basically is exactly adopt that strategy of uh, providing the best user experience that, that we can. So we, we took our portal and um, together with our clients and with, uh, of course, some of our own ideas, we, we put it to a redesign and uh, added more and more functionalities, let's say, uh, also to look at risk, uh, at, at risk indicators, uh, um, for example, that, that you can now you know, look at uh, as a decision maker, as a risk manager um, on your phone, for example, and making the access for, for prospects, so for the factoring clients, um, as easy as, as possible, uh, even, let's say, even, even easier with with the integration of, uh, let's say, things like OCR and, and, and things that we um, may, might have held back on uh, earlier, now we, we, we realize them. Um, and so, so this is, this is uh, one thing that we did. And uh, the, the other thing is that, that we are now thinking about adding even more AI to the, to the back end. Uh, let's say to to have even more pattern recognition to to tell uh, when a client uh, is running into problems uh, with more indicators or uh, to tell if an invoice is fraudulent or not and um, yeah so basically that's the that's the gist of it uh, I would say and but first and and um, you might have we, we might talk about risk later but uh, I think just as a, I, let's say, uh, something that, that we should maybe all think about, I think the challenge that we are facing now is not even a technological one, and, and please, you know, uh, disagree with me on, on, on this one, uh, but it's a conceptual one, um, because we have to look at risk uh, in a much different way in this, in this, let's say, in this challenging and uncertain landscape, uh, for example. So... Uh, we are paving the way to have a lot of flexibility in, in, in pattern recognition, for example. Uh, but um, what will these patterns be? Th that is the question. Uh, uh, which, um, let's say, which area of business are still viable after the pandemic and, and which will suffer long-term consequences, uh, for example. Um, and when we figure out that, then we can put the really powerful technology into place, uh, let's say. OK, so which directions? Because it's, I'd like to push you to answer this question maybe more. What direction of the technology development for SMEs you see in 2021? So what will be this biggest challenge? What will be this direction of technology development? 
Mm -hmm. um, um, could I? Uh, so, so the yeah, direction. Yeah. Uh, I, I think um, that PSD2 can help us a great way of, of dealing with this. Uh, because um, what we need is uh, more data definitely more data we we don't know all the directions like i like i tried to outline in my in my uh, presentation but uh, what we need is more flexibility and, and uh, more data uh, for example on a transactional basis then we can put on uh, to, together with you know the great minds of, of of risk managers and leading senior risk guys um we can put that we can put that to the test and uh, develop new models uh, for risk to, to see which SMEs we can still finance and, and which, you know, which, which we can, which business models are still sustainable. And then we can, and like, like Betu uh, also outlined, AI, for example, is, is going to become even more important because when we have all these, 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 these risk models in place, then of course we can automate them. But uh, yeah. I think now it would be, it would be quite challenging uh, to say this is the right model for the next five years or something like that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to address a question to Betul. Uh, dear Betul, you as a, uh, as a factoring open account receiving finance uh, association, you have a really cross-border view of what is going on on the market. You could just say us how is your opinion, what will happen in 2021, mostly from the perspective of the SMEs and SME customers of factoring products. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, uh, well, when we talk about the global impact of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Of course, digitalization uh, came onto the table of the big banks, uh, mid-sized banks, small factoring companies. Uh, besides different ways of evolving in the bank on the digitalization, the pandemic also highlighted differences in regional and global policies by governments that the global banks and all the financial ecosystem must adapt to. We ant anticipate that the, both the receivable finance industry and associated risk will improve because these changes, uh, digitalization will undoubtedly prove useful in developing new products, services and controls that, fit, that will ultimately attract more clients to the receivable finance market. But I think a new wave of industry changes coming to the world of international trade, as uh, Daniel mentioned, uh, I think Daniel mentioned that the DLT and non-DLT projects are coming to leverage new and uh, exciting technologies to help uh, bring trade into the new digital era. Uh, new projects and uh, consortia from the, all aspects of the industry, from financing, uh, from different industries to shipping to insurance are generating innovative approaches to the challenges. But these projects are uh, disrupting many of old ways uh, of operating uh, like uh, artificial intelligence by bringing the new ones, new uh, solutions on the table. But I think uh, all we need is a fully integrated system with the global standards because we are all talking, of course, the first step is the talking about the new digital solutions by the um, service providers. Uh, it's going to be implemented by the big banks or middle size or the small, uh, even for yeah. the small factory yeah. companies. But we need to, all the global standardization for it for the full integration of the system. I think we, we will see this kind of standardization. As, a, as an FCI, we are also supporting the government's regulators for, for adopting the new technologies. But of course, it will take time. It, 2021 is probably we will see, but, but we have some more time, I think, for this one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, now I'd like to address a question to Jamie. Uh, you, as a, um, also international and uh, IT solution company, not only, but also 
what are your uh, view to 2021 according to the development of the systems for financial institutions? What is the, the most important development uh, goal for you and for your customers? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, first, I think this digital acceleration, which has, um, um, well, started uh, with a bit enforcement, of course, is non-stoppable. And uh, of course, as, as a tech provider, if you're asking me, um, I think that should have been started, well, decades ago already. And um, yeah, I think many are appreciating or preferring this kind of doing business already with each other. And for those who don't, I think there's still enough possibilities to be helped with alternative ways. Because I think by now, the vast majority of the population is used to, for example, and that's just an example to, to use, to use, for example, video calling or, um, um, yeah, anybody I think is getting a video calling expert in, cert in a certain way. Um, so I think that I, what I believe is that this will become a more mainstream way of living. And more trust is now, uh, I think, on the fact that things will remain working, although in a different way, of course. And if I have a look at ourselves, at Topicus, we are, of course, kind of an SME as well. And our first day of working from home was at March 16th, somewhere. And I bet that if I would have suggested to collectively start working from home at the beginning of, well, Feb, uh, my board would have said that we uh, could close the shop. And yeah, by, by now my board is almost preaching working from home as long as we continue taking good care of each other. So um, yeah, as for SMEs, I think that they have to think in new bosses, business models to survive. I think that's one of the key thing, what we all, including financial institutions, debt advisors, like any who could support the SME, uh, um, um, well, area, um, that's one of the inevitable proceedings from here on. That's, that's what I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As uh, we have just one minute to go, just one question. Just, just, do you like, Carlo, something to add to our discussion? As... What I'd like to add, because I'm on the other side of the, um, uh, of the spectrum, because we are a debt advisor and we uh, realize... Exactly, that's why I, add you, I ask you. Yeah, this, what I'd like to add is um, that um, the most important thing to get more uh, efficient in, in, in is to, and I heard it before, is to get a, a global um, um, uh, uh, interest in data and, and make, it, make it work globally. Uh, because what we see in the Netherlands, um, there is a lot of different data, so it makes it more harsh to uh, make a digital uh, collection of money and funding. So that will be uh, the biggest uh, goal for the couple of years. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And thank you all, especially for the presentations, which were the first part of our, our panel. And now thank you for the small discussion and uh, what is most important, finger crossed for the health of you and for our company. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you all. Bye. Thank you, Michal. Thank Michael. you, yes. thank you, thank you all for your contribution. And I invite you to join now SME Finance Networking Area to continue the conversation there. And now let me invite the next speaker to our stage, Andrzej Krzeminski, CEO at MVOX, blockchain-based uh, startup for the Renewable Energy Project Finance. Andrzej, you are welcome on the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, it's so nice to be there. Um, I would say that the uh, meeting is organized very professionally. You know, we wholeheartedly con congratulate on everybody who came to this concept to have this kind of conference being held totally online. Now, uh, I was really thrilled to watch and listen to all the presentations, and I would like to move now to something that is uh, a little bit maybe different, and it really is about digitalization of uh, things that are important for the world right now. And this importance is the renewable energy investments. And I will try to tell you where do we come from, what is our mission, what are, what are our goals, what is the technology that we are employing, 
what kind of uh, offer is being created, and uh, maybe just uh, have a little glimpse over the, the products that we are giving right now. Now, the team that has come to this concept is uh, constructed of uh, several persons, mainly people responsible for investments and financial world. There is Gerrit Voss. You will have Charles uh, uh, Gamba, who will lead the, the meeting uh, after my presentation. There is Steve Kaczmarczyk, a person that has a long time in the, in the financial industry. Guido Behrhams, Marek Malik, the group of engineers, uh, technicians uh, that came and, in, in, and investors that came to this uh, position to offer uh, something that we called an Amvox, the platform. The ITDS that we are developing from is a uh, Dutch, Dutch embedded company having its Polish business. We belong to Redmore Company altogether, having like 1.6 thousand professionals in the IT industry with a uh, quite good turnover uh, of 130 million euro per annum. We have been servicing institutional financial clients in a, all the practically biggest names that, for example, operate in Poland have been, have been serviced by us. The offer that we are giving is, uh, first of all, the staffing. Uh, for We are staffing the projects at our customers with uh, professional engineers. We offer integration of third-party systems. And last but not least, and something that I would like to talk about right now is based on the experience and equity uh, and uh, all the mastership that uh, this organization have generated so far, we became to be the fintech delivery platform uh, and uh, creating an ability to launch new businesses. Now, what we are offering is Amvox Renewable, the portfolio and asset management platform that is based on blockchain and uses all these uh, modern technologies which is, in our opinion, an answer, or maybe even a standard, as far as uh, management of, uh, uh, of the financing of uh, renewable energy projects is concerned. The offer is worldwide. We started from Poland because this is where the majority of our staff is now located. But of course, it touches upon every possible energy source that we can have in the world. Now, you know that renewable energy is something that is really uh, on vogue right now. Uh, countries and governments have pledged 826 gigawatts renewable energy production by 2030. That is approximately $1 trillion, so $1,000 billion that is going to be invested in this area. Is it a big number? Well, it sounds big, however, in the last decade, 2010, 2019, the world has invested $2.7 trillion into a renewable energy um, organization and investments. The renewable energy sources grew from 6% of the total share in energy production to nearly 13.5% in 2019. We have uh, a group of companies that is called uh, the RE100. That is a group of big corporates like an Apple or Microsoft that are claiming that within a very defined period of time, 100% of their energy that they consume would be uh, taken from renewable energy sources. We have credit rating companies like Standard & Poor's who puts the ESG factors as an element of the credit rating of a company. So this world became to be very vibrant and is being uh, very corporatized. So we came to conclusion that we would need, or somebody would need to do the, to, to present an offer uh, to power this energy production and renewable energy management with digital solution. And this is our vision, this is our goal, uh, so that we can help the industry to find this situation where financing of uh, renewable energy sources is no longer an issue from managerial perspective, from digitalization perspective. So the mission is that we put forward is, uh, you know, gather a team of engineers and uh, specialists to create a standard, to create a unique solution that would be helping to manage the sustainable project finance. 
and to be able to monitor the whole chain of digital data flow from the moment when the data is produced and captured by sensors, then it is managed within uh, SPVs or within companies, then it is controlled by the investors and then it's controlled by financiers, so banks or investment funds, and then it can be what we call tokenized or sold on a secondary market. And it is all located on the blockchain as an answer to the modern technology uh, solutions that are available right now uh, for the market. Now, what industry challenges are we, have been, we been facing so far? First of all, with the expense per one megawatt going down, for example, one megawatt of uh, solar energy went down in Germany from $6 per one megawatt to less than one point five dollars per one megawatt, there is a big possibility that there will be more investments done with a relatively lower total volume of uh, money that needs to be invested. That means a multiplication of size of sources that will be producing renewable energy. The next element that, the, that is coming with this is that we do not have a single source or single type of uh, renewable energy production. There will be multiple. There will be biogas, there will be, there will be water, there will be uh, solar, there will be wind. So not only many of them, but also many in terms of the type of the energy source. That is leading us to the next situation, next challenge. That means that locations will be many, dispersed all over the country in various places. That means that the total management of a portfolio of an investor who has several SPVs, and within these SPVs, he would have the photovoltaic farms, he would have uh, wind farms, he would have uh, biogas farms. That also that already becomes to be quite important element to manage the whole portfolio. Now, when we are putting all these elements into the energy distribution grid, somebody has to control this. Somebody has to control the energy that was produced, stored, produced and sold. The blockchain is a perfect tool for transactions to monitor and to trace the transactions that are being done for the energy distribution. Now we are coming into the project finance, which is still to vast majority kind of handmade, requiring, uh, um, I would say, uh, typical, you know, man-made processing. You have many players. There might be frictions in the interest. There might be frictions in the ex access to the data. So altogether, if we are able, and this is what we are proposing, to give answers to this kind of uh, industry challenges, to create a platform that will be based on the blockchain, that will be traceable, that will be auditable, that will allow every participant, every organization that will have an interest in this uh, energy production chain have the same source of information, the same entry to the, to the information, that would altogether create us the possibility to uh, increase, for example, the liquidity in the market. Now, we start from uh, Internet of Things because every of these uh, sources of energy is, pro is producing information. The information is being collected by sensors. The sensors are sending out the information through Internet to uh, one of the element of our system, which is the data, uh, which is the asset managers, organizations who are managing the assets, production assets from technical perspective. Then we put it onto the blockchain. And when we include from different oracles, we, when we include the information from, from financial departments, uh, from banks, we are able to create dashboards, dashboards that are located on the blockchain dashboards that are accessible by parties who are involved in the whole, in the whole uh, energy production um, system. And uh, this is helping us, starting from this Internet of Things, going through the blockchain dashboard, this is helping us to manage the whole data, data flow, data chain. Now, the blockchain, I'm, I'm talking to uh, experts, so uh, it's not, no need to uh, uh, define the blockchain. However, we decided to put it on the private blockchain, and uh, this is uh, an, enabling us to offer 
uh, uh, dashboards that would, that would enable you know, the users to monitor in a simultaneous manner all this real, real uh, um, sort of renewable energy sources that uh, a company would have in their portfolio. This is more resilient. This is uh, lifting the frictions in, in terms of the access to data through various parties, and it's definitely uh, based on the secure system. Uh, it's just a very simple picture of how this uh, blockchain uh, looks like. We are saying that there are kind of primary and secondary blockchain. The primary is to inhale all the data from um, participants, from the uh, production sources, from banks, from asset managers, from the SPV owner, in order to create dashboards that are helping everybody to manage efficiently their, their portfolios, to be able to react to changes that are happening uh, in the whole production chain, to be able to react rather proactively than after the, you know, anything is uh, happening. But then we are coming to this, something that we call the secondary blockchain, which is enabling secondary financial market to look into the data, to trace the data, to see, look for the you know, auditable um, proofs of green energy production ability, and then to be able to cut into slices the funding sources and uh, re redistribute them on the secondary financial market. We strongly believe that this is something like, we call, as we call the digital data room, that is non-changeable, that is secure, that is accessible by, by parties, that gives the information that is very equal to every participant that is allowed to have an insight into the data. What are our key system features that we are proposing is, first of all, loading up the uh, projects. We call it the uh, loading dock. This is a uh, you know, set of tools that enable us to onboard the information from different sources, from different sensors, from different uh, data providers onto the platform. So this is number one. Number two is and this, way, this we found very popular when we spoke to, um, uh, to the players on the market, that the management of, the, of those uh, portfolios through an online and real-time dashboards that are reacting in no time in, onto the changes that are happening in the whole energy production uh, chain and can give the immediate information feedback to people who are interested in having this kind of feedback from the production perspective, but also from the financial perspective, from the credit control, from the, uh, from the investment control perspective. Within this, there are something that we call the smart contracts or so automized or digitalized processes that are using the data that is taken from the, from the whole platform and they are producing the signals to users, to persons, individuals, organizations that should have some activity based, for example, on the fact that for some reasons, a part of the production plant is not producing energy, so it might uh, impact the total production capacity, which might be impacting total sales of the energy, which in, if uh, in risk could be putting the uh, repayment of loans at uh, risk. The digital data room is something that is very important because it, it is allowing participants to trace the data back to the beginning of, uh, of the whole platform, is allowing the, the participants to trade data in a specific point in time, and is allowing to conduct all the audits that would be needed in order to assess uh, the specific project. Uh, our USP, first of all, because of automatization, because of digitalization, because of the fact that the whole complicated world is being put on one platform and is being put on the blockchain is, and is very digitalized and very automized, the cost of uh, project financing will definitely go down. We have estimations that are you know, showing that uh, you know, in the 
by basis points, as far as the total investment is concerned, we are able to prove that this introduction of this kind of management system is cooling off the expenses as far as the total project finance is concerned. If so, there is a possibility to increase the number of projects that are being managed by a team, by a company, by a manager. So this becomes even cheaper. If so, the agility and liquidity of the financial aspects of renewable, renewable energy finance is being improved and is being increased because all the transactions that, uh, that are being done throughout this uh, energy production chain are being located on the blockchain and be, are being traceable. And also, when I look into the smart contract thing and their auditability, definitely the, it improves the compliance of the projects and improves those elements that are, as I mentioned at the very beginning, important. So, for example, the environmental protection factors of the existence of the company or to prove the actual uh, uh, carbon offset that we are generating by specific source of energy. We start, of course, by customization of the project because it's a quite uh, important element at the very beginning to understand uh, the system at the customer side, to understand how the bank is managing uh, uh, this particular set of customers. Then there is a process of onboarding of projects onto our platform. We produce the dashboards. Uh, then those dashboards are existing within this dashboards within the whole platform. There's, as I said, the automation element um, that we are agreeing, those smart contracts are agreed with all the stakeholders of, uh, of, of, of the platform. And as the final outcome, there is a possibility to either securitize the portfolio or cash out in full or in part of the invested money, which allows investors to release equity that was invested or allows banks to share the risk among the participants of the financial uh, market in a specific country. Um, we, you know, it, we would say that the future just starts today. This what you have, this what you see here on the, on the picture is a, a kind of graph from our, one of our uh, dashboards. Um, I think just to summarize my short presentation that it is really the need as we look into this uh, sector or sectors, the energy production and energy renewable energy financing. It is now the moment that with all the rise of investments that is happening to the system and in particular in Poland, which that becomes to be very active in terms of uh, shifting from fossil fuels to renewable energy. You have big, or big state-owned organizations that are claiming the change of their strategy towards the green energy. It is now a perfect moment to look into this process of how the monitoring of the whole energy production process is done. How does it comply with the financing part of, uh, of, of the system so that we are able to pr propose to the market a standard. We kind of joke at home that this is our Bloomberg for renewable energy production and finance. And uh, this is what the Amvox as a feature, as a platform is geared towards. I think I'm just a little bit ahead of my time. So uh, I think I, we discussed with Elena that there is a moment that uh, we would invite questions. So if anybody of the participants would like to throw a question at me, please feel free. Yes, uh, thank you, Andrzej, for your presentation. Very important topic. And yes, we have a few minutes for the questions uh, here. Actually, uh, as you are coming from the financial sector and uh, precisely the leasing industry as you uh, headed the Raiffeisen Leasing and Pekao Leasing and also Polish Leasing Association. So my question to you is, how do you see that you can cooperate with the leasing companies and with the banking industry in this project? Well, I would even say that uh, the, uh, the system is offering 
solution to everybody that has assets that are online. And if I would go to my previous assignments within the leasing industry, you can think about fleets of cars. And it's said that 60% of newly produced cars are connected. If they are connected, that means that they are collecting information from the cars and they are sending this information somewhere. So we would be eager to you know, collect this information, create a dashboard or a set of dashboards for companies that are using uh, fleets, for example, and produce the same uh, set of uh, tools for leasing company. From the banking perspective, we had talks, we had discussions, and we found ourselves in a very specific situation. When we talk to investors, they are saying, oh, how can you convince my bank to use the platform? When we speak to the bank, he says, how can you convince my customer so that the customer employs this platform? So apparently, both sides are in the need of this solution. And it is only the, the time, and uh, thanks to this fabulous uh, convention, we are able to present the concept. It is now the time for us to convince the market that every participant, either the investor that is investing into, let me come back to renewable energy, every investor and every bank that is you know, financing is interested or might be possibly using the solution that we have on offer. So I'm not afraid of this. It only takes time and some trainings and the presentation for the market to analyze the uh, value of the product. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre, and good luck with the project. And I invite our attendees to uh, write your questions to Andre directly in the, in the messages on our website. So now let me Thank announce... You. Yes, and now let me announce the next panel, which will be devoted to the cooperation with fintechs. And let me invite the moderator of the panel, Charles Alexander Gamba, partner and founder of the ITDS in Poland, and also the investor of several tech projects. And the one is Mbox, which was just presented by Andrzej. Charles, hello and welcome. Hello, hello. Hi. Can you see me? Yes. Yes. Hello. Hello, Charles. Hello. Good afternoon. Good evening. We're very in this world. So first of all, we are very delighted to come for every year this event with ITS. Despite the current circumstances, uh, the summit is still very, uh, every year, very professional and resilient. And on top of that, I think that event is having more and more amazing content than people. So thank you so much, Lorena, and your team for making it happen. We are very proud to come for your organization. So, it is not time to discuss the fintech. We will start with uh, two presentations from our dear speakers from Rapai School International. Then, all together with amazing partners from the industry, we will address the major question is fintech a bubble? So, I would like to first invite Kristen Wall, Head of Strategic Partnership and Ecosystem of Rapai School Bank International. Thank you very much for the kind introduction uh, and the invitation that uh, we are, that I can present uh, our approach to fintech collaboration today uh, on uh, this uh, gorgeous event. Uh, my name is Christian Wolf. I'm heading the Strategic Partnerships and Ecosystem Department, uh, part of Group Strategy in Raiffeisen Bank International. Uh, even though uh, we are headquartered in Vienna, Austria, we consider our core markets all across CE from the very large ones like Russia, but also down to the Balkan countries as, for instance, Albania. So we more or less uh, cover a huge, uh, a huge uh, uh, muted, uh, actually, so. market. Uh, <clears throat> recently run. Uh, we have uh, built up over the last uh, four years uh, a program called Elevator Lab. Uh, the Elevator Lab is Raiffeisen uh, International's uh, answer to uh, the need of a more structured approach when it comes to fintech cooperation and collaboration. Uh, and we have set this up, uh, as I said, four years ago, and we are now running currently amidst, uh, we are running in the fourth batch of the program. What is actually that program? The 
The program is actually split up in uh, three different parts. Two of them would we would consider local, and there is one global program. I'd like to quickly introduce the global program. The global program, uh, titled as Elevator Lab uh, Partnership Program, is a yearly approach uh, where we aim at partnerships at, uh, with global fintechs. We are looking here uh, at later stage fintechs. <clears throat> Uh, we are uh, here running a nine-month program uh, that includes a four to five months POC phase. And what we actually aim to do here is that together with our business lines, together with our banks locally uh, located in the, uh, in the CE markets, uh, we identify areas uh, of interest uh, where we as a bank believe that we need uh, more uh, innovation, where we want to uh, actively look for cooperation. Uh, and uh, within the program, we invite global fintechs uh, that are at the later stage, meaning that they already have a marketable product, uh, to join us uh, in running together POCs. And <clears throat> Uh, the, the idea here is that we do not, uh, so this is an equity free program, so we offer an, a POC fund, uh, we actually finance that, uh, and uh, we offer also, of course, uh, once we have a proven POC up and running, that we scale it into our other markets, but basically at that stage, we do not take any equity. So this is really a partnership program that aims to cooperation and co-innovation. Um, on the other hand, we have very local programs. As I just mentioned in my introduction, we have a very heterogeneous landscape of different markets. Uh, some of them very advanced, some of them are in the midst of the journey to, maturi uh, to, to uh, digital maturity. <clears throat> and of course, uh, we want to cater specifically to that heterogeneity. And as such, uh, we have set up local programs. One of them we call the Elevator Lab Channel uh, Challenge. Sorry, uh, this is where we team up with regional or local later stage startups in a two to three month program and we invite them uh, to cooperate locally with our uh, local subsidiary bank in each country. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, for the early or very uh, early seed stage startups, uh, we have an educational program that we call the Elevator Lab Bootcamp. This is where we together with the startups sit together, we mentor them, we help them with the capacities and resources that we have internally within our bank to develop their own minimum viable product. And if we see this working out, uh, we also of course offer a track into uh, <clears throat> market launch uh, within our countries. Um, this uh, program, as said, already ran three, uh, four different batches. Uh, within these batches, uh, we evaluated over 1,200 fintechs uh, that applied from all across the globe. Uh, we ran here uh, more than 20 different POCs, uh, and uh, we already had, of course, uh, quite some successes uh, when it came into implementing these products into our uh, own uh, offering. And this I want to quickly show here on the next slide. Uh, for instance, uh, <clears throat> we had uh, uh, set up then uh, different uh, cooperation and, uh, and, 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 and market uh, product launches uh, with different uh, fintechs, I'm sorry, uh, in, in different countries, all of which uh, start, of course, in some specific country or locally, but we aim very much at scaling them at least into our countries, or even taking beyond the POC funded investment. But on that, uh, my colleague, Mark Schausberger, will report uh, just in the presentation right after me. <clears throat> um, why I'm telling you that story is uh, because uh, these uh, four years of intensive cooperation with our fintechs uh, also brought us a lot of insights into these markets. And we thought that uh, there at least back then, there was no comparable uh, officially accessible publication on the fintech ecosystems within CEE. So we decided why not share this knowledge and make it available to all those interested. And this was uh, the, uh, the birth of our CEE fintech atlas that we just launched the second uh, edition last year. And we are now working uh, very uh, hard to have a third edition published uh, in the course of next year on a completely different format and platform. So uh, you, you can stay excited. There will be a, a very cool thing 
developing and uh, quite soon announced. Um, what does this FinTech Atlas do? The FinTech Atlas does, of course, cover our own CE markets where we operate in, but we also included those markets where we believe there is FinTech systems developing quite nicely. And we have a lot of insights uh, that we want to learn, but that we also want to share. And so we also included, for instance, as just one example, uh, Turkey into that uh, uh, coverage as well. Um, the FinTech Atlas itself uh, is um, sharing our own expertise. Uh, so what did we learn in the course of our cooperation? But it also looks into the future, uh, looking into what are the main developments, uh, what innovative uh, things and product developments are going on in uh, these ecosystems, but also how do these ecosystems actually organize. Uh, and um, <clears throat> at the... Oh, okay, now my slide is not... Oops. Um, at the end, I just quickly want to summarize what were the major findings of our latest edition. The latest edition, we deliberately had focused on the topic of open banking because we actually really believe that beyond uh, PSD2, uh, okay, somebody is now switching my slides, that uh, beyond PSD2, <clears throat> Uh, there is a big potential uh, on uh, APIs, and you can already see it on my sweatshirt here. Uh, I'm a strong believer in APIs because it's not just about digitalization anymore. It's about connectivity. It's about interconnectivity. So how do we ensure that different providers, different products, different processes, different infrastructures actually talk to each other and as such form an integral, needless, and seamless customer journey? Um, so we focused at the, the open banking topic. Uh, what we saw is uh, in general, looking at that and especially uh, that uh, we have achieved great progress in all of these countries because also the local regulators actually started developing officially standardized guidelines on securely sharing sensitive data. And this was actually a huge push for the fintechs in the markets uh, because there was of course initial reluctance on the fintech side, but also on the incumbent side about sharing data in the absence of such a regulation. And uh, these, I, I wouldn't say this is completely solved, but we see it in a very good way developing. On the other hand, of course, our own experience in cooperation with fintechs, uh, but also what we see with other banks is uh, that open banking actually really changed the perspective on how we cooperate and uh, co-create. Uh, so uh, um, open banking uh, was uh, for us a super uh, driver for um, openness, as it's already in the name, but also for digital corporations and partnerships. <clears throat> Last but not least, uh, I want to mention that uh, we still believe a very uh, uh, tightly into the, uh, into the fact that uh, there is not the one or the other. So there is not fintechs will uh, win the race and or, or incumbents will win the race. I think uh, the benefit or uh, in, in general, uh, it will end up in a very uh, cooperative environment that leverages both parties' best capabilities in order to create something cool and something new for our customers alike. Um, this is already a little bit of a preview to what very properly Max will now continue talking about. Uh, what we've also seen in our market research uh, that uh, there is a new peak in the level of fintech investments in the CE markets. Uh, we also see that uh, especially the ticket sizes are growing, uh, still not comparable to what we usually would see out of the Silicon Valley, but um, definitely some increase in progress here. Uh, and in the at the end, uh, that uh, we also see quite some local and regional uh, venture capital funds popping up. Uh, I just gave an example here, the Speed Invest colleagues from Austria, but we also have the startup wise guys from the Baltics, etc. And I believe a fintech ecosystem does not only live by the fintech and the cooperative bank that works together, but it also includes, of course, those who give the capital, those who share the risk, those who give access to markets, to clients, and even to technology. Um, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And if you should have any questions, uh, do not hesitate. Thank you very much, Christian. And now we get back to the panel. Charles, will you continue? 
Yes, thank you very much, Gretchen, for your presentation. Uh, you have a very nice jumpsuit, so I, you have to tell me why you ordered it. So uh, let's welcome right now uh, Maximilian Schwarzberger, I hope I pronounced well your name, Managing Director at the Bank of Ventures, which is the corporate venture capital entity of Raiffeisen Bank International. Welcome. You can just call me Max, uh, that's easier most of the time. Um, so thank you very much uh, for um, inviting me to speak uh, to you today and presenting to you what we are doing at Elevator Ventures and um, actually having Christian as a um, speaker before me is the perfect uh, bridge um, from, um, from what we are doing. Uh, over the last few years, uh, RBI has, um, as Christian explained to you, um, very deeply uh, engaged with the fintech ecosystem, um, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, quite su some successful co um, corporations uh, came out of it. And for us um, as a bank, it was uh, quite natural to always uh, also think about how we could um, further support um, the, the fintech ecosystem in our region. Um, and um, of course, one of the um, most important parts of such an ecosystem are um, is the is the sufficient provision of of capital and um, of venture capital in particular. Um, so I'm uh, heading Elevator Ventures. Um, we are located uh, here in Vienna, um, and uh, we are investing in uh, fintech, but also adjacent. I will get into that uh, in a minute. Uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, and through our um, backing of, of uh, Raiffeisen Bank International, we want to, and we we are a real growth partner um, for these fintechs uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. I will run you uh, uh, through some examples. Just need to start my mobile phone here to do the clicker. Uh, connection lost. Now it works. Um, so uh, how do we see ourselves? Um, uh, by leveraging uh, the power of Raiffeisen Bank International, um, we at Elevator Ventures are the leading corporate venture capital growth partner for fintechs in CE. That's our ambition. Um, a lot is already um, included in this sentence of how we see ourselves, um, but let me go into detail. Yeah, here we go. Um, so what are we investing in? Um, we are, as I said, uh, uh, of course, investing into fintech. Um, this is where we as um, AVC, um, with the backing of uh, RBI, have our expertise. But fintech is more than um, pure, I would say, payment apps or um, lending marketplaces. Um, uh, today, fintech is much, much more, and we see it in a broad definition. Um, we uh, are looking at a lot of artificial intelligence, but rec tech, uh, blockchain, um, and any other related enabling uh, technologies. Um, so actually, uh, we even see, and you will see it in our portfolio, we even see a lot of um, what finance innovation is uh, um, is happening in industries that are actually not related uh, to, to to finance at all, um, but where financial services are embedded into certain industries. And um, uh, also here at the SME conference, I mean, um, more and more SMEs expect uh, to have uh, financial services integrated in their um, industry smoothly and um, here there's a lot of potential for for innovation I'll come to that geography of course CEE there we have our um, strength in um, the network um, here we are close to the ecosystems here we have our expertise in market expansion we are investing into uh, motivated teams uh, of exceptional founders. Uh, luckily, we see a lot of them, um, uh, especially in our region. There are um, uh, more and more and in, in various cities, not always only in the capital cities, but uh, also in other cities. Um, uh, people from universities, people from uh, experience from, from first uh, jobs who, who actually found their businesses. Um, even there are serial entrepreneurs already um, in the region and this is the, the perfect basis for 
uh, for future startups. Uh, we are investing into Series A. That's our sweet spot. Um, uh, opportunistically, there are some late seed or, or maybe some early Series B um, investments possible, but Series A is actually our sweet spot and we are investing up to 3 million euros. I would say sweet spot somewhere between 1 and 2 million euros. Uh, we uh, never investing more than uh, 20 uh, or n never in, uh, taking more than 25% uh, of stakes of the company. Um, so um, classically venture capital business, there's no willingness from Elevator Ventures to take over a majority share in the company. Um, if the clicker works, then It doesn't, sorry. Okay, now it does. Um, uh, back some time. Our um, are valuable for for startups. Uh, what do they appreciate? Um, with ventures is VC, so we have a venture capital team. We have an investment committee that can take decisions uh, very fast. Uh, we have a clear mandate um, as a VC to um, uh, to, to produce uh, venture-like returns. So um, our behavior and how we act uh, in the cooperation with startups is very much like a normal VC. But in the background, there is the strong single LP uh, behind Elevator Ventures, that's Rifles and Bank International, which can provide us with um, a strong network of um, 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 distribution channels. It can provide us uh, with access to customers, uh, know-how um, and expertise in uh, product development, but also uh, market development, which our um, portfolio companies can, can benefit from. Um, I think Christian has uh, mentioned already uh, a bit on this slide. Um, he can see um, the map of uh, of RBI. So we pretty much cover cover all the markets in in Central and Eastern Europe. We have the the honor and pleasure to serve uh, nearly 17 million customers uh, in the region in 13 markets, and there is this huge, huge expertise and know-how from 30 years of doing business in the in the region. So now uh, uh, maybe a bit more um, uh, exciting. Um, that's our um, portfolio so far. We started investing um, uh, end of last year. Um, we have um, a, a quite variety of companies in our portfolio. Um, you can see here um, 360 company, which is a rec tech company from Austria. Um, Think Compare, an SME uh, lending platform from, from Germany. Um, then we have two uh, agricultural um, uh, fintechs uh, that, that are called AgroClub and Tafin, and a customer experience solution um, called Pisano. Um, overall, um, and where we started was actually with a fund of fund investment into Speed Invest F. Uh, here we are cooperating closely with Unica Ventures and Speed Invest um, uh, to do investments also um, beyond our region, uh, mainly in Western Europe. I want to highlight here at the SME conference um, maybe two or three of those um, portfolio companies and explain you a little bit what they are doing and how we are cooperating with them. Um, maybe let me start with the most obvious one, uh, Think Compare. It's an SME lending uh, marketplace. Um, what are they doing special? What is uh, so interesting for SMEs uh, about their solution? Um, they are today active in, in Germany. Um, and um, what SMEs are facing that uh, when they are looking for a loan, um, it's quite burdensome. They have to go to a bank branch. They have to provide a lot of um, uh, documentation. Uh, they can maybe go to two, three banks. Uh, they need to do, do their business besides that, so they don't have time um, to, to go to many banks. Uh, that's quite quite burdensome. Here, a digital marketplace like Fincompare comes in. They have um, 270 financial services providers, uh, uh, lenders uh, on their platform, um, and they have a very distinct 
um, algorithm that is matching the needs of the SME, um, uh, exactly what they're looking for, their maturity, the stage, the industry they are in, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, to the um, financial services uh, provider, and um, uh, could thereby already uh, finance uh, over 200 million euros in in, in loans over the last years. Um, they uh, these marketplaces, of course, um, uh, are are an interesting development, and uh, I think especially here in, in at the SCE SME uh, conference, um, uh, I can only recommend to look at their homepage and 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 see how how easy it is for SMEs to to find the right loan for them. Um, what I also want to uh, to highlight here is um, uh, 360 company. I know that a lot of um, Bank, bank representatives here uh, are also at this conference. So um, company actually enables you to onboard um, new to bank SME clients um, uh, fully digital. Uh, normally in such a process, uh, onboarding businesses is quite cumbersome because uh, you have this know your business processes where you have to ask the customer for a lot of documents, um, uh, company register, uh, etc. And uh, here 360 company has uh, a fully automated um, uh, uh, process of uh, uh, getting these uh, all these necessary documents, um, not only in, in Europe, but actually in uh, uh, I think 150 jurisdictions uh, all over the world. Um, they are actually an alumni from Elevate the Lab, and uh, RBI is using them as well for their um, uh, for their digital onboarding process uh, for corporate customers. So it might be interesting for the one or the other um, uh, SME banking colleague. Um, and last but not least, uh, Pisano. Um, here, uh, Pisano is actually a customer experience management platform, um, which is very much uh, focused on managing <clears throat> and reacting on customer experience across channels. Um, they have recently, um, they have recently actually launched a um, product that is specifically targeted at SMEs. So SMEs who want to, for the first time, um, uh, manage proactively the experience of their customers through digital channels. Um, uh, I can only recommend you look at the homepage of Pisano. Um, uh, actually, Oskar, the CEO, will be um, pitching at the CE uh, SME conference. Um, so, uh, um, uh, valuable to, to look at it and ask him some questions. Good. Uh, Moving forward, I hope it works this time. Here's our team. We are um, a team of five, uh, five people plus two students um, um, from different angles. We have people from the bank. We have people who started startups uh, for themselves. Uh, we have people from, from other venture capital funds. So um, the best mix uh, that you can have in a, in a corporate venture capital fund. Um, if you are interested to get in contact with us, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to do so. Um, okay. Um, someone is more interested in, in our team photo than in, in our contact. Yeah, let's jump back. <laughs> Um, uh, please visit our homepage. Uh, there you can also subscribe to our newsletter, visit us on LinkedIn, um, or just reach out to us um, uh, over the homepage. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, in case of any questions, feel free to shoot them. Charles, can you please switch on your microphone because we don't hear you? Yeah, yeah. I just did. <laughs> so thank you so much, Max, for this amazing presentation. So there is one question from the attendees. Uh, how many of these uh, companies or these entrepreneurs are startup run by women? 
in your projects? That's a uh, very good question. Um, we have in the leadership teams of our startups, um, uh, of course, uh, women. Um, if you if you say who started it, um, um, yeah. So in some of the companies, there there are women in the founding team, but uh, not enough. Definitely not enough. Um, there is room for improvement, especially in the fintech space. We need uh, more women. Uh, to, to take this step and um, uh, we are always encouraging also our portfolio companies in their hiring process um, to look especially for this diversity, um, not only um, women, uh, men, but also uh, age and country-wise uh, because we truly believe in the, in the benefit of a diverse team, as you also can see in our, in our team. I have also one question for you because you used to work on the banking side. Um, now you are sitting more on the investment side as a VC. Uh, what does that change for you? And how do you look at the fintechs right now that you sit as a VC? So you have to take the risk when you make an investment. Exactly. Um, not sure if I understood your question now, but uh, I think uh, the, the biggest change is that we are allowed to take some risk. Um, a venture capital fund is uh, is is uh, created to um, to on purpose say we want to invest into in in certain fields um, in the future where it's not hundred percent sure that this will be a success, but where we can. Um, uh, where we can, of course, where we have a certain conviction that uh, it will be, it will be a success, um, but also where failure is uh, is allowed, um, and maybe that's uh, one of the major change, changes. Of course, if you are um, in a bank, um, you need to uh, be very sure that uh, solutions are, uh, uh, are working. In a venture capital fund, it's um, um, it's a lot about. Um, um, about evaluating risk, um, about taking um, consciously certain amount of risk and um, to have a certain conviction about future success um, in, in the companies. And uh, I think um, for the corporate, uh, it's, um, it's an important way to get to um, a close to the technologies, to business models, to the teams that um, might be very relevant for them in the future. Uh, maybe three, five years down the road. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your answer. So let's welcome all the panelists uh, to, the, to this event. So first, uh, I would like to invite uh, Tomasz, Tomasz Miralek, who is representing KB Smart Solution, which is part of Comercini Banca from Czech Republic. Then we have Diana. Uh, please raise your hands when I uh, basically mention your name so people can recognize you. So it will be easier for you. Diana, you are the CEO of Innovix, a startup accelerator in Romania. So welcome. We have Raul with us, the head of companies digitalization department of Banca Transylvania, the biggest bank focused on SME segment in Romania. Uh, we have also Mr. Pavel Frenchik representing uh, the FinTech unit at Alior Bank in Poland. And uh, the last one. At the least, we have uh, Stephen Quintin representing D plus D mobile security company. So welcome everybody. So uh, let's discuss about the fintech market altogether. I'm very happy to have uh, basically you among this panel. You have all experience working together with fintech or you're representing fintech by yourself. So the question that I would like to address to you today is, is the fintech a bubble? So let's start first with uh, some questions that I prepared for you. Uh, what are the, your views on the current fintech market? And let's start with Diana. Uh, it would be interesting to understand your views on the current fintech market. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, today, I see a maturity of uh, the collaboration between banks and fintech. Fintech. So I think uh, the high passed, but we are now in the plateau of productivity where uh, major fintech solutions are adopted by banks and collaborate uh, with them. Uh, at Innovix, in the last uh, two years, uh, we had uh, eight fintechs 
from a total of 77 accelerated. And uh, we are proud to announce that uh, six of them already work with top three banks in Romania, and uh, two of them uh, are in advanced uh, discussions with the bank. Brilliant. Thank you. So let's add yeah, the same question to what, what is your perspective in Poland? So what are, is your view on the current fintech market in Poland? I, I think it's quite wide and uh, as, uh, as, my, as Diana said, uh, we have some implementation too uh, in our, in our uh, bank. Uh, we are cooperating with uh, fintechs very uh, closely. So, uh, so there is no bubble for us. And at the first stage, it was kind, some kind of challenging uh, between banks and fintechs. And now we are cooperating very close. There. there are the competitive one, the one that is looking to eat up the business from banks and the one that are looking to cooperate. So uh, let's yeah, ask we, we, have, we have to become a fintech in banks. So in the banks area, we feel like a fintech. We, we were established more than 10 years ago and we we still feeling like a fintech among the banks. Brilliant. And uh, so, yeah, I know that Alior basically is calling himself a fintech and was one of the first digital bank in Poland. So what about uh, the views from our colleagues from Raffaison? So, um, Max, uh, maybe you can tell us something. So you've been presenting your cooperation with fintechs. Uh, how do you foresee the fintech market right now from your perspective as a VC? Yeah, the fintech the market. market. Sorry? No, no, sorry, excuse me, we had some lag. Go ahead. Um, the fintech market, of course, um, this year saw massive dynamic, so in the venture capital scene. Um, we um, all realized and saw the, the, the dynamic that came into the market uh, with a, um, first a, a, a slump in um, valuations in some, some uh, fintech areas and then some actually uh, rebounds and um, some of the areas actually benefiting a lot from uh, from the whole situation that we are in right now um, and uh, as always in um, in this in such turbulent times uh, there are there are winners and losers and um, in uh, uh, in such turbulent times um, there is also some um, investment activities are, are increased um, and this is what we experienced um, uh, and going forward um, digital is first for all banks um, every company that is enabling banks to become even more digital even more efficient um, uh, with new technologies speed blockchain speed artificial intelligence um, every um, uh, companies that are um, uh, jumping on, on new areas like uh, um, asset tokenization or um, other buzzwords um, uh, we'll see everything that is around ESG, green finance, huge topic uh, where there's a lot of opportunities uh, for new business models as well. So um, I actually see that um, uh, there has been some corrections in the market, um, but going forward, there are a lot of opportunities um, uh, out there for fintechs, and uh, uh, yeah, we are looking forward to it. So you mentioned there are a lot of opportunities out there, so for fintechs, but those opportunities also uh, in the reach of banks, the traditional one, the incumbents. So where does that leave us with the fintech markets? Do you think that fintechs are still going to mushrooms like they did over the last three years? Because over the last three years, uh, I was on conference and probably you were, and one of the major topics is always fintechs, fintechs, fintechs. Uh, where does that bring us right now? Because we can see that this year has been a very challenging year with COVID-19. And uh, we can see that some of those fintechs have been challenged in the very core of their business model such as banks, but banks are very resilient and they are too large to fail. So what are the impacts that you may foresee for the fintechs and how the future is going to look like? So maybe I can ask these questions to start with to uh, basically Thomas. 
Yeah, so thank you for the question. I think um, because of COVID, uh, all the companies, including the fintechs, realized that uh, we're living in a, in a digi digital world now. And uh, um, in a, th this has impacted uh, banks uh, a lot. And uh, the fintechs are coming to uh, actually help banks uh, the, uh, solve these problems. That's uh, why, for example, us in Commerci Banca are uh, looking for, uh, you know, partnerships that can uh, help us with uh, digitalization. I can see, for example, a huge potential for uh, SME lending, digital SME lending, mainly, for example, in the high growth uh, area in e-commerce, because e-commerce sector, we see that is uh, booming right now, growing even faster than before. And uh, so the growth uh, has accelerated. We, uh, we have focused on this one and uh, started an equity partnership with uh, a startup called uh, Lemonero which is doing uh, B2B uh, lending in, uh, in uh, the sector of e-commerce. All right. And uh, I have a question for you. Uh, basically, it's again for Max and for Christian. Uh, since you cooperate with a lot of uh, different fintechs with Raffaison, how was this year? How are the startups doing after this major crisis that has impacted the market? Christian, you want to take it? Yeah, yeah, I will take it. Um, let's see. Uh, I think there is no, 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 no answer to that, no concrete answer to that. What I see, uh, and that has already been discussed before, is that of course uh, in the crisis that also the banks need to sustain, uh, we, uh, we we see a lot of projects internally postponed, and as such, uh, fintechs kind of lose uh, their major partners. On the other hand, uh, especially we are at Raiffeisen, we are deliberately dedicating resources still into innovation and still into this cooperation concept because we believe this is now actually uh, the right time to do that. Why do we believe that? Uh, as uh, somebody rightfully already mentioned, is in the COVID time now, uh, we've seen it's a huge push in terms of making services much more needlessly integrated, much more accessible via digital channels, etc., etc. And I think fintechs here are definitely the partner of choice when it comes uh, to coming up uh, to, uh, with new solutions for our uh, clients. Uh, so I believe there might be a bump in it. Of course, uh, it might be challenging for some of them, but ultimately, I believe uh, that uh, we we can continue on working. I hope so. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Uh, Raul, what, what's your opinion on, on this topic? Because you also represent basically what they call the incubant. Uh, what is your view? Do you think that uh, as a bank or basically you will in the future be stronger after COVID compared to the fintechs which are out there? Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, first of all, for inviting me and having me on this great panel. Uh, so uh, you left the incumbents for for uh, the final answer. Um, actually, I, I believe that everybody that is going to adapt to this crisis is going to become more stronger. So I'm not really anymore seeing a competition between banks and fintechs. Actually, the fintech uh, history is quite interesting. It started with a, a declaration of war for banks, uh, and uh, as, as they moved on. Uh, and the years passed, uh, the declaration of war became a declaration of collaboration. So we are seeing a lot of opportunities and chances for banks to collaborate uh, with fintechs in, in the future as well. Um, I'm seeing banks uh, narrowing the gap between uh, the services, the digital services and the digital channels they're offering in terms of user experience. Uh, versus the, the what fintechs are doing, so that's a good thing because we 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 started learning from fintechs and in, in terms of collaboration, 
I think we managed to take the best of it. Um, so I'm seeing uh, uh, still a long road ahead for banks and fintechs as well. Uh, but I'm seeing a road that's built on collaboration, not on competition or work. So basically, I, if I understand well, you believe more in the cooperation model, but you don't think, comp I mean, in the future, fintechs will be competitors because banks are now closing the gaps. So Diana, maybe you have an opinion on that because you are kind of boosting startups, uh, basically giving them muscles to go to the market. So what's your opinion on that? We cannot hear you. You are muted. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Okay then. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think uh, the fintech have an advantage because uh, having already developed uh, innovative technologies, uh, the fintech companies uh, uh, are either developing by themselves or in collaboration with traditional banks. And uh, I think uh, will be more and more the companies in fintech, I think. And the collaboration right, so. with uh, traditional banks, it's uh, very important uh, also for the banks and also for the fintech side. Okay, what, what are your views on the time to market? Because usually as a bank, you like to cooperate with a fintech because you know that your time to market or your flexibility won't be fast enough to address some issues. But know that banks are investing massively in technology. Uh, that means that the game is kind of changing and especially banks are accelerating this transformation program due to COVID-19. So how do you see the future? I mean, what will be basically uh, uh, added value as a fintech to start cooperating with a bank? Because the view of a fintech is, hey, if you can buy my software, my solution for 100K, uh, I'm going to help you and it's going to change your process. But we both know that banks they don't look at uh, this this way. They will say, OK, it's nice that it costs 100K, but to implement it in my current architecture or my organization, to integrate it, it will cost me a million bucks. So what do you think will should be really the added value in the future for this fintech? Because there was a lot of hype, and I can see that more and more there are shifts in the industry and banks thinking this way, that they can do it by themselves because they have access to the resources. You know? Yeah. Ah, yeah, me. Okay, then. <laughs> okay. Uh, sincerely, I don't analyze uh, their uh, valuation, but uh, um, I can tell you that um, uh, all my family has cards from all the challengers banks, even the kids, and that it's, I say, very, very excited and very uh, helpful for the for the fintech uh, companies, and also for the banks. I think it's not. Uh, well, so maybe we can have an opinion from a uh, banker. So maybe, Pavel, you can tell us something. What are your views from Allior Bank? Because you call yourself a fintech, but you also like to cooperate with fintech. So uh, what's your own opinion on this statement that I just made before? Uh, I, think, I think the time to market uh, external solution, uh, how to say it? Uh, I think the fintechs are, are faster than us. Uh, because we are quite a uh, quite huge organization uh, and uh, th this is the this is the challenge what, what they are the, what they are giving us uh, but we are not so uh, so uh, late for for them and and uh, this implementation what we have uh, show us that we can manage this 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 challenge but now it's not a challenge it's a clear your cooperation all right. Okay, so let's talk about another sensitive topic. It's the valuation of the fintechs versus banks. So we have all seen the markets uh, in March dropping like rocks. Uh, basically, banks' valuation got completely wrecked on the stock market. They hardly bounced because there is still a lot of worriedness from investors uh, that there might be a high credit, uh, basically, default on the market globally. Uh, otherwise, if you look at the fintech pre-IPO or even the ones that have succeeded to make an IPO or they're making rounds, Serie B, Serie C, they have huge valuation. So uh, let me ask a question to uh, basically Stephen. Uh, what's your opinion on the valuation of those companies? 
are they completely crazy or do you think it's reasonable that valuation of fintechs are much higher uh, than banks when it comes to let's say a multiplier of EBITDA yeah um, thank you for the question um, and I think it's a question that most people have on their minds uh, you know is this a hype is it a bubble um, I think when I look I look at fintechs first of all um, they, they exist today because uh, there's a need in the market um, I think their challenge is um, to be able to flip it from a, a growth strategy, which most of them are following. In other words, trying to grab market share um, because they need that to become sustainable. Um, but we haven't seen any profit coming out of uh, many of the fintechs. They're still in this growth phase. Um, so for me, I think the, the evaluations um, are purely related to what the investors are putting into the, 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 these companies. Um, and what they're valuing them at based on obviously the, the, the growth that they're having and not necessarily at um, the EBITDA um, that they're producing, if they are actually producing uh, any kind of profit at this stage. Yeah, that, so that's actually would... brilliant. That, that's a brilliant answer. Like, that's the point. Uh, there is not that many fintechs out there that are making a lot of money, or if not, they are actually losing money. So uh, when you look at the, the valuation of Revolut, a company that I like very much as a consumer, uh, they uh, are evaluating themselves about around 10 billion. This is twice as much, for instance, as the market cap of Raffaison. So uh, how comes that a company like Revolut basically can be valued so much without showing any profits, whereas a bank like Raffaison, which is more stable, let's say, and that has evolved through many crises through the times, which is international, is valued twice less. Maybe we can have an answer from our colleagues from Raffaison. What do you think of the valuation of the syntax? Especially, those valuation might be uh, even harder to basically to take some equity or to buy them. Yeah, I think Not you've uh, given part of the question, uh, part of the answer already. It's always uh, in business a, a risk return um, question, and uh, uh, the more risk you have to take, the more return you want to have. And um, um, at these in these valuations of fintechs, there is a lot of um, conviction of future development, um, and um, uh, people are obviously uh, tr trusting and believing that these um, uh, fintechs will will grow even grow even further um, uh, but as always in these life uh, cycles of, of companies at some point they need to prove that they're um, they're capable of uh, um, producing healthy um, profit as well and I think especially in these challenger banks um, this time has uh, has come and uh, if you look at the um, actions that some of those banks um, are taking at the moment, um, also increasing their fees on their platforms um, uh, are all lines that uh, investors are now um, demanding from them uh, to actually switch uh, switch gears from um, simple and pure growth to um, actually producing um, profits. And it's yet to be seen if they are capable uh, and able to do so. Um, uh, I think that's uh, that's my answer to this question. So my question to you and to you all is, does it mean that we are into a bubble? A bubble definition is that I value the price, there's an asset that doesn't value as much. So what, what do you think if somebody wants to take the stand and talk on this question? Well, if I may, um, I mean, we're as, as G&D, um, we're a global company. so. Um, and we've been around for over 170 odd years. Um, um, so the company's seen uh, and, and been in the banking space um, and, and central banking space for all these years. So I think trends come and go. Um, is it overvalued? It's only overvalued if it doesn't deliver the return. So, you know, if you take what the total banking industry globally is worth, um, then um, fintech banks maybe don't represent um, uh, the, the biggest chunk of that, yeah. Um, but as a, as if you're purely analysing the fintechs themselves and putting, looking at their balance sheet to to what has been invested, I think uh, the risk of uh, some type of bubble and a bubble bursting is there because 
um, the, the big question is, can they flip this? Can they move to profit? And I think this is where traditional banks um, have had a more conservative approach, but they know what the bottom line is. They know what it costs per transaction and how much it costs to have an account. Um, uh, fintechs are relying on on other revenue streams, on data leverage, etc. And it's a new world out there for them. Um, it's and, and time is the only thing that will prove whether this is really a bubble or not. That that's correct. So you know we are living in a sustainable world. So how much do you think fintech business model is sustainable? Organic growth, traditional bank, I mean model. VS basically uh, VC money to subsidize real costs. Basically, you are paying a lot to acquire customers. So, how much is it sustainable? Maybe you want to uh, keep on answering this question. Uh, it's for you, uh, Stefan. Yeah, I think there's two things that fintechs. Um have um, to, to help them with uh, long, the medium term sustainability. One, um, they leverage data in a different way to banks. I mean, if, if, when I got a salary increase, I didn't get my traditional bank contacting me to say, here's a new uh, credit facility, or we see you've, uh, your, your monthly income has increased, uh, let's offer you a different facility. Whereas a classic fintech is going to be analyzing that information, seeing that there's a change in my spending behavior, um, and start leveraging that data uh, by bringing complementary offers uh, from, from the, the whole ecosystem. So I think that's one. They leverage the data they have. Um, secondly, they have a much lower cost base to walk off. Their, 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 their tech stack is brand new. Um, some, some banks are sitting on core banking systems that are 30 years old, um, you know, because they just can't change it uh, for, 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 for whatever reason. Um, so I think those are the two advantages they've got. The, 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 the thing that they've got to still figure out is how do they, how do they uh, get customers to start paying? Because they've attracted the customers um, on, on a zero cost or low cost type account um, and maybe through features and functions, but that doesn't pay the bills. Eh? Um, so so they, need to, they need to find um, you know, re a revenue model that does not uh, cause their customers to suddenly just leave them and abandon them as fast as they joined. Another area of sustainability is, is who they partner with. Um, and, and when we look at it from a G&D perspective, uh, we feel strongly that uh, you know, partnering with fintechs um, and as a large company, giving them the support they need um, to make them sustainable, to make them uh, be able to offer the kind of products and solutions that, that their customers are looking for, helps with that sustainability. I, I think if, if I may add, I think right now the fintechs are still growing their footprint. They're, they're investing in, in their growth phase, right? And they want to uh, get as much customers as, uh, as possible. And, uh, and they're doing quite a good job. But uh, now they have to switch into uh, building their revenue streams and uh, monetizing their, uh, their uh, customers. It, I would compare it to Facebook, right? When uh, Facebook uh, uh, grew, they grew to uh, were investing in the growth to uh, to make their network and to have as many people on board as possible. I think the fintechs are doing the same, and only then they start. Uh, one, once they dominate, they start uh, flipping and uh, finding revenue streams, and then they can they can uh, grow their revenue streams pretty pretty fast. Yeah, it's true. It's usually most of the time for free with fintechs that make it very competitive for, for banks. So the, the real question is, can they keep their customer when they start to monetize this base of customers? So uh, one of the, yeah, I think somebody wanted to say something. Facebook still for free, um, but yet they've monetized it. So I think that's a good, a really good example that was given. Um, I think Facebook um, is, a, is, is a good example of um, how users are not charged, but their data is leveraged um, to, to make a profit. Huh? And fintechs right. can do that. It's, it's a different business model. So that's, uh, that's yep. the innovation, actually. It's uh, about innovating the business model. So maybe people that are using challenger banks now that uh, have uh, you know, application and banking for free, maybe it will stay for free. And uh, the fintechs will leverage the data that they have on their customers. 
to monetize. There, there are a lot of possibilities out there, I guess. But coming back to this valuation topic, um, do, do you think that uh, basically some fintechs are completely over evaluated on the market? Because uh, probably when you're shopping out there, there are a lot of startups that are actually looking for funds or looking for additional run from the investors or for new investors. There has been COVID-19 this year, which is creating a lot of issues for companies. So do you think that next year uh, we might see a different approach on the market where we will, we will, we will really see banks starting to actually acquire uh, fintechs out there for a very cheap price? Do you think that's a possible trend? Maybe we can ask uh, Max from Afaisen or M. Pavel from Malio. Uh, I don't think so that um, banks will um, buy the they use the opportunity to, to buy so someone cheap because if someone is cheap that means the solution is not ready to the to the market the revenue model is not uh, not not accepted by the market so uh, I think the this year the COVID nineteen is a uh, is kind some kind of uh, Check line, uh, and um, many businesses will be uh, will be uh, elev evaluated by the by the market if they survive or not. So th this is this is the the point uh, the point the point of truth for the their businesses. Okay, and do you think fintech will survive COVID? Most, I think most of them will survive. <laughs> All right, that, that's a strong statement. A, has anybody a different opinion on that? All right, so... Um, yeah, I, maybe I could add something to, to this question. Uh, in terms of surviving, it, it's going to be hard to just point out who is going to survive and who is going to not survive. But uh, what I'm seeing, and, and probably next year we'll give a lot of answers to the, to the, the questions that you have asked here in terms of sustainability it's for fintechs. Uh, but they, what we are seeing and uh, what we are sensing from the market is that they are reducing a lot their costs. And when you are reducing a lot of your costs in terms of uh, what a fintech uh, business model is looking like, uh, probably it would be harder for you to regain the power that you had before um, by finding finance in the market because the financing level from VCs have dropped dramatically this year in terms of financing fintechs and finance, financing a lot of innovation startups due to COVID pandemic and uh, not because they don't have the money. I mean, uh, there's a lot of money that is standing, just standing in the market, but I think it's a period that everybody is waiting to see what's going to happen after the medical crisis in terms of COVID. So they are going to survive, but they are going to need a lot of time to recover from this, let's say, uh, pandemic crisis that hit. But I'm not, I'm not yeah. as the colleagues, as I'm not seeing banks just going out there uh, in a shopping, uh, uh, in a shopping strategy to buy fintechs for a lower price to integrate them in the banks. Although, um, although I mean, if I may, um, you know, the rates at which banks are cr closing physical branches, um, and it's a global trend, um, you know, they might have uh, this massive reliance um, on fintechs going forward. We know what the, the COVID has done from a digital acceleration perspective. Um, of the millions of people who are now for the first time ever um, turning towards digital uh, payment products. Um, and uh, if they're closing branches like they, they aim to do and cost savings that the banks are doing in their physical branch infrastructure, they are going to desperately need some of this innovation that fintechs offer to, to remain relevant. So here we have two different opinions. So that's very interesting. So uh, maybe but, we we are we are losing we are we are using the the external solutions, especially tech solutions, but uh, we are not. Uh, sometimes we are not able to to buy it or to invest it. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, as you said, uh, situation that we use uh, 
for example, in Poland, Booksy, there is a startup for uh, for for booking uh, visits in in our branches uh, to avoid the queue and uh, avoid the, the, the other people uh, in, in pandemia time. So we are using a lot of uh, external solutions, but but we are not, we are not the strategy is not buy, buying uh, them. In general, we have uh, at our bank you have VC VC RBL VC fund. We are we are an, an investor in few in few startups, but the uh, the the goal is to get not more to twenty percent of the of the assets. So so we we are uh, our our strategy to uh, help uh, startups to to support them to make them uh, make them uh, at a huge scale but we are not uh, there is there is no plan to to take uh, the control of them and and why not why wouldn't you like to acquire this amazing technology if they help you on a day to day business S -s -s uh, sometimes it, it, it's a matter of of the we can uh, by by buying them, we can uh, kill them, uh, to, to be <laughs> precise, because if they are two uh, two hours, they are hours. They they, they looks like earlier. The uh, some other comp competitors, some bank competitors, uh, they don't want to cooperate with them because we are in general we are in the highly. Uh, Bank uh, Poland is is a special market. There is a lot of banks. Uh, the com competition is very very high. So uh, if we have some uh, startup, some solution, and we are uh, owner of this startup, other banks don't doesn't want to cooperate with with that kind of startup. So so th this is this is the best solution for for the Polish reality. Yeah, but let's pretend tomorrow, hypothetically, a revolute doesn't cost 10 billion, but 1 billion, because they didn't secure the investors. Wouldn't that be a good opportunity for a group like Allior or Afaisen that are with us today, or any bank in Europe? You think so? Uh, in that case, uh, there is other, other rule, the money rules. So I, I can change this, this opinion in, in, uh, with this price. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's exactly, exactly. That's that's exactly what I meant. So uh, mm -hmm. I have a question for for you all. There, there's been a lot of hypes, you know, around fintechs, their technology. Uh, we can see that right now there are big questions regarding their sustainability and either they are able to monetize their customer base. Uh, on on the other side, around the world, there are big changes. Uh, Bitcoin is about to uh, go to its all-time high, about twenty thousand dollar. Uh, the, the world of cryptocurrencies is exploding, which is going to create a lot of uh, new fintech opportunity. Last week, PayPal decided to introduce for their customers globally the ability to buy Bitcoins. Uh, we know that Bitcoins is not something that bankers really like because it's out of the control. It's not part of the central banking monetary system. But on the other side, the central bankers are now creating digital currencies. So as any one of you thoughts uh, on this uh, basically you know cryptocurrencies opportunities because this is going to revolutionize the market do you think that might be a good opportunity for the fintech industry to create even more hype in the future because remember like let's remember that cash is king that's what bank has but not the fintech but right now there will be opportunities with cryptocurrencies uh, if i may um... <clears throat> I'd like to distinguish between cryptocurrencies and digital assets. Uh, so cryptocurrencies, as you just mentioned, as Bitcoin, etc. There we have uh, definitely as an incumbent bank uh, that needs to obey to compliance and regulatory rules. Uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, some open questions to be resolved before we can offer that uh, to our clients. But on the other hand, if we have digital assets and be it tokenized debt, equity, or even cash, so in terms of stable coins, etc. Uh, we in Reifers and we very much believe that this uh, is something that we not only need to look into, but that we also want to actively drive. And as such, uh, uh, we have already established our internal proof of concept when it comes to a Euro-backed stablecoin. We call it RBI coin. 
because uh, we see this also as a deficiency case for intercompany uh, and intercorporate interinstitutional settlement processes. And uh, here, I think uh, somebody might ask, uh, why don't you wait for a CBDC from the ECB issue? Uh, but uh, given the fact that we're also operating in a lot of countries outside of the European and, and such, as such outside of the CEPA area, we consider tokens uh, as a, a very good means uh, to achieve real-time payments, to achieve cost efficiency, etc. Uh, in addition, on the retail side, I believe uh, this really can uh, change uh, very much the uh, investment model that we can offer to our clients. It democratizes it. Uh, it uh, offers a different uh, approach when it comes to risk diversification, etc. So I'm a strong believer into that. Uh, and um, at least for our side, for RBI, we can say we are actively looking into that. Yeah, definitely. That's the next generation. Any other opinion on this topic? Yeah, so if I may, um, as GMD um, has uh, its, its uh, pedigree comes out of um, out of cash uh, manufacturing and, and printing and having worked with central banks around the world for many years. Um, I think the, the CBDC topic um, is going to become very relevant in the future. Um, and it's really a question of uh, do the, the Bitcoin type uh, or stablecoin type um, solutions uh, get moved to the, the periphery of um, international trade? Um, or do CBDC become uh, um, central digital current, central bank digital currencies become interchangeable in the same way um, as I can take my physical cash, my dollars or euros, um, go to an exchange and change them for another currency? Um, does it does it have more legitimacy than um, a blockchain uh, Bitcoin? Yeah. So that's the question for the future. It's, it's a definitely a big question that a lot of people are arguing on a daily basis. So we are going to run out of time. So I have a question for all of you and that you can answer one by one very quick, just by yes or no. Once Warren Buffett said, be fearful when the others are greedy and be greedy when the others are fearful. So what do you think? Because everybody has been greedy about people. Sorry, I, I have a, a, a huge uh, problem to understand the question because there is an echo. Okay. Um, maybe it's only maybe it's only me, but I think it's. We are all, oh, you all are Yes. Okay, so I will ask again. We hear you, we hear your double double voice like a double voice. Is it better now? It's very uh, yes. Or not a little good. bit. All right. So I said once, but Warren Buffett said, be fearful when the others are greedy and be greedy when the others are fearful. So should we be greedy or fearful of fintech? So I will let you all answer about that and then we'll close the panel because we're running out of time. So you can start, Max, because you're the first one. If it's to choose between greedy and fearful, uh, then I would definitely take greedy. Same for me. All right. <laughs> then. I think, I, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, if Warren Buffett will trade fintech uh, on Toro, maybe I will copy his moves. <laughs> that did. If, if it was up to me, I think that now the environment is fearful, so we should be greedy. All right. Basically, then we have Pavel. Uh, I'm voting for greedy. <laughs> greedy, Thomas. Greedy. And Stephen, last word. I think we have uh, consensus. Greedy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thank you so much for uh, your added value during the, this panel. We, there was many of us this afternoon, so thank you so much once again, and I wish you an excellent afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, you. thank Bye. you. Good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles, and all the panelists to a br for a brilliant panel. Thank you very much.
And I also invite you, because I see we have some questions remained in our chat, so please continue the conversation in the FinTech cooperation networking area. And now we will have the FinTech pitches session. So if you're interested to cooperate with FinTech, so this is your panel, I invite you to watch. So we have now uh, five, six FinTechs ready to pitch for you. And let me announce the first one, Oscar Demir Pisano. You're welcome. Do you have Oscar? Oscar? Yeah, I'm here. Hello, hello, you're welcome on the stage. Yeah. Um, there we go. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Oskan. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Pisano. Today, banks engage with their customers throughout a long and complicated journey, where there are a lot of touch points, products and channels such as their branches, social media, online banking, mobile banking, website and contact centers. Since all of these products and channels are owned by different parties in the bank, there are various tools and methodologies used to manage the experience of the same customer. Pisano platform itself is also built with the feedback of our customers. Its capability starts with listening and understanding the experience of the customer, but also scales with the growing requirements of the banks like live chat, chatbot, text analytics, and single sign-on. The whole Pisano service is provided with a team around the world uh, via our head office in London and other offices in Dubai, Singapore, and Istanbul. We do have more than 100 customers in more than 30 countries, and we have never failed in any of our projects where we do have 100% implementation rate. One of those successful customers is Raiffeisen Bank International. Raiffeisen Bank International, operating in 13 countries in the CE region, had various programs and technologies for customer experience management. They needed a unified approach for their customer experience management. After our agreement with the Raiffeisen Bank International, we collect real-time customer feedback at more than 100 touch points for their SME customers, all in the same channel, all in real time. After collecting the feedback, we notify the relevant relationship manager, contact center, or branch staff to resolve the customer request on the spot. We also route all of the customer feedback collected to agile teams to make sure that each improvement they introduce is based on and verified by the customer. For those over 100 business, they prefer to work with Pisano for our Born Omnichannel platform, our regional and industrial expertise, our pay-as-you-go business model, and fast and easy integration process. We're looking forward to meeting you all, and um, thank you very much for your uh, time today. I'm more than happy to take your questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oskan. My question to you is, so the rest of your customers are your direct customers, or you cooperate with another banks as well? And what are your targeted regions as well? Uh, so that's a good question, Alina. Uh, basically, we do have ten, like around 10 uh, banking customers, uh, mainly focused on CE region uh, and Middle East. So those are our core markets. Mm -hmm. So we target CE region, Balkans, CIS, and Middle East, and we work with tens of banks all around the world. Uh, we don't only target SME banking, we work with retail banking and business banking too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So we don't have questions for you from our attendees, and I am announcing once again, so uh, you're welcome to participate in our FinTech Cooperation Networking Area. and type and ask direct questions here. So thank you, Orskan, and let me invite the next, uh, the next FinTech. Thank you. So uh, the next person I would like to invite is Yaroslav Dubov, Ninja Lender. Yaroslav, you're welcome. Hello.
Hi, my name is Miroslav. I am CEO and founder in Ninja Lander. We built a bit of marketplace that gives a new chance for rejected loans. Why is this important and how did we get here? First, because 87% of all loan applications in the world are rejected. Just imagine you can go to a bank five times and only once you will get a positive decision. And behind these numbers are real people and real stories, like Adam who needed to take a loan so he could buy a new car and say yes to his dream job, or Camilo who was requesting financing to start her own business. For these two and many others who got no from their banks, it means they are not able to realize their dreams <coughs> and goals in life. Moreover, during COVID, it's often about how to survive the crisis. Every year, more than a billion loan applications from individuals and enterprises stay unfinanced. And we believe the story does not end to end here. Because the reality is that some people and companies got rejected only because of the inefficiency of algorithms, risk models, and scoring systems. That's why 20% of rejected loans are given out to borrowers by other lenders later on, which means this 20% have value and should not be wasted. In 2019, we graduated from the FinTech Acceleration Program by Startup Wise Guys and Swedbank in Riga. And we built a B2B platform to help credit institutions reduce the wastage of loan applications by matching rejected borrowers with other credit providers. With Ninja Lander, banks, lending companies, and peer-to-peer -peer credit platforms will reduce customer acquisition costs, <coughs> get verified leads, and increase customer loyalty. All of them can use Ninja Lender to buy and sell any type of rejected loan application. They just need to ask for permission and send data to our platform via API. And we will search for another credit provider that can offer a loan. So basically it works as a brokerage system based on pink tree technology that gathers and distributes rejected applications. Our business model is based on transaction fees. We take 20% brokerage of application data fee for issued loans. Also, credit institutions can buy a license for our platform and use it to partner with other players in the market in the way they want to do it. We are a team of six and we have a broad experience in fintech. Together we built microfund commercial software used by lending companies in Ukraine with a million clients in total. This year we graduated from the Poland Prize program powered by Houston in Warsaw. We adopted our platform for the Polish market, signed NDAs with banks, and have made integrations with a few leading companies. So we are looking for cooperation now, and I will be happy to discuss any opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Yaroslav. And uh, my question to you is, do you have already some cooperations with the banks for the rejected, for the financing of rejected SMEs? Actually, this was the topic which we discussed with Swedbank mm -hmm. in, um, <clears throat> in Riga. So uh, actually discuss the pilot with Swedbank and because of different circumstances, we postponed this pilot. So I think this is the main opportunity for our platform to help banks with their rejected loans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And which countries or regions do you target? Can you operate everywhere? Uh, we are target right now Poland. Okay. Also, we have good connections to the Baltic banks. Uh, so, but because of COVID, it's, it's it's really difficult to travel now. So I think until the end of the year, we will be here. Also, we got selected for the Nordic Fast Track program in Copenhagen. So I have a chance to talk with Danish banks. So mm -hmm. let's see. Okay. Thank you very much, Yaroslav, and good luck. Thank you, Thank and you. let me invite the next fintech here on the stage, uh, Cosmin Cosma, Finquare. You're welcome. Hello. Hello, hello. So, everybody heard about open banking and PSD2 also. At Finquare, we address the problem of lack of standards of the PSD2 APIs. We help banks and fintechs to consume the data and innovate on top. We are a fintech based in Romania and focused on Central and Eastern Europe. We already have a track record. Uh, for example, in Croatia, 
uh, we uh, connected for the first time the, in production the APIs of local banks. And also lately, we launched with Banca Transilvania, also present, uh, present here at the event, the Romanian biggest bank, the first multi-banking feature in its local market. Let me tell you a bit about open banking. Although an uncontested megatrend, open banking is still at its, at its prehistory. It started with a compliance trigger. The banks were forced by EU regulation to open their data infrastructures. Now, in CE, we are in the early data consumption stage, but most of the roads to value are still untapped. And the real momentum will start when we will progress to the next stage, which is from data to information. This means using data to have meaningful value creation use cases. But since we are at the SME banking event, let's have in mind the most important hero uh, for today, it is the SME owner. With his daily struggle to get order in the chaos of his small or medium enterprise. At Finkware, we believe that putting open banking at work, we can do his life a little bit more light and simpler. If you are a bank or a fintech and want to create innovative uh, services for SMEs based on open banking, we can be your innovation partner. Why us? Because we already have hands-on experience, a proven technology, and focus on the CE region. We combine our experience as ex-bankers and the senior technology experts to move innovation from lab to market. We are proudly alumni of important acceleration programs. Uh, also, you heard about Innovix here in the event, and already have a recognition from European Commission on our uh, innovation potential. So let's start collaboration to put open banking at work for the benefit of the SMEs. Thank you, thank you, Cosmin. Uh, I have one question here in the chat uh, for you. Why don't you uh, target the Africa market? Why only the CE region? We have some participants uh, here. No, we get some discussions with uh, some other markets uh, in, the, in the global market. So, for example, we were uh, invited in Bahrain uh, to uh, put our know-how uh, for the open banking implementation in the island, island of Bahrain. But still, uh, we, need, we want right now to, to focus a bit on our home market, which is uh, the Central and Eastern Europe uh, uh, part of, uh, of the world. And uh, after we, we get our stronghold here, we think of uh, uh, worldwide domination. So Africa waits for us some more years. Hopefully we'll come. OK, OK. Thank you very much and good luck. Let me invite the next uh, fintech here on the stage. Charis Stengers. Bam. Charis, you are here. Hello. First of all, we see uh, I am Kai, the founder and CEO of BAM. I'm uh, really honored to have you in this uh, event of, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, SME because I think there's a lot of tough value. I'm going to Accenture, the banking industry, there is one point of a few trillion of, uh, of uh, not in the European European banks, according to Bloomberg. So what we are trying to do is to help bankers get rid of those assets. They have already, we are not here to the way. So we, the banks have already done a lot of work, but we are here to provide our uh, unique solution, which is how we can help banks invest their assets faster than ever, while we are engaged uh, state customers to buy properties online efficiently and securely. And to see this kind of um, uh, COVID situation, this is coming more relevant. Uh, as you see here, the total addressable market is not just in, uh, in, uh, in Central Eastern Europe, so it is uh, 450 billion. And according to Bloomberg, the CEO of uh, real estate owned is 180 billion. So there is a market that. Sorry. And there is also a, a combined annual growth rate, 1.1% year over year. So we are here because we would like to make the competition is irrelevant. What we want to do is create one stop shop. So 
So we want to be the Amazon of real estate transactions of mining assets. At the moment, the marketplace is not now. We have some technologies like AI, blockchain, and 3D scanning. We we help the customer better engage with the with the bank, and we make sure that we facilitate the whole transaction. We are this kind of end-to-end -end, uh, kind of uh, facilitator. We accelerate it, but the most prestigious accelerator in Romania, that's a then, and not a big accelerator. We back by Gapminder and the kind of Gapminder, and we are two years in a row uh, in partner with Microsoft for Delta. The team uh, is five people full time. We have uh, the great technical experience, not just in industry, in banking industry, but also in real estate industry. Uh, we have focus to digitalize and democratize the real estate transaction of mining assets, and we want to become the partner of one when it comes to real estate only. As I said, one of the main objectives is to spread not just for us to become to grow, but also to be SMEs indirectly by creating more jobs and uh, growing the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Terry. So, uh, my question to you: Do you have the projects already with the bank, and also which regions do you target? Uh, we, we target uh, Central Eastern Europe. Uh, at the moment, we have already uh, we are about plant in uh, Romania and in Greece, uh, mm -hmm. and then we will move uh, kind of uh, in Portugal and uh, this kind of uh, country in Mediterranean, and then moving back to the Poland and other markets. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charis. And let thank me invite you. let me invite the next fintech, Gordana Mrkovic, Lunar Tech. Hello, everyone. Are you hearing me? Hello. Yes. Well, uh, hello once again. I'm very glad to be here and have an opportunity to talk about the solution we are start developing and as our part of our project portfolio. We are a young company from Croatia. We gave ourselves tasks to bring the mobile services to every one company at Croatia, small, micro, small and serious company. And following the analyst prediction and worldwide analyst prediction and recognizing the mobile technology and the digital payment technology and the most important technologies of future, near future, we start developing our own, own, own omnipen, omni-channel payment portfolio. We would send and selling to our customers. Sorry, my interclick on, on phone are not working, so I will go here further. Uh, how we imagine Lunartic? It is defined to be though between bank and merchant and their customers. It is designed to be fulfilled by the merchants and customers and to be read by everyone who is required to do it. The, this Air eye hiring solution is also designed to be simple, to be secure, and to be safe. And it is designed to save your time and your money. Because of automation, reporting, management, everything is included in the solution. And finally, it is designed to improve your customer's satisfaction. Hello. We have prepared Imagine short video, a situation when a client comes into and a bank to and approaches the counter friend. complaining about unjustifiably charged transaction made a few weeks ago. In order to help your client, you just open our application, which has access to all the receipts and all the post tickets issued from all the post terminals connected to your bank. On the first screen, you choose option traffic in order to search all the past daily traffic records. Next, you collect the details from the client and then... Sorry, but I have need to interrupt based on the time we have here. I interrupted the demo just to show you the case numbers because the 
Lunar tech solution will cut down the manipulation time for more than 90%, the operational cost for more than 50%, and the administration and logistics for more than 50%. Why you choose Lunatech instead to do with by yourselves is because you will be fast faster to the market with us, you will have low investment cost and you will cut down the compliance operational cost. We will be glad to let us know if you have some interest in about our solution. And in that case please Give some notes on the mail listed below. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gordana. And uh, as you exceeded the time of the pitch, so I invite everybody to ask questions to Gordana in the networking area. And now let me invite our last fintech uh, for today, Manrui Tank Untangled. Hello, Manrui. You are welcome. Oh, hello. I um, haven't seen my Okay. What? Hi, everyone. A huge SME funding gap at $1.5 billion globally on the Eastern Development Bank. This gap is widened and made it worse by the pandemic. Many SMEs are struggling to repay the loans. And from, from the investor side, we are in a low interest rate environment. Investors are looking to invest in higher yields, alternative asset classes. However, capital finds it very difficult to reach the alternative asset classes because it's very, very complex, involving lots of parties. It's very expensive, especially for portfolios under 100 million euros. It is not transparent. One of the lessons of 2008 of global financial crisis is the lack of nexus between growth and underlying asset. I'm a co-founder of Antenna Finance, an alternative credit investment platform that uses blockchain and legal automation and advanced analytics to securitization and a green bond insurance. We made the process cheaper, simpler, and more transparent. And in terms of how it works, um, I would like to zoom into SME financing. We're working with um, experts originated such as medium-sized corporates with a portfolio of trade receivables also our SME lender. We digitized the end-to-end -end securitization process transfer assets to the structuring of the pool, securitize the pool, and no insurance. We work with transaction advisors via API based and real time and the data. Now, in a, in a, in a like, traditional securitization, legal costs represent a very large percentage of the total transaction costs. We standardize legal documentation. So originators only, to, only need to answer a few questionnaires in order to draft a transaction document. Our portfolio analytics allow node investors to monitor performance on a real-time basis and node holders can track to individual loans or trade receivables in terms of their performance regardless of how many times the new holders How it benefits you? Absolutely, obviously, the same cost is the And as a cost saving, we reduce the required from a million euros to 10 million euros or even less. We also make the process faster, more secure, and more transparent. Something about us, Antango is an offshoot of Binkabi, a blockchain-based supply chain financing um, origination platform. Our technology is currently being used by international banks and commodity exchanges. Antango have been elected to UK Financial Conduct Authority digital sandbox for innovative solution. I am looking forward to uh, partnerships with lenders, as our resources, and of course investors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manrui. And uh, as we are run out of the time, so I also invite to network and uh, ask uh, and answer the questions into the networking zone. And now let me invite our last but not least speaker with the presentation today, uh, Neil Hopcroft, Director of the Customer Success Europe at Forum uh, 3, with the presentation on the digitalization of banking and payments. You're welcome. Hello. Hello, Neil. We don't hear you. Can you turn on your microphone, please? Is that better? Yes. Perfect. Classic. Sorry. Thank you. Last but not least. So, um, yeah, thanks for putting on the great event. Um, apologies for the slightly uh, husky voice, but um, I've got a cold somehow. 
even though I haven't been outside for a couple of weeks. But, um, but anyway, um, welcome to my, my home. Um, it's been great seeing people taking over these weird times. Um, my art's often criticised, but there's no building outside, kids aren't at home, so hopefully we'll have some peace and quiet. <clears throat> I'm also very aware that at this time of the conference, um, usually everyone would want to be going to the bar, getting a drink and some pebbles, so get yourself in a comfortable chair, maybe have something a bit more exciting than a glass of water, and uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation. Um, so I'm Neil, I'm Neil Hopcroft. Um, most people call me Hop. Um, so, you know, feel free to bombard us in the Q&A um, later on. Um, we're really, really excited to begin our journey in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, we're established in the UK and, and uh, Western Europe. Um, so I'm really excited to share our career with you um, and hopefully get lots of questions and feedback. Just waiting for the flicker. There we go. So, um, the European Union, um, one of the most attractive markets in the world um, for a business to set up in. It's large, credible legal structure, developed economies, educated population. Um, but for SMEs to function efficiently, they must have access to good banking products. Uh, but where does that all begin? It all begins with trust, that thing you can't smell, you can't see it, you can't touch it, but it's so important and it guides all of our decisions. Um, and as a payments company, you need to trust that your money is safe, that your payment will arrive at its destination on time and for the right amount. Um, but we need to peel this back a little bit and see how difficult and complex it is for your bank to manage this from a payment perspective. So the first pillar of payments is usually um, a domestic clearinghouse. So um, in the UK, it could be payments. In Germany, it could be the Bundesbank. In Holland, it could be Equins. But many moons ago, before SEPA wasn't even a concept, there'd usually be a central clearinghouse where all banks could interact and settle their money with. And they still exist today, but they're really important. But then in 2008, um, the uh, SEPA, European Bank area, launched SEPA credit transfer which enabled bank-to-bank -bank payments across borders within the SEPA zone, um, usually on a time lag of, of a day or so, depending on, the, depending on the institution. In 2009, SEPA direct debits were dropped in, um, and we can already see that those two systems are already 12 years old. So um, to give you an idea of how old that is, um, that was the second generation of iPhone. Um, so we're talking about before 3G with that funny little E on your screen. Um, you know, technology was completely different to the way it is now. Cloud was really you know, a thing um, for many companies. Then in 2017, which was just three years ago, um, for instance, um, it was piggybacking or trying to copy other schemes around the world with instant transfers. So that's an end-to-end -end bank transfer in under 10 seconds, usually. Um, and then on top of this, a bank would usually also have a thrift infrastructure, and that's the corresponding banking network between other banks that they need to manage liquidity with and send messages with. So already, we've got your national infrastructure, we've got three separate schemes, we've got swift connectivity, and if you're in any other markets, it just adds and adds and adds. And all of these ecosystems have different messaging formats, they, um, they have different times for the payments, different costs, and um, they have different um, kind of, uh, software uh, systems that they run on. So it's all very, very old, other than the instant schemes, which are, are quite new. Um, and it's, it can be quite antiquated to, to connect to. And this is all just the technical requirements of um, connecting to the scheme. This is nothing to do with the requirements of a modern, a modern business. So, in addition to the technical requirements, oh, just need to move my click around. Okay, that we have regulatory times as well, and this is often uh, the guiding force um, that banks have to respond to. 
So originally, separation was uh, an optional scheme, but it's likely to be a mandatory one from 2021. TIPS will be made a hard requirement for banks to manage as well. I say 2022 is another project that banks had to, um, to, to implement as well in the coming years. We've got requests to pay coming from a product side, which aims to replace a lot of cash transactions um, and direct debits. Um, and then you've also got the modernization of the bank itself. So um, they want to focus on uh, who they're servicing. Are they staying relevant? Um, what products are they going to offer in the future? All of this I've been talking about is just the basics of processing payments. How can they um, allocate their scarce resources to focus on the things that they give out and leverage their intellectual property? And all of this has to happen at as little cost as possible. Um, because payments, um, most people don't expect to pay for in most markets. So when I'm sending a transaction, I just expect the bank to do it. I don't expect them to charge me much, if at all, to make that transfer happen. So it's not really um, a value-added service that the bank can offer. It's just expected. <clears throat> so as you can see, payment is super complicated. And um, a couple of these quotes here, the banks have 15 full-time employees per team just handling payment exceptions and auditees uh, of, of what might happen with a payment. Um, there's no transparency at the moment over the payment or its cost. So you can see here um, another quote from Forrester, on average B2B businesses spend 16 to 20% of the payment value to recover the payment. So often they can spend in excess of a million dollars on this. Um, just chasing over 100 million pound of revenue. Um, and finally, um, they often have to manage all that. This is they manage multiple, multiple connections, but sometimes they have multiple brands that all go into that same scheme on the same rails. So often we hear stories of retired employees coming back to look under a black box and see what's wrong with the payment. They have no idea what's going on because these systems were, were designed uh, 20 or 30 years ago at times. <clears throat> so we can conclude from this so I'm just going to have some water, that payments are complicated, but they're also absolutely, absolutely critical. Okay. Uh, bank not being able to send payment is like, um, like an airport with no runways. It can't operate. Um, but also on top of that, payment, payments are binary. Uh, they happen or they don't. And this is a result of this, that they're highly commoditizable. Um, so, as I said, you're not adding any intellectual property or uniqueness by, by the mechanics of sending the payment. So, banks are now getting into that mindset of, of outsourcing these functions. Because if someone can do it on a one to many basis, then um, it's surely going to be cheaper and more cost effective. So, the future of banking is composable by design. Um, and one of my partners, Nandu, um, is a big advocate of this. So who can you get this best to breed um, enabled, to, enable, to enable your bank to um, uh, operate efficiently, build great use cases, and, um, and have better outcomes? So form three, pop into this mix. And we're like the foundations of your house. You never see us. You never see the fancy bifold doors or the windows or the roof. But they are foundations that underpin all of the, the payment rails and clearing and testing. So we provide financial institutions with better, more cost-effective and stable payment experiences. Um, <clears throat> and, and this is huge. We don't just do it for one scheme. We do it for the many schemes, as I, as I, as I mentioned. Um, and, uh, and the platform that we have is completely designed for, for the cloud. So it runs on 24 by 7 by 365. We have a fully managed ops team to look after this. Um, all payments running in and out of the platform. We can deploy code on a daily basis, um, which continually enhances the product set um, and also means there's no downtime. So you don't get those horrible news issues of you, know, you can't send payments over this weekend window. Um, and it makes us um, infinitely scalable, infinitely deployable. Um, and um, always on for a while of instant payments. So if I give you 
um, a few examples of um, some of the types of exercises we run. Um, we recently were involved, or are involved, um, in delivering the new payments platform for Lloyd's Bank, who are one of the largest banks in, in the UK. And that's then becoming digital at their core. And so that means, and I quote their, their CEO, um, this is simplifying their payments architecture while enhancing security and performance. Um, and that's crucial for the digitalization of their group. Um, so this is um, us being the core infrastructure of a re-platform exercise of a tier one, tier two bank. Um, the next example with N26, who um, is one of the fastest money bank financial banks in Europe. Um, they wanted to have full autonomy over their separate internet connection, um, so they used us to connect into RT1. So um, that's an example of a new product um, that they couldn't access in Germany, and they wanted to take ownership of that payment rail and for us to manage that for them. <clears throat> I think this is a really um, good example of how FinTech can collab collaborate together. Um, basically, this leverage is a partnership we have with Barclays Bank um, across Europe, and um, they have um, their assets and their liquidity, which sponsors another FinTech to send payments directly into a, a payment scheme. So we've partnered with Barclays and a company called Prepaid Solutions, who are um, a banking and issuing platform which helps the likes of Moneys and Yelp uh, and Klarna and many others. Um, and we supply all of those fintechs under their umbrella with instant payments um, uh, through our platform. Um, this really outlines how we're not just a banking platform, but a platform for all FIs. So one of our key mission statements is we democratize payments for all of the participants in the second zone. And this is super critical because APC had their retail payment report last week, and they are following the footsteps of another a number of other regulators, whereby they feel that banks shouldn't just have the best payment world, and it should be accessible for everyone. So they're now thinking about allowing e-moneys and PI licenses to be able to access infrastructure to make the landscape more competitive um, and to be able to have the same quality of infrastructure as banks do as well. But also we're enabling banks to better service their fintechs. So it's a real um, collaborative environment to be able to um, democratize and have access to payments across lots of different markets. Um, the final example is um, us helping LH3 Bank, they're an Estonian bank, enter the UK market. So um, they leverage our expertise locally um, in order to be able to service their, um, their customers. And we have an entity banking service um, um, in order to, to use both of our assets again to, to have better outcomes. So to sum up, um, Form 3 are helping financial institutions to tackle replatforming. Uh, take advantage of cloud making technology and deliver, deliver better payment experiences for all of our own customers. Um, we do that via a unified API, so the same API gives for lots of different payment schemes. We harmonize all the messaging format across those payment schemes, which is ISO 2022 compliant. And we have lots of microservices which uh, go into to make up the riches of the platform. So whether that's IBAN generation, um, whether that's um, taking breakfast to a scheme of that's uh, checking of certain types of payments. Um, it's all in the microservice and the, the quality of the platform. Um, it's absolutely future by design. So as I mentioned, it's cloud native. We're across um, three Amazon data centers. So we have a, a, an infinitely scaled proposition. So for instance, if a bank is scaling in 27 years, they have to expand their physical systems. It automatically happens through our tech. Um, so I think that's... Uh, that's it. Um, I want to thank you all again for, for staying until the end, um, five o'clock on a, on a Wednesday. So um, I hope there's lots of questions. Um, if you want to ask them offline, please feel free to get in touch uh, via the email. And we're, as I say, really excited to, to enter the market. Thank you, Neil. Thank you for your presentation. And I have one question to you. So sure. when uh, uh, will the instant payments available here in, in Europe, which is very crucial for the SMEs, how do you see this? Where this is going to happen? And it is, is this more a question of the technology or legislation? Uh, I think it's both. 
Um, technology is crucial because banking assets traditionally haven't enabled that instant um, relay of messaging of transactions. So often you have to send your message to a bank, but the timestamp starts from the initial sending of the payment. Whereas often that bank has then relayed the message to the scheme, which has to relay the message to the end customer. So having a new technology on oral is often very prohibitive of actually getting the SLA of that instant payment. So what we're helping banks to do is to realize that by sending those messages throughout, throughout text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for your answer. So we are finished actually our panels and presentations for today. And I invite to join us in several minutes for the CEE SME Banking Awards. Thank you and stay with us. autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are.
This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are.
this autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digitalization of financial services for SMEs. On 25th of November we are organizing an online stream of this year's CE SME Bank Club conference. We will meet with more than 30 speakers on the stage here in Poland and broadcast the event live. Also, we will award the best solutions for the SME customers. So stay safe this autumn and join us online from wherever you are. Welcome back and welcome to the CE SME Banking Club Awards ceremony. So this year we decided to honor the best banks and fintechs that implemented the best digital solutions for the SME customers here in the Central Eastern Europe region. So we divided uh, the awards for the five categories that are based on the, our studies and rankings that we produced at SME Banking Club this year. And let me uh, start with the first category for the best online banking for SMEs. So uh, we um, defined the winner based on our study that we produced this year. And we uh, had analyzed 90 criteria. Uh, for the online banking. Um, so we analyzed the functionality of the solutions that banks are provided here in the region. And we, so these are the banks that took part in, the, in our study. And uh, we um, grouped the parameters into the several modules and weighted the, each of them by the importance that SMEs are acknowledging for each of their parameters. For example, let me name some, some of them. So we have online uh, onboarding module, a set of the parameters for then for the account, accounts, then for the local currency transfers, transfers in the foreign currency, possibility to apply for a loan online, uh, and uh, implementations of the different value added services, etc. And we uh, um, put some weights, as I mentioned, based on the importance as SMEs are considering that, for example, transfers in the local currency are important for 100 customers, and for example, access to the accounts of to the history and to the statements uh, of the um, of the accounts in local and foreign currency is also important for the 100 uh, SME customers. So that's why these modules were weighted by the score of 100. And for example, if we go to the modules of the transfers in foreign currency and uh, foreign currency exchange, so these concerns uh, and this uh, 27% of the SME customers' concerns as important. So, and based on uh, these uh, weights, and I will say also additional that we will publish tomorrow the ranking on our website, and uh, today you can down download the short uh, studies, uh, all our studies, including the online banking studies, to have the idea uh, how we analyzed and uh, what was the criteria in the very detail. So you can download it today on our exhibition slot here on the conference website. And the full study is available for our SME Banking Club members. So uh, having done this, so we have uh, the ranking of the banks the following way and the winner and the first place goes to the ING Bank in Poland for the solution ING Business which is the online banking for SMEs and mid-corporate customers. And just to mention, one of the latest innovations that was implemented uh, with this solution is that the, in July uh, this year, uh, it was implemented that the companies, so legal entities, not only private entrepreneurs, can uh, um, open the current account fully online and with uh, usage of the selfie as, as the identification of the customer. So, 
ING Business, ING Bank Shlonsky, and I would like to invite here to receive this award Adam Valenjevsky, Global uh, SME and Mid Corporate uh, Digital Platform Tribe Lead at ING Bank Shlonsky. Adam, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for this wonderful um, prize and uh, for the second year in the row. So basically, I'm very, very happy uh, that I enjoy business solutions uh, for SME Mid Corporate Area is identified uh, as a, a best solution for uh, uh, for SME uh, customers in CEE uh, region. This year uh, is really, really, um, uh, I think, important for us regarding digitization and digitalization approach that we that we took for the for last couple of years. I think that looking from perspective of our customers, we are delivering our results and our expectations for our customers. And what Olena mentions, um, SME uh, customers have possibilities to uh, identify themselves via selfie in order to open accounts in us. This is our latest achievements, but we didn't say the last word. This isn't our last word, and we're going still to focus on our customers and deliver the best solutions in CE region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam, and congratulations once again, and looking forward for the next innovative solutions from your side. Thank you. For sure, thank you. Okay, the next category the best mobile banking for SME customers. And uh, we also analyzed 90 parameters here and 20 mobile applications actually uh, fulfilled and were covered by our study and uh, were um, listed in the ranking because uh, uh, still now for the SME customers, online banking is uh, the primary digital channel that customers are using. So mobile banking is the secondary one. Is the secondary one. So 90 parameters were analyzed. The modules uh, are the same as for the online banking. So uh, I will name them uh, all now. So this is online uh, fully digital onboarding processes, uh, accounts, uh, payments in the local currencies, payments in the foreign currencies, deposits, lending products, um, uh, cards, and also availability of the value-added services in the mobile banking and, and other services. So we waited also this for the importance that SME customers um, mentioned, so which services are important for them to have in digital channels. And the first place also goes here to the ING Bank Shlonsky in Poland for the solution Moje ING, which is the mobile banking for the private entrepreneurs and for the private individuals, but we uh, appraising and analyzed uh, as a uh, best mobile application for the private entrepreneurs. And let me invite here on the stage to receive uh, this uh, award. Uh, Wojciech Widenka, Head of Entrepreneurs, Tribe Lead at ING Bank Shlonsky. Hello, good, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for such positive evaluation of our mobile banking applications. As you said, our self-employed clients uh, use the system which is developed for both individual clients and micro-entrepreneurs and brings, uh, it, it brings the necessity of creating somehow all functionalities in a very simple way. And, and we focus on those ones which are crucial for daily, base, daily basis financing. So it is it's great to hear that our solution is so good comparing to, to the others. So I hope that, that we will keep it and, and then maybe next year all also will be as fit as, as today. Thank you very much, Wojciech, and congratulations once again. And also looking forward to the next innovations from your side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and the next category that uh, I will announce is the digital SME lending solution, the best one in the CE region this year. So here we analyzed uh, 
uh, banks uh, for the 20 parameters and namely these are the uh, parameters and the possibility of the SME customers to apply fully online and fully mobile for the loan, uh, separately for the private entrepreneurs and for the legal companies, for the legal entities, and also the possibility to um, to uh, sign the agreement online, also lending agreement and all the annexes to it, possibility to uh, upload and uh, uh, send digitally uh, them some additional documents and covenants, for example, to fulfill the the lo loan uh, lending criteria for the customers, and also the uh, availability uh, of the um, fast decision making from the bank side, so meaning that they have a scoring and automatical decision making, and also fast disbursement, meaning up to 24 hours to the customer account in case of positive decision, of course. And uh, here, oh, here we weighted all the criteria equally, uh, all the criteria equally because uh, we consider that this all is important now with the uh, digitalization of and with the increasing access of SMEs to the finance. And uh, now let me announce the winners here. So, and here we have three first places. So three solutions have uh, the same score. And I would like to invite the first one, Moneta Money Bank from Czech Republic, to receive this award for the best digital solution for the SME customers this year. And I invite Peter Kabbalah to Senior Product Manager at Moneta Money Bank to receive the award. Hello, Peter. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say that it's a, a real honor for us to have succeeded uh, in this ranking. Uh, among the strongest players in the CD region. And uh, I definitely would like to use this opportunity to thank uh, to our great team in Moneta because uh, actually my colleagues in uh, Small Business Development Squad are uh, the reason why we, are, uh, why we are here and why we are receiving uh, this award. Uh, just to, just um, a few words about the solution which uh, has been awarded. Uh, it's going about uh, fully online process for uh, entrepreneurs, for new to bank entrepreneurs, and it's going about uh, completely uh, paperless solution. It means that we really uh, don't require from the client any documents in printed form during the uh, complete process. The entrepreneur is able to um, take a loan within less than 15 minutes long uh, application process which is started from our uh, Moneta website and includes um, a lot of useful uh, features like, for example, uh, automated data mining uh, from uh, business registers just to avoid um, unnecessary typing made uh, from the client side. We use also personal, personal ID check using OCR technology. Um, you can just take a picture of your ID and all the data are automatically transcripted into uh, into loan application. Um, further, for example, the client verification uh, is performed by Lifeness technology, uh, recognizing your face. And finally, at the end, um, once the contract to documentation is prepared, uh, you just need to sign it uh, fully digitally by any payment transfer. So the solution uh, is working as an omnichannel. Uh, it's designed for um, mobile phones, um, desktops, tablets, and you can even switch between devices uh, during the process. Uh, maybe what is important to be mentioned, um, it's solved as one onboarding package. So within this 15 minutes process, we are completely to, we are uh, able to completely onboard the clients into our bank, into our core system. Uh, there is open current account for the client, uh, issued a debit card, and last but not least, there is provided a loan, which is non-purpose installment loan. Uh, so everything as one package. So uh, the last thing um, I would like to I would like to mention I would really thanks to SME Banking Club for the opportunity being here today. 
it's uh, also very uh, very big motivation for us into the future so uh, thanks a lot thank you very much peter and waiting for the next innovations from your side and uh, two next awards are going to the ing bank Shlonsky in poland uh, and for their, so uh, this bank has uh, different solutions for the private entrepreneurs and for the legal entities, but both of them have fully digital process for the loan, meaning that the customer can apply for purely online and uh, get the decision and sign the agreements and receive uh, the funds on the account purely online and in a paperless way. So, and I would like uh, to um, invite uh, Wojtek Wiedenka again to receive the award for the best digital lending solution for the private entrepreneurs. Okay. Uh, hello again. Okay, I'm very glad that our lending process also of entrepreneurs has been evaluated as one of the best in the region. Uh, because digitalization and remote processes are very important for us. So today's award shows that what we have done is right, uh, is proper, and we have a plan of development, of course, so I believe that we will keep the pace and keep the direction in order to deliver better and better clients' experience in the, in the future. So thank you very much for the, for the prize again. Thank you very much, Wojtek. Very much. And I would like to uh, invite Michal Tushnyo to receive the award for the best digital lending solution for the legal entities. Good evening. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm really grateful in the name of ING that we are receiving this reward. Uh, as the digitalization is our priority of many years, we are really trying to build uh, the best solution uh, for our clients. We, we are proud that we can uh, support uh, our clients with such a solution like this, that client can fully digitally ap uh, apply and uh, do the loan with uh, digital signing, uh, automatic decision and also automatic disbursements. Especially when we are talking about these times when we are living now, this digitalization and fully STP processes are really important. But clients can serve their needs uh, not even going out from the, their home or offices uh, and doing their daily business uh, online. So this is uh, something which we are not currently fully uh, finished. We are still having some innovation for the next year. So hopefully for the next year we will have some new uh, ideas also to share with you uh, on the next forum. So thank you very much for this reward. Thank you very much, Michal, and I hope also that you uh, will share with us your new solutions and for the SME customers next year. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you. And Thank then you. the next uh, category is the best digital factoring uh, solution for the SMEs. And uh, here we analyzed 17 parameters, which included also the possibility of the uh, SMEs, meaning also private entrepreneurs and legal entities, to apply online and via the mobile application as well for the factoring services and also the automatic decision making from the bank or the factoring company and also the possibility to receive the funding and uh, uh, upload the invoice for get financed also on a purely digital way. Uh, here uh, I would like to mention that not so many solutions are really uh, present here on the C region and I hope that for the next year or two we will really have um, um, a bigger number of the fintechs and banks implementing the factor, digital factoring for SMEs because I think that for this segment having this product in a digital way is very, is very crucial and actually only digital factoring, only by um, digitalizing the factoring, especially for the micros, uh, we can cover this segment and, and uh, with this uh, exactly product. And here I would like to announce uh, the winner is uh, Smeo. This is a Polish factoring fintech and we have met already Michal Pavlik today during the SME finance panel discussion. And now Michal, I'm very glad 
to give you this award for the best factoring for SMEs. I'm taking it from you, like, virtually. <laughs> F thank you very much. I really like to uh, say thank you for the whole team of Smell and the team of investors support us uh, with this way of building the knowledge about the factoring among entrepreneurs in Poland, uh, especially that factoring, invoice factoring or invoice discounting is still a new product for entrepreneurs. Even the data which you show that few of the companies on this, um, on this market in a Central and Eastern Europe, it shows that the factory is still developing. And I hope that 2021, uh, the year after the COVID pandemic, will be the year uh, stronger and better for factoring, for sure. Thank you very much one more time for this award. Thank you very much, Michal. Thank you very much. And I would like to announce the next category and the last one. Uh, this is the best digital sales tools for SMEs. And actually, uh, this is, was the new, very new study that we launched uh, this year. And uh, this is an open source document, both on our uh, usual website, and also you can download it fully uh, uh, on our exhibition stand here on the conference website and read this first. So we uh, defined and described the very first implementations of the uh, digital sales processes for SMEs. So this is really just, you know, very few first cases. So this is the start of, of, of implementation such processes here in the region. And um, here, uh, as I mentioned, you can download this study and uh, see and by yourself all the examples. And the winner that I would like here to announce is Budapest Bank for their uh, sales telemetry system. And this system, so this is a sophisticated serum that was implemented in Budapest Bank uh, two years ago. And Adam Jano presented this solution last year during our conference in Warsaw. So this is the CRM, a telemetry that gives the RMs, the full picture of the customer, of their needs, and uh, what is happening actually in the business of the customer to really get this tool in their hands for RMs to um, approach and uh, continue the relationship with the customer. So I would like to invite now to receive this award, Adam Jano, Budapest Bank, Hungary. Hello. Hello, Adam. Thank you very much. So first of all, we are really happy and excited to receive this award. Uh, we strongly believe that data uh, business management is a key factor in our business results. Uh, our custom-made CRM and management information system that you mentioned is where we translate all the data we have into valuable information and where all this information is, is available on one screen and just by one click away. So this way we can boost sales performance and maintain high quality customer services. When we started our journey a couple of years ago, we knew we had a long road ahead. Since then we have invested a lot of time and effort in our projects and you know it's always nice to receive feedback from, from outside. So thank you very much again and we really appreciate it. Thank you very much Adam. Thank and you very much Adam. Congratulations once again to all of you for a very well deserved success and looking forward for the new innovative solutions next year. So now our C ceremony is closed and also I would like to thank you uh, all our um, speakers for the conference. So thank you all of you that you made actually this conference happen. So thank you our speakers for being innovative and for being ready to share your experience uh, with your peers here in the region. Thank you to all our attendees that were active uh, during the whole day. Thank you to our partners that made this uh, stream happen actually and thank you to the technical support team here in here on, uh, on the stage you don't see them uh, but uh, actually they made this stream 
uh, happen. So thank you very much and uh, see you next time uh, on our next events. Uh, so we are continuing our um, webinar series and uh, you're welcome to watch all the previous episodes in, on our YouTube channel and also join us online in December for the next episode. So thank you very much for today and goodbye. This autumn we will continue our webinar series during which we will discuss the digital